Hello everyone, this is HDSKSK here, back with some more StarCraft 2 action. I, uh, I just got done watching MLG, so I decided, hey, that wasn't nearly enough StarCraft for me in three days, so why not go ahead and cast some stuff for my channel up in the top right side? I don't know if you can read that name, I sure can't, but I Google translated it and it said it was Star Tales Bomber. A player that uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with. He isn't the most successful player out there, but is definitely one of the best Terrans. He is in Grandmaster League on the Korean server. And down the bottom left side, I will try to keep my fanboyism in check. It is going to be Liquid Tasia as the Yellow Terran, so it is going to be a TBT. And uh, honestly, honestly guys, when I was looking through a, a lot of the, the replays that you guys were suggesting for... Um, for, let's see, the last tournament I was casting, the Asus Rogue Invitational, I actually cast two best of fives, they were both TVTs, and every game ended up being like five minutes long, I didn't even want to upload it because it was the same thing over and over and over, lots of quick games. The reason I mention that is, is because is it going to happen here between Tasia and Star Tales Bomber, because TVT is notorious, notorious, ever since Brood War, ever since StarCraft the original, ever since StarCraft 2, have been notorious for just being long, long, long-term games, and uh, you know that's kind of changing a little bit. I'm not saying that it's it's not possible to have a long-term game here. We very well could see one here today, but uh, just just keep that in mind when you're watching a TBT series. Doesn't necessarily you're going to be the, mean that you're going to be there for an hour and a half. So we'll see in this game exactly how that pans out. But uh, you, most of you are probably familiar with Teja. He's had a lot of success recently, playing at the top of his game. Um, recently defeating Liquid Hero. At MLG, he advanced extremely far through that tournament. But uh, some of the winnings that Star Tales Bomber has, uh, the GD Studio Arena number two, that was a thousand bucks. At Red Bull Battlegrounds, he got second, if you guys remember that. That was for eight thousand um, dollars. His other biggest winning, uh, let's see, MLG Raleigh is five thousand dollars. He was able to get first place there all the way back in 2011. So he has some success with first place finishes. He got first in GSL May Code A in 2011. Uh, but recently he hasn't had the most success. 2012 has been kind of a slow year for him. He's made a little over twelve thousand dollars, something like that. Twelve, fifteen thousand dollars this year, which is definitely good. It puts him in the uh, the top percentile as far as win percentage goes. But uh, he's definitely looking to, uh, well, kind of break out of that little shell where he had some success, but now he needs to start having that mainstream success that all the players strive for. I feel like Lenok, for example, is a player who's had some big wins outside Korea, able to put him in the top 10 most earningest player without having that much success in the GSL. Sure, he has some success, but uh, definitely the majority of that from those winnings. Anyways, that's something that I really like about StarCraft 2 is that foreign tournaments are very... Very lucrative for players to go to um, by just flying around and, and competing in those tournaments. Oh, oh, we got a little bit of we got a little bit of Marine Micro going on here as he's microing against the depot, gets it down to 200 HP exactly. Decides to leave it there. The Marine just having a little bit of fun, like he's playing paintball. But a super early expand here from Teja, and my God, Teja's playstyle is so sick. He gets so many command centers, it's actually absurd. There's going to be the second command center going down inside the, uh, well, there's one at the natural and another one inside the main. And look at this, Star Tales Bomber deciding to go for an expand and starport at around the same time. Which is, uh, makes makes me wonder if he is going to be go for cloaking or not, because he's not going to have a lot of money to invest in this. Now, he does have the double gas already, so he will have enough money to do this, but he's not going to have a lot of money for a remaining uh, ground army. But I don't think that's going to be much of an issue, as Teja has already said, hey, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to macro up quite a bit and make a lot of workers. Wouldn't be surprised to see three workers at a time as soon as this command center is done, because Teja loves to play his Terran, very similar to how Zerg is supposed to be played, where you get a lot of workers and uh, try and force it into the late game. It's, it's pretty crazy because he actually does that versus Protoss as well. Down goes the cloaking here for Startail Bomber and is there going to be a Banshee on the way? He's trying to save up that gas. The timing of it is going to be slightly delayed. However, you got to remember that uh, 110 in-game seconds to begin researching Cloak. So if you can start the Banshee a little bit after that, that's fine because it's only 60 in-game seconds. That's a little over half the time it takes to uh, to get Cloaking there. So you don't need to start the Banshee immediately, especially if you're deciding to engage right when that Cloaking is about to finish. The expansion finally going to be up here for Star Tales Bomber. And we have the expansion down here for Teja. Teja throwing down a gas at the expansion. Decides to eventually add on a third one in the main base. But uh, quite an interesting choice there. You got to remember that Bomber was able to get that gas earlier inside the main base. Because, well, number one, he didn't make two command centers. And number two, he did expand a little bit later. But uh, either way, he is going to be ahead in gas for just a moment. But as soon as this one finishes up, that is going to give Teja a little bit of a lead. Where's that scan? We did see a scan go down inside the main base. That is going to spot 
the factory of Teja. And this is this is a big tell. Did he spot the command center? I actually can't tell if he spotted it. Yes, he did. So he knows that that's there. He hasn't seen this expansion itself, but he's got to know. He has to know that Teja has an expansion now. Because there is no build that you would ever just build a, a weird place at Orbital Command in the back of your base like this. It's just silly. It doesn't make sense. What does make sense, though, is the fact that he has Marines over here on the left side waiting to defend. A missile turret's on the way. So Teja getting a good read on what's going on here. He spotted the factory, saw the, uh, the add-on there. May have actually got a really good read on the timing of that, realizing that, hey, there is indeed going to be a cloak Banshee on the way. Needs to be careful here, though, with this Banshee. We've seen losing Banshees end up costing players games. If he can kill all these Marines, he's going to be in a good spot, but a nice swing in on the low ground. And no, a big misclick there. Wow, two HP remaining there for Star Tails Bomber on that Banshee. He's got to decloak and begin repairing that Banshee up immediately. He cannot begin harassing at all. And these Marines got to try and go out here to uh, clean this out. Unfortunately, that has got to be their death wish. Although an important thing is that Teja spotted there's a medevac here. So he knows there's potential for drops. He knows there's the potential for this Banshee harass to continue. Two SCVs being brought off the line most likely to repair this Banshee. Also, Siege Tank is done. Siege Mode is on the way. That's going to be a nice position here, actually, for Bomber in this game. Because, look, he's ahead in supply. He's probably ahead in the army supply as well. He is way ahead in the army supply. Oh, my God. 32 to 9. Of course, it's going up much higher now that Teja's economy has finally kicked in. He's been able to uh, kind of pay off that command center by now. And it does look like Star Tails Bomber going up for a crazy sick contain. He's got his own bunker on the way right now. He's got to start. This is very tense for Teja. He decides to go for it, realizing, no, not not a good idea as the tank is now going to begin bombarding the entrance here. He will have to repair this bunker if he hopes to stay alive because if this bunker falls, those Marines are going to stem and run right in there. They don't have stem just yet, but uh, actually it hasn't started at all, so no stem is on the way. Combat shields isn't either, but that's because he's got the Cloak Banshee, he's got the Siege Tank. So it's actually a very dire situation here for Teja because every time the Siege Tank fires, it's free money being taken away from Teja. I need to be careful with the Banshee. It does get taken out here. Nice play there by Teja, but still, Star Tails Bomber going to have that bunker up relatively soon. You also have to remember that uh, the medevac can spot the high ground, so no no Marines on the high ground going to be able to take that bunker by surprise. Yeah, without Siege Mode being done anytime soon here, Teja's going to have a hard time doing it. This, the SCB gets taken out, but guess what? The bunker's already done. The medevac is in a position to barely spot this high ground ledge. The Banshee moving up in here. There's the scan, and another Banshee goes down. But at what cost? Teja is losing a ton of units here. This Viking, though, being a huge, huge uh, boost to his defense here. He does end up losing it, though, but not before the medevac goes down. So he is able to kill that off now. Uh, another Viking has replaced it, and he is going to kill his bunker before it can be repaired. That means that he can move in here if he wants to. He's got to be careful, though, because the current tenants are not very friendly. They don't like these strangers moving in. Takes out one gas right here. Remember, gas is not as important in TVT. Um, especially when it's two base versus two base. It doesn't really give either player a huge advantage, but I think the damage has been dealt. He's going to go ahead and back out. 800 uh, resources more lost for Liquitasia. He is going to kill off that bunker, though, helping eat that out just a little bit. But uh, Bomber, he did not overstay and did not overextend. Decided to go ahead and back out there. Could he have actually ended the game? I mean, it would have been tough. You can see he does have an army supply advantage, but now Teja's going to have the defender's advantage. He's got the uh, combat shields. He's got stim pack. He's in great shape as far as his Marines. And uh, he's very, very good. Remember, Teja is the upgrade Terran. I don't know if there's a, a crafty name we can name him for the amount of upgrades he gets, but he will always be ahead in any matchup of the upgrades. That is just how he focuses his play style, and it works out greatly for him. That's that's why he's able to hold on in these dire situations. Now, it does look like a Central Tower going to be going down on the left side. We'll almost spot these units immediately, and these units are going, oh, we're actually going to get spotted. Do we still want to go? Teja says yes, then says no, goes ahead and backs them out there. What he really wanted to do was spot this expansion, see if the army was out of position. But uh, no, at the same time, he's going to be doing a drop of the expansion here. Unloads two medevacs here, and look at the spread on those Marines. Focusing down these depots, there is a supply drop depot here. He wants to kill that. Watch the supply plummet here. Right there when he takes that out, that is a huge, huge loss. Because remember, that was a drop's worth of energy uh, as far as the mule. And then, of course, the depot itself. So that's a lot of money gone. But he did finally clean up a lot of these Marines. And the Marines over on the left side were able to uh, deny any sort of expansion over here. They are just chilling out. Is Teja going to save those units? It doesn't even matter because during this, he secured that third base. He flowed over the command center from his main, opening up some free space to begin working on m even more upgrades, working on the mech upgrades. And you see right now that uh, Star Tails Bomber, he's at one attack. While Liquid here, or excuse me, yeah, Liquid Teja is going to be at one attack. He does have the two, the one armor nearly done, as well as two attack already starting here. So in typical Teja fashion, going for the early, early upgrades, but he is going to have to watch out here because if we take a look at the army supply right now, still an advantage. 
for Bomber. So if Bomber gets into a good angle, a good siege position, then he can actually take out this expansion, potentially kill this army, and get himself back in this game. We're going to see if he's going to be able to do it here right, basically right now. I feel like he's got to go for it because he's behind in economy. He's got to be behind in the worker count, no doubt. 57 to 45. There's a stem going to run up the ramp. These are the Marines who are supposed to be taking the splash damage, but the tanks from Tasia are not in position just yet. Who's going to get the first shot? Looks to be almost identical timing. Can Tasia hold this off for now? It looks like, uh, it, no, it remains to be seen. The tanks, though, decide to fall back. They did kill off a bunker as well as a handful of Marines here. And now he is 1,400 minerals ahead as far as that unit's loss tab, but uh, he has got to secure this expansion. Does he have a command center on the way? Yes, he does. It's a little over halfway done now, and so he needs to get that expansion down. Has he done enough damage here? I mean, it's tough to say. Yes, he's done a lot, but Teja is so, so good at uh, getting those expansions up, getting the upgrades up. Not sure why Bomber's actually going to be cleaning out these rocks. I think cleaning out these ones makes sense for a full-on retreat, but cleaning out these ones means that uh, Teja, if it did come down to running down this ramp, would be able to get a decent spread and potentially break the contain a little bit easier. So I'm not surprised to see him clean out these rocks, but uh, these ones are, I'm kind of curious as to why he did that, as it just makes the movements easier for Teja. It also makes him take less splash damage. Got to be dropping down a central tower as well. I feel like central towers are that one building where it's like, oh, right, my opponent built one of those. That reminds me that I can build one. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Looks like the central tower, though, did get taken out by some of those uh, kind of renegade marines running out there by themselves. But the supply now for Tasia is going to start getting further and further ahead here. If Bomber does not secure the expansion right now, he's going to go ahead and drop it down right here. He has been able to uh, keep, his, keep his income relatively good, surprisingly, um, despite the fact that he's behind in workers and also behind in the expansion timing. So I think he's got to be okay here. Let's take a look at the army supply, 88 to 80, and now the worker supply is almost identical here. So yeah, he has managed to stabilize. He's definitely in this game. Teja, though, I mean, you got to remember he was behind in the units lost, but he has evened that out by by a, quite a substantial amount. You got to remember in StarCraft 2, it's so difficult to get back into a game once you get even just a little bit behind. That's why the early game in StarCraft 2 is so, so important. Um, that That's just something that you have to watch out for. So anyways... Long story short, this is still anybody's game. We do see a, a main focus on Marine Siege Tank. Only two medevacs looks like mixed in there. But uh, Marine Siege Tank, very, very common in TBT. But look at the upgrade advantage for Teja. Right now it's at 2-1. He does have the two armor nearly done, plus three attack already beginning. But uh, by the by the timing of this, the two twos will be done at around the same time if Bomber does not overextend himself. He needs to wait for this 2-2 to finish, then there'll be a timing window before the three attack kicks in where he's actually on evil, or evil on even footing. Apparently he's on evil footing as well, but a plus one for the tanks is down. We do have a minor drop going on over here. Unable to commit there as there was a tank in position to defend this. It would be unwise for Teja to begin engaging that. But uh, you got to remember, no no upgrades. Well, he just finished at that second, but again, his upgrades are going to be behind. Right now, he is tied in upgrades. If he can finish this right here and find a timing, he will be tied in upgrades. But the longer this game goes on... That is not going to be the case in the next couple of minutes. Now, right now, it looks like Bomber's not really gearing up for a major attack. He's actually just trying to, to trick this army, get it out of position here, and he does spot, hey, there is a potential for a drop on the left side. This Marine right now is flirting with death. He wish he had a sniper rifle, but that's gonna he's going to get taken out there. Almost scared the army away, but not quite yet. However, that will tell Teja, hey, he knows where I'm at. I've got to absolutely be careful here. So now Bomber gearing up for good angles here. I'm not actually sure how he got his supply so high, but he is currently at 183 supply. Let's take a look at that army supply. He is still ahead, has managed to stay ahead for quite some time, almost evening out right there, though, after he lost a couple of Marines to uh, some siege tank fire there. Let's take a look at the unit stab here. Nine tanks to 14 tanks. 14 tanks here for Bomber. That means if he can get into a good spot, he could win this battle very one-sidedly. But one of those tanks is damaged. He is going to be behind in upgrades as well on those tanks. Need to be careful with the medevacs for both players here. The drop up at the north going to be attacking that third base as well. But there's a lot of siege tanks here to clean this up. Teja doesn't realize that he got in way, way in over his head as he was focused on the battles down here. Ends up losing that entire army. All of a sudden, Bomber's saying, well, I've done it again. I've done the damage that I need to. I'm going to go ahead and back out right now. It's kind of the story of the game right now is Bomber being being cautious, not overextending, being a little bit behind in upgrades, but still going toe-to-toe -to -toe so far in this game, and even his 3-3 is not that badly timed here. He's keeping up with the production of the Marines quite well. He had about 10 at a time. We do have a Thor on the way from Teja. Those can definitely make the battles much more uh, in your favor if you're able to have them absorb a lot of those siege tank shots, but we are about to find out if that Thor is going to play a huge role here. He is going to have to scan. He needs to be careful going in there. 
And that's going to be a lot of units lost there. Still ahead in the units lost, showing you just how difficult it is to actually get back into a game. But with the fourth base completing, the SCB is transferring over at the exact right moment here. And that means that uh, Bomber all of a sudden is ahead in the macro, which is not something that Teja usually allows to have happen. But uh, we'll intercept something units over here on the left side. Mike in a medevac or two for his efforts. And he does. Down goes one with that micro. Looks like those Marines don't even stop. Decides to run right up the ramp. Falls the steal on these Marines. The Siege Shanks, though, able to do so, so much damage there. And we'll go straight for that sensor tower. No, decides to go for a depot. No, now the sensor tower, which is always a great choice because that is a huge advantage to your opponent. But uh, the sensor tower in the middle, that's going to get taken out in due time. Although he might, he does indeed spot the troop movements over here. So the sensor tower has already paid for itself. And the Marines get it. you got to remember, sensor towers have almost no HP. The planetary almost done here. The siege tank's going to get into a better position to begin bombarding this. But he decides to go for the kill. Uh-oh, it's base race time. You guys know what time it is. Base race, screams all the children in the audience. But he is going to go ahead and try and march up this ramp. But this game is going to get mighty awkward mighty fast. You can see a lot of mules dropping at this third base just to try and mine as much as he possibly can. There's a lot of units here for defense. Does uh, Bomber have the same units? No, the supply is skyrocketing here for Teja. He is still going to lose this main base. The tanks now are in position here. But no, both players have lost a lot of units as Teja not able to get up here easily. And you can see Bomber taking a different strategy. Grouping up his units. Could take out the tanks right now. I don't think Teja realized that these Marines are here. There's the Sim. He's got to go for it. Now's the perfect time to clean out a lot of those tanks. He does manage to get them. The Thor has indeed arrived here at the main base. But the supplies for Teja are now suffering greatly at the siege tank line. It is here and it is ready to destroy the entire base. But can the siege tanks of Teja lock down the main base? It looks like the answer is yes. All the Marines have been cleaned out. Keep an eye on those supplies right there, though. They're going to play a huge, huge role. The SCB's down here forced to evacuate because he knows that one or two siege tanks on the high ground going to deny that expansion easily. Going straight for the uh, the tech structures here of Teja. Teja is realizing, hey, I've got to evacuate out of here because if, if I let him kill all these, I'm not going to have any sort of tech. I'm not going to be able to make any units once these land. Two command stars have safely made it to the north, though. What is going on in this game? Both these players have, like, switched bases Although you have to remember that Bomber cannot afford... Oh, he does have this base over here, so he can afford to make another command center. Look look at the minimap right now, guys. Seriously, look at the minimap. I feel like we're watching I, a blimp race or something, as they are completely swapping sides of the map, slow and steady. Although there is a huge supply advantage here for Bomber, so I don't know if we're going to see a complete base swap or not. But if Teja decides to land some of these command centers he's got, he can begin dropping these mules. This is so ridiculous. This is like a Star Wars battle where the giant ships are uh, like the Star Destroyers. Those are actually the buildings. Uh, the planetary is going to get taken out, but this might put Bomber into a position that he needs. But at the same time, he might also just be trying to buy time by repairing up this planetary here. And it uh, does look like right now Teja says, hey, I'm moving in. And uh, that does mean the planetary is actually in range of these buildings. It's a planetary killing SCBs, making buildings. Have never in a million years would I expect to see that. But at this point in the game, these buildings trying to figure out where to land. And you can see every player, or both players, excuse me, are completely frantic here. We'll get one command center. That is huge. Absolutely huge. Might even get a barracks here as well. That's going to be also huge. I want to say that uh, Bomber definitely has the advantage moving forward. He's got to make sure not to mess it up. He's got equal upgrades now, I believe. Uh, did both players finish their 3-3? Well, it looks like Teja has. How about Bomber? Where are these Marines at? They also no 3-2 here. So even though the supplies are favoring Bomber, it's not by that much. Plus, there is an upgrade advantage. And even that Thor, I feel like he keeps that Thor alive. It could play a huge role. Does the Thor drop? But look at this base down here. What are we actually looking at? I don't even know. But I'm sure glad I picked this game to cast. This one Marine, his job is to shoot his gun for a living. Which that sounds like a lot of fun to me as uh, the add-ons now. Reactors, reactors, reactors. Got to be a lot of Marines on the way. I think that's actually a little bit overkill because he doesn't have any income right now. And I think he lost the majority of his SCVs. Yeah, he's only 23 to 8 right now. And uh, there is going to be an attack over here with these SCVs. They are going to spot exactly what's going on right now. And they can say, see, oh, I can't build barracks down here because this base is already taken. The mules have been dropped here. And I, I, I can't tell if there's attacks going on or not because the buildings are throwing me off, man. It looks like there's an attack going on right now, though, in the center of the map. But uh, this game might not might not even be over anytime soon because both players are unsure on who's actually in the lead. Both players are good on supply, but look at this income from Teja dropping all of his mules at once. This is going to plummet now while the uh, the mules, it looks like, for, for Bomber trying to kick in, but he may end up losing his command, so he needs to keep it alive. The mules trying to get out of there. don't know if they're going to be able to uh, drop their load off or not because they are going to die here very, very soon, and uh, it does look like here 
that this this army is going to be backing out just a little bit. So I, 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 I'm speechless right now. I don't actually know how this game's going to go. Usually I have a good prediction on what's going to happen. I mean, Bomber does have a supply advantage. He's got to try and kill off a medevac. Is able to get one. But uh, can he continue forward with the supply advantage? It's going to be tough, but now that the incomes have stabilized a little bit. Now, actually, where's he mi oh, he's mining up in the top left? There we go. I was wondering where that income was coming from. And he's still got a couple of depots over here, so he doesn't have to remake those, which means his army is going to continue to grow in size. And Teja, I mean, he's running out of momentum here. He has a lot of money, a lot of money, 2,000 minerals, 2,000 gas. But he just doesn't have the infrastructure to begin producing off of it. Does he do the add-ons and risk not having a big enough army? Or does he not do the add-ons and risk not having a big enough army in the later stages of the game? It's going to be a tough choice for him. But right now, I feel like Bomber made the correct one. He's, he did all the add-ons right away. He's got the production capabilities he needs. Can't even afford to spend all of his money just yet. Uh, or can't, can't, can't keep up with his income. There we go. That's what I'm trying to say. But at this point right now, Bomber going to be moving to the center of the map. He, while he is at an upgrade disadvantage, he's at an army advantage right now. Six tanks to 11. 47 Marines to 13. That's that's more than enough just to march in here, I feel like, and win the game. Teja, though, is tucked nice and tight into this corner. He's got a great concave going. Bomber does not want to run into this for fear of losing everything because I think he's probably got a good feeling that uh, he has this game in the back. Because look at the map. Look at the map vision. Red player Bomber can see a whole lot more. And he's basically got him tucked away in this corner. He knows that he's not mining anywhere else. He knows that he has safely has this expansion up in the top left side. So he should be A-OK. -okay. However, once that infrastructure starts to kick in here for Teja, his army size might actually grow to surpass that of his opponents. Because look, he has a lot of money to spare. But uh, can he produce enough Marines here? I think he might actually be able to. Now it's 54 Marines to 40. Teja getting the momentum back. Once that money was actually invested into his army, he is able to equalize here by quite a bit. I think Bomber trying to realize, well, I, I have a economy advantage. Can I press that economy advantage long enough before Teja can punish me? A crazy concave here. I don't think it's going to work out for Teja, but remember he does have the plus three armor, so maybe it will. Trying to split these Marines as best he can. Can he take out all the tanks? Three remain. Two remain, but only four Marines left. I don't think they're going to be able to do it. One tank remains. He is going to go back uh, back out there, but the supplies, once again, are so identical. This is this 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 game deserves to be tagged as epic because he was be way, way behind many, many times. Is still in this game. I would say he's even still behind right now, but here comes the drop in the mineral line. Is this going to be it for Teja? His tanks out of position. They are guarding the mineral line, but doing lots of splash damage to the SCBs. Can he kill any of these medevacs? Can he kill any of the Marines? River, he still has that upgrade advantage. Two Vikings are here with very little HP. Oh, and is he going to focus down with all the Marines inside? He's clicking on the right one, but no. Decides to attack the lower HP one, and right now Teja has held on. He has a supply advantage. He may just go all in right now. Can he actually do it? I thought for sure that Bomber had this game, but look at this. This is the only defense. He's got one tank. He's got to back it up here. Only a couple brains in the army now. Add a position to siege tank. We're siege yet, and he is going to try and break free. It looks like Teja's going to do it. Teja's actually ahead in supply now by a great deal. More than a double margin right now. He can move out. He could win this game. I can't actually believe it. I thought for sure that Bomber had this. I thought it was in the bag. I thought this game was going to be boring. But Teja units just do not die. Oh, my God. I'm freaking out, man. It looks like he's got to go ahead and decide to do a push right now. There's only the one tank right here. He's got 10 kills on it, but he's going to need about 50 more to actually hold this. The poor tank, it's all by himself, and there's the GG. Oh, my God. Teja able to actually take this game. I'm about to have a heart attack. That game was so good. All right. Well, if you guys are wondering why I love Teja, that is exactly why right there. I cannot believe he actually managed to do that. What an awesome game for Teja. Great game for Star Tales Bomber. Again, though, Bomber has been struggling a little bit recently, uh, at least in 2012. But keep an eye out for him because he still did get first place um, about halfway through the year at the GD Studio Arena number two and fifth place at IEM seven uh, at the Global Challenge. But uh, anyways, great, great game. Hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Hello everyone, this is HGS Guest here back with some more StarCraft 2 Hard the Swarm 1v1 action. This time it's going to be between Zions up at the top right side and down the bottom left side. No, it is not actually the gun run, although we'll talk about him in just a second. It is going to be Root Cats 
Why he is playing as the gun run, uh, well, it's kind of obvious to me because gun run is our saint and holy savior. For those of you who do not know, gun run is actually the guy uh, who works at Twitch TV. He basically is the savior of esports. Uh, anytime a stream has issues, it is always gun run who is on the job to fix it. Everyone loves gun run, apparently, including cats as he decided to make this account after him. Now, both these players are in Grandmaster League on these accounts, so why Cats is playing as the gun run is beyond me, but it's great to see the gun run up in Grandmaster League, I must say. Now, this map I want to talk about for a little bit as this game gets underway. Notice, number one, how we are at a cross-spawn location situation that highly increases our chances of a much longer game, but the most important feature about this map, which I, I feel like people do not realize this as much. Look where I'm looking right now. Right in the center of the map is this wide open area, but guess what? That is the only place that connects the two sides. So it's very easy. I, I've experienced it myself on ladder. I've seen games like this as well. Very easy to cut this map directly in half. So if one player sets up camp right here, usually it's gonna be the Zerg player in a PVZ. If they set up camp right in the middle, that is going to cut off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bases a piece, which is a little, wait, wait, did I count that wrong? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bases. Oh my God, I lied. Nine bases a piece uh, if you're able to cut that in half. So we'll just have to wait and see if that actually does play a role here. This also looks really cool down here. We got like a valley of lava. We got lots of awesome floating little bugs going on. So anyways, this is one of the newer ladder maps out there. I highly recommend it if you love macro games. Um, also, a very important thing to note about this map is that uh, basically Forge Fast Expanding is the easiest thing you will ever do because your choke point is so freaking narrow. Now, the one thing you do have to watch out for is there are destructible rocks that lead directly into your natural. So Forge Fast Expanding up here is great. However, if a lot of Zerglings get out in the field and are killing this off before you realize what's happening, you can end up actually losing the game right away. Now, you do have an early third base going to be coming up for the Gun Run, also known as Cats. Uh, three bases, very easy to secure on this map. I wouldn't say it's the easiest to secure just because of these rocks right here, but definitely one of the easier maps for a macro game. When this map was being designed, whoever was designing it was like, I want to make a map where games are very long and there's lots of macro going on. Just because the rush distances are so far, there are so many bases, it's easy to cut the map in half, it's easy to defend your natural. Um, I mean, really, what else can you do to make a, a map more macro-oriented? So I don't think there's been a single more macro-oriented map that I can remember anyways. I mean, even maps like Taldarim Altar, they're so wide open in the center that you would never, ever cut that map in half, ever. It's, like, impossible just because there's so much open space. Basically, Taldarim Altar was, like, this size, only the middle was, like, this big. It basically took up the entire map, and uh, there was the four watchtowers, of course, in the center. This map does only have two, and uh, grabbing these watchtowers right here, it, I mean, it's nice. Obviously, you always want to have map vision if possible, but uh, given the, the size of the map, and uh, the, the angle that you're going to be rushing at anyways, grabbing those watchtowers is not actually that ideal. This is something that a lot of map, play, uh, map makers have actually been doing recently is really reducing the effectiveness of securing Zelnaga watchtowers. Now, some maps don't even have watchtowers. Some maps have them placed in uh, kind of weird positions, and some have them in, you know, in, in positions where it's just not going to reveal that much of the map. As, as I think the map makers are slowly starting to get away from that so it can more focus on... Uh, playing the race and you know getting your own map vision so you're not just camping out your units in the middle of the map so uh, anyways looks like it is going to be a longer game though because we do have you know a stalker on the way well, apparently with this sweet rally point going on not sure what's up with that but I mean you can see neither player is actually gearing up to end this anytime soon oh a macro hatch right there um, if you're wondering why it's placed right here, this is to connect the two bases with creep, just so units can swing around without having to use creep tumors. Just a nice little way to help defend those. And, you know, the units are going to be spawning between the two bases, so they can reinforce that just as easily uh, as it can really get, because the larvae are basically right on the front line here. So, um, I, I was actually reading a lot of comments, and apparently people were wondering what a macro hatch is, which is a totally legitimate question. Um, basically what a macro hatch for Zerg is, is especially if you're on three bases right now, Zerg can actually produce units faster than they can off of three hatcheries, but sometimes you do not feel safe enough to put it out to a fourth base, just because your fourth base tends to be the most difficult to defend uh, location. Otherwise, if it wasn't, it would be your third base. So, uh, a macro hatch is basically so you can continue that unit production without taking the risk of expanding. I think that's a pretty good way of explaining it. But anyways, we have Double Stargate going to be on the way right now for Zions. Isn't that... Uh 
isn't that something to do with like the Matrix? Zion? Isn't that a isn't that the place they lived in or something like that? I'm trying to remember. I need the access codes to Zion, Morpheus. Give me the access codes. Oh my god, imagine if you actually had that voice, Zion. I need to make it to Zion. Anyways, we do have some Void Rays on the way. And, uh, it, I mean, this is just so weird, because this game is actually developing as friendly as it can possibly get. Look at this. No units to be Oh, wait. One Overlord just went down. Uh, was it over here? Yeah, it was scouting the main base. So the first Overlord went down. Second one's going to go down as well. Don't think this Overlord is going to die at all. I think there's, like, 0% chance of that. Um, our scouting thing at all, it's 100% chance going to die. So there we go. It does end up getting killed off. I think it spotted, obviously, the Void Ray, but it did spot the second Stargate. He did actually spot that. That Overlord must have had his binoculars on, man. He is going to go ahead and spot that. We do have the double Void Ray production on the way. Would not recommend this. Uh, yes, I know I go double Starport a lot in my games, but uh, doing it just right out the gate after it's been scouted, uh, not really going to work out for him, I don't think. It's going to give uh, this is going to give cats plenty of time to respond to this. You can see he already has five spore colors on the way. Uh, well, he's got four done, and oh god, I messed this up. Anyways, he's going to have like six, I think. Yeah, he's going to have six now done, pretty darn soon here. So he should be able to defend against that quite easily. Infestation pit's going to be on the way. Here comes a void ray going to be moving out to the center of the map. I think he found another overlord friend to kill off, and he did. Does decide to use the prismatic alignment. I think he could have saved that for maybe killing off a spore caller or something like that. But either way, able to cut off that Overlord, which is uh, going to supply block cats here for just a moment. However, Zerg are expected to lose between one to two Overlords, guaranteed at this stage of the game. And then if your opponent's going for air, you're going to be losing a lot more. And it, it is kind of caked into the build, uh, baked into the build, if you will, of both these players. So losing those units is not actually that devastating right now. Creeps Red going to get underway right now for cats. And uh, really, third base being taken here by Zion. So yes, he moves out, kills a couple overlords, realizes there's not a whole lot he can actually do with these void rays. And another creep trooper goes down. Might be able to kill off this expansion. Prismatic alignment's pretty good. And does force the cancel there. Very close um, to actually just losing that. But it uh, does manage to cancel that in time. So many void rays on the field already, all things considered. Here's gonna be coming down the cannons. This is gonna be securing three bases quite easily. I don't know if these cannons are quite necessary or not. They will come into effect at some point in this game. It just might be a little bit too soon. Crab Beetle, he looks kind of awesome, man. He's just chilling out, waddling around. I, I would have a Crab Beetle for a pet. Uh, I would also love Hillary the Shark as a pet as I smack my lips. Probably one of the more annoying sounds. But anyways, we do have the cannons going to be coming up. Here comes a Hallucinated Phoenix here to scout around. He's going to be seeing the upgrades, the Hydra Den, and uh, the fact that the Hydra Den's jiggling a little bit, Infestation Pit's jiggling a little bit. He should have a good understanding of what kind of units to expect. The one Zelda over here, he did not know what to expect, and unfortunately it was a lot of Hydralisks, which uh, if a lot of Hydras show up to your birthday party unexpected, probably should run because everyone's about to die. If, uh, if you're a Terran or a Protoss, that's the case. Uh, otherwise, it's just a fun Zerg party. So if you're a Zerg and you party with Hydras, I mean, Hydras know how to party. Anyways, Void Ray's moving out right now. I think he's really just trying to spot Overlords at this point with these. He's not really going to be able to do that much damage. Oh, might intercept this one. The angle's pretty good. Angle's pretty good. Are they going to connect? And the Void Ray does manage to find it. Can the Overseer get away? I feel like the... Oh, well, he could have got away, but decided to sacrifice himself for the greater good. There goes the changing right there. He, he gets taken out quite easily. So uh, overall, Zions is going to be in the lead. But, I mean, a Zerg player on four uncontested bases, that, uh, that, that's going to be... That's going to be bad news for a Protoss player. If they don't manage to get their own fourth base, some sort of harassment... Oh, excuse me. Or some sort of sick timing that's just going to absolutely crush the Zerg. If you leave them to their own devices, then uh, it, you're not in good shape, honestly. Zerg are able to get maxed out so quickly. We do have Swarm Hosts on the way, which I feel like Swarm Hosts on this map are a very interesting choice. Just because the map is so large, it takes them so long to get across there. And you have to have crazy good creep thread that normally you're not going to be seeing Swarm Hosts on a map like this. A fifth base going to be on the way. Oh my god. That is absolutely ridiculous. Void Rays now. Uh, the Void Ray count is high. Carriers on the way as well. We also have the Cannons. Just chilling out over here as he has now. Look at this. This map is so weird. He's now connected four bases with these cannons before he connected three. There's just so many choke points that I do not envy Zerg on this map because it's very difficult to get engagement. And it basically forces, I would say, in most situations, it forces this turtle style that we are seeing from cats. I mean, Zerg are really good at two things. Number one, at, uh, at being very mobile and doing counterattacks. However, that is extremely stifled by chokes. Another thing they're good at is turtling. 
And basically you have to try to force an engagement in the middle of the map. So I think that is the uh, the approach that Cat's going to take here. Yes, he is maxed out. Yes, he's going to have a lot of money in the bank. Yes, he's got a lot of bases. Yes, he's got a lot of drones. But at the end of the day, oh my god, that was 112 drones. 112 drones. My god, way more than I even thought it was. But uh, anyways, if you try to be too aggressive, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You can actually end up throwing a game away. So definitely something to keep an eye out for. This is actually the slowest game I think I've ever cast. And in all my history of casting StarCraft 2, I think this is the most timid, most passive, most loving, most Care Bear game that I've ever casted. We do have a fifth base going to be on the way here for Protoss. Uh, five bases before a major engagement. Not something I'm used to seeing here. However, both players are maxed out at around the 17-minute mark, showing you just how hardcore they are actually macroing. And it's not like they're rushing to get maxed out either. Uh, they probably could have got like the 14 minute mark with this kind of play style. But uh, either way, we do have an army now going to be moving out here for Cats. He does have the Infestors. He has Neural Parasite. I believe he has path Pathogen Glands. I can only imagine so. Uh, yes, he does. He has Research the other two things as well. Locusts are not Research, which is very interesting considering how much money he actually has. And uh, the Cannon Wall is continuing right now. The Great Wall of Cannons. Got to be chilling out over here. Oh my god, is this, are they actually ever going to attack each other? I feel like they're not going to. I, I actually think we're, we're playing SimCity at this point, where everyone's just macroing up. Everyone's trying to build an airport trying to build their train railways, trying to uh, deal with all that stupid sewage that's overflowing. You guys know what I'm talking about. But anyways, like I was saying before, Katz is actually going to cut this map in half. A couple of probes do get sacrificed there. That was intentional. High Templar are now out, and uh, are they going to do anything? Are they got anything to size storm at all? Or are they just going to be chilling out here? Ooh, they want to feed back those investors so bad. Fungals do come out on the boy base. Honestly, both these players can just lose these armies because they have so much supply so much money that losing some of this stuff is not even that big of a deal. The investors right here, you still don't want to kill off the Void Rays. What's that? Was that a Neural Parasite? What happened there? Either way, that Storm not going to be doing that much damage. It's the Fungals that are just wrecking it wrecking the uh, the army right now of Zion. So he needs to make sure to continue building the interceptors. That's going to be crucial. Remember, you do have to right-click the interceptors to begin building them automatically. Look at this pylon spread. Oh my god, pylons are actually about like every corner on the top left side. And there he goes. Okay, now he's building some of the uh, some of the extra interceptors. I don't think he has it on auto build though. Normally it shows if they have it on auto build or not. He might actually individually be building those which is a very interesting choice. Don't normally see it done quite like that. Hydra's over here do manage to kill off one of the pylons. Remember, the uh, hatchery will not spot the pylons until the hatchery itself is done. DT's just got to be slicing with these hatcheries. Now, this is where the game starts to pick up just a little bit, and uh, he definitely needs to auto-build these interceptors. I'm actually not sure what the deal is here. Uh, Neural Parasite got to be bringing those carriers on over. Come on over, come on over, baby. Something tells me that that song was not originally made about Neural Parasite, but it definitely fits the description. Two carriers do go down, which is no fun. You got to remember that carriers just, I mean, they really don't have much of a place in PvZ. Um, Corruptors are so good. Vipers are good versus them. Obviously, we just saw Neural Parasite's going to be effective versus them. Can these DTs actually get the hatchery? They are going to try. I don't know if they can. The reinforcing DTs, though, got to actually be saving those. So uh, quite impressive right there as uh, he is going to go ahead and clean that one out. So that creep should begin to recede right now. And Locust do manage to get stormed, but they're going to be chasing this army around. Can he kill anything valuable? Nope. Doesn't really even manage to kill anything unvaluable. He does end up losing those. And uh, losing the hatchery in the top left side is quite frustrating. Do these Hydras know what's up with these pylons? I don't think that they do. As there are just so many pylons. It was actually kind of cool. I mean, most players have tons of money to burn through right now. Although Zion... Uh, I don't normally say this, but he's on five bases. He actually needs to expand here pretty soon. DTs are going to help deal with these Locusts, but, I mean, Locusts are free units at this point. If you're not able to kill... Oh, Punk right there going to clean that up. If you're not able to kill off the Swarm Host, they're just going to be bombarding you all day. It doesn't matter how much stuff you have. They're going to be doing damage. Now, right now, it looks like the carrier is attempting to engage. But look, at this. there's so many Spore Callers. How many Spore Callers are actually in the game? Let's find out. We have uh, 64 Spore Crawlers. Oh, my God. Drone count is quote unquote down to 98. So both players now don't have over 100 workers. But uh, either way, that is so many sport callers that should actually be illegal. Uh, I'm actually going to go call the police right now. 911, what is your emergency? Someone has made, uh, Roots Cats, that is, has made 63 sport callers. We're sending a squad car out immediately. Thank you. Really, there's no other way to put this. This is an absolutely ridiculous game so far. But, anyways, it looks like the Tempest right now. 
You can see they don't exactly do a lot of damage to individual units, but uh, they might actually prove to be useful later if Brood Lords ever come into effect. Uh, it does look at like these ETs going to get taken out as well. So really, what does our Protoss player do right now? I feel like War Prism play has got to be the only viable option. Uh, I mean, he's got his own concave established here, which is quite nice. He is working on the damage here to take these out. Vipers are here. You gotta remember that if Vipers pull a single Tempest over, oh, goodbye Tempest, you guys are all dead. If you are not careful, I actually managed to pull over all four. Oh, yoink, yoink, yoink. Reaching out that giant tongue. How is it that a single Zerg flying unit can pull over an entire sized capital starship? I, I don't know. I really don't know, but man, is it fun to watch. Neural Parasite right there playing a big role as well. You can see the DTs right now are gonna be cleaning up a lot of these locusts here. And uh, there is a probe over here going to continue dropping down that pylon here. Uh, looks like the Infestor's going to try and deal with this on their own. We'll have to see. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He actually just drilled Parasite that probe. I did not expect that. Oh, and the DT is here to see it. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, my God. Katz is actually doing this. Katz is actually going to go for a Protoss Nexus right now. He's got a lot of money, so might as well, right? He has. Oh, God. All of a sudden, this game got extremely hilarious. Did not, I did not expect that. I thought, that, I thought he was just going to lob out Infested Terrans here, but he actually managed to grab the probe, kill the pylon, and uh, I don't know what these stalkers are doing here other than dying. So Zions is really not able to get any sort of momentum. He's trying to break out directly through the center of the map. I don't know if this is a good idea or not. Uh, probably not. I mean, really, you should just try and go around the score callers at this point, unless you make so many zealots that you're just pooping zealots. Because right now, Katz has so much money, he can just... He can dilly-dally for like an hour. As long as he uh, doesn't lose his entire army, he's going to be just fine. And even if he does lose his entire army, he should have tons of larva laying around. Uh, or at least he's got some. He actually doesn't have as much as I thought he would. 39, though, overall, which uh, will be able to remax out his army should he end up losing anything here. And it does get more Tempest on the way. Not a bad choice given the amount of uh, score callers that are actually in the game. 53 score callers. Still in the game, even after losing all that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We got lots of abducts going to be coming out right now. And uh, this is actually the most silly game that has ever been played in StarCraft 2. I I honestly think that this is the most silly thing I've ever seen. We have Neural Parasited Void Rays killing Neural Parasited Carriers, killing not Neural Parasited Carriers. Uh, and by the way, the Protoss player is, is... When was the last time you saw this? Drones mining and delivering it to a Nexus. That has been something I have not seen in, in ever, I don't think. As uh, it does look like right now, Katz is going to be relying on that, dropping down the pylons here. Remember, this is the red probe now. It is not the uh, the blue probe. So all these pylons in here are for the Zerg player. I think also if he lost all of his overlords, these pylons should count towards his supply as well. So we'll see if Katz actually manages to build up a Protoss base and kill the Protoss player with it. Uh, would be pretty darn interesting. We do have pretty decent upgrades, though, for Zions. As far as the air units are concerned, actually, no, they're not. They're not good at all. That's only plus two shields on the way. So he has a lot of Archons here, though, which is exactly why he wants to get those shield upgrades. Still, though, you don't want your Archons to take too much damage. This Locust may still kill us in Archon. Uh, they don't actually manage to kill, but, man, they get it dangerously low right now. As we do see, Cat's going to be chilling out here in the center of the map, expanding to every base. So we got nine base Zerg now. Uh, all right, wait, wait, wait. I take that back. Eight base Zerg and one base Protoss versus the uh, the six or seven base Protoss. So definitely not something I say very often, but my God, this is why we love StarCraft 2 and also why we love Cats, man. He always is doing something silly. The Locust here are going to try to continue to move forward here. And really, this is just a little bit of picking back and forth by both players. The High, the, uh, high Templar Archon mix actually might be perfect here for breaking this contain. Not that you can really call it a contain. It's more of just a cutting the map in half. Nope, the Archon's melting away. That's why you need the upgrades, because the Archons are just not burning through these structures quickly enough. If you had the upgrades, it would be a completely different story. But uh, Neural Parasite, turns out, is pretty good. Going to be Neural Parasite the carriers, Neural Parasite the Archons, and uh, abducting those carriers into them, which is going to be quite effective here. Locust trying to chase that down does eventually time out. Remember that locusts do not last all that long. But uh, honestly, I feel like Zions, I mean, why not float your Tempest over here? Why not kill all that? Why not fly them down here? Start harassing the main base. I feel like and directly attacking the score callers, while you do have to do it at some point, there's just lots of open opportunities here for War Prism harass. There's lots of open opportunities for Tempest harass, which is not something I normally say. Normally in a game, one thing I'm not saying is, uh, you need to harass your Tempest. 
anymore. Yeah, I don't normally say that, but uh, in this game, I feel like that is actually a viable option. Let's uh, go ahead and check in over here. Oh, he is trying to use that War Prism. Has to be careful, though. Let's go ahead and check in on our Protoss base. He has uh, apparently plus 111 already done. And so many Stargates thrown down. I mean, you gotta remember that he has literally like 30,000 resources in the bank between the gas and the minerals. Which is some of the most amount of money I've ever seen one player have. Young Money, Yellow Swag, 420. We do see a uh, ha-ha, he's laughing. I think about the uh, Protoss player's base. He is killing. Now we have a PvP unfolding over here. We do have the Fleet Beacon right there, which is unpowered, so the little orb kind of stays down below is going to be able to kill off some of this stuff here, but uh, it does look like right now that this game is a little bit cray-cray. That is absolutely true. That's the only way to put it right now, as we do have the uh, Zelts up here on the top left side. Got to be taken down to drone or two, but the upgrade, the three armors actually making these Zelts not that effective at killing them off. And uh, oh, great, more spines and more spores. The more the merrier at this point. Uh, oh my god, this is the structure stab. I don't think I've ever seen that. This structure tab this why this basically has every structure in the book uh, and that you can get in PvZ, which is just hilarious. But uh, anyways, Locust can't continue for. I think his ETs will have like a million kills piece when all is said and done. However, it is going to be all Locust kills, which is uh, not an ideal situation for our Protoss player. He makes oh my god, oh my god. The gun run now has his own Tempest army. So he's going the rather standard Tempest Swarm Host build. Which is uh, which is quite good. I gotta hand it to Cats, man. I am so glad I follow him on Twitter. Oh my God! And we got the Infestor drop. An Infestor drop. The Overlord's gonna get the hell out of there safely, and uh, the DT is gonna be able to clean this up. But still, he forced the uh, transfer away. We do see DTs warping in over here on the top left side. So now these players are starting to realize. All right, we actually have to kind of do damage to each other at some point. Oh my God! Look at that cost efficiency. Thirty-four thousand to thirteen thousand on those resources lost. I mean, yes, our Zerk, wait, did he, that, did that not update when he was killing those Protoss buildings? I actually want to know really badly. I want to know that really, really badly. Did that not update when he was killing a Protoss base? Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, I just missed it. But uh, the Tempest have now started to attack the Protoss base. And honestly, Cass is doing a better job of harassing with Protoss than Zion's is. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how else to say it. He does have really good upgrades though. Uh, Cats though at 1-1-1 is gonna be going against one. Zion definitely needs to finish up his upgrades. He has more on the way, which is exactly what he's going to need here. But these Swarmos have just been going all day, just attacking them nonstop. He has them rallied two different ways, which is kind of cool. Tim is right here, though, able to still do a lot of it, uh, a lot of damage, excuse me, to the, the Swarmos. They want to sit back and attack them. For some reason, he's deciding to storm them, which isn't really going to be doing anything for him. But he has so many Tempests. Oh my god. Let's take a look at the units tab here 21 Tempests to 9. Uh, but the person who has 9 Tempests also has 12 Investors and 13 Swarm Hosts. So, definitely an interesting game unfolding before our eyes. Can Cats actually win this game as Protoss versus Protoss? Or is it going to be too much? Uh, I mean, there's just so many Tempests here. I don't know what actually kills this. Is there anything in this game that does kill this? I mean, a lot of Marines would be good, but that's, that, that's the only unit that Cats can't get. Just because there's not a Terran here to uh, True Narrow Parasite. But the Tempest right here, uh, just hanging out for now. And really, they're just going after Locust, Locust after Locust. And the Tempest over here, they, they basically need to find a way to break this. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. It might actually be impossible given the circumstances. But if he does not find a way to break this, then he's going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, uh -oh, going to be yoinking those over and Neural Parasiting as well. That one Tempest right there. Remember, Tempest do so much damage to each other because they do additional damage to massive units. So Tempest fights, kind of the most awkward thing you've ever seen because they basically two-shot each other just because they do so much damage. But look at this, both players have basically just started producing only Tempest at this point. We have six Tempests for one player, four Tempests for the other, and oh, I don't know what we're watching. Really don't even know what we're watching anymore. I feel like this is someone's first StarCraft game they've ever watched. They're gonna be so confused because this is like my 10,000th StarCraft game watch and I'm, I'm still confused. So uh, I apologize to any new viewers out there. This is not a standard game, but uh, the amount of awesome is pretty standard because StarCraft all around is an extremely awesome game. It's like the are going to be harassing, which again is something that I normally don't say in a cast and normally not something I say this much. And the Tempest going to be going for the counter attack, going to be doing that speed Tempest harass. I mean, these are things in the cast that you just do not ever say. And the DTs who get taken out there might actually just be freeing those up to uh, make some more Tempest because currently units have 29 Tempest with four more on the way. Yes, he definitely lost those intentionally. 
So is Mass Tempest, uh, does that win? Do you just win with this? I actually don't know. Oh my god. Oh my god, this is ridiculous. Tempest here going to be shooting each other down. I don't think Katz actually has enough to engage this directly. He's going to try the Investors, though. Got to be lobbing out those best Terrans. That might be more than enough to hold on for now. And the Katz is going to be focus firing here while Zion's opting to uh, just try and kite around these infested Terrans while also killing off the Tempest. But uh, for now, it's going to take a little bit of the heat there. Going to be backing some of those up. And this is Tempest Wars right now, which uh, is great. I'm, I'm okay with this. He just needs to make sure that he's killing the buildings and killing those swarm hosts because those are what are setting up this contain. And again, it's not even really a contain. It's basically just splitting the map in half. But at this point, it almost feels like a contain just because there's nowhere else for Protoss to go. I believe that he will be able to kill this off. I don't really know what Katz can do here, but uh, Katz has had all the answers so far. I think he finally killed this base up here with Locust. Um, an Observer is on the way. There you go. That's exactly what he needs. Corruptors have arrived. I don't know if this is enough Corruptors, though. Neural Parasite, though, could turn the tide of the battle. We definitely need to see some Void Rays or something mixed in, because Gear Tempest will eventually get whittled down here. Look at this. The Hydras is doing really, really good damage right now. The Observer here will be able to kill off those Swarm Hosts. Uh, really, killing off the Swarm Hosts is not that ideal, because at this point, Katz is done with Swarm Hosts. He's not going to make anymore. He's instead going to be using this new supply for anti-air. Uh, are those Cats Archons? Oh my god, Cats has Archons now. As if getting the most tier 3 unit, the Tempest wasn't enough. Now he's got Archons. Zion's pushing forward though with his terrifying force. He is at 3 attack, 3 shields, and 2 armor. Definitely wants to try and get that 3rd armor up if possible. However, he really has no Anti-Corruptor. I mean, yes, the Tempest can do a lot of damage here, but uh, I don't think he can take on just pure Hydra Corruptor without anything to back it up. He is getting some nice volleys off though on these Archons. Managed to take them out. Remember that Tempest do not do that much DPS uh, at more than one target. So these Hydras might actually be able to turn the tide. Can Cats actually hold on here? His upgrades are great. 3-3. Three, three. Even the Archon has got 3-3-3. Three, 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 so he's pretty much good to go. And uh, those look like Cats got to slowly push this back to Tempest here. Trying to continue to engage the supplies right now for both players that are just fluctuating up and down, up and down. More Tempest are going to be on the way right now for Zion. Can he actually break this uh, center location? I feel like these sport colors are just being rebuilt faster than Tempest can even kill them off. But he is going to attempt to do that once again. Remember that uh, Katz, he's got 11,000 murals in the bank. However, he has not been that cost effective lately. So if he doubles this cost efficiency deficit, did I say that right? Basically, if he keeps this up, he will actually start to fall behind. Zelts over here do have Zelt legs, and they will be able to clean up these spores. And that's just going to help even out the U.S. loss overall in a big way. However, Katz has mined a lot more money. He still has 50 drones. It's more than enough to saturate those bases. More and more Tempest going to be on the way right now. This is actually one of the longest battles I've ever seen ever in the history of Starcraft. they got to be careful here, though, because that's a lot of Corruptors, and Fungal Gross can keep them from running. Orndial Parasite could be devastating. I think he's actually completely out of energy, though. And Pure Tempest turns out not the best strategy. You need something to help guard them in the air, but the Archon Corruptor Hydra unit composition, which I've never said before, is pretty good as Katz is going to be pushing this back right now. I think Katz might actually hold. He's going to reclaim the center. He's going to kill off all those Tempests, and he is going to do it in style. I guess he is actually going to go ahead and make more Swarmos here. I didn't think he would. The DTs over here, though, just going to town on these Hydras. Uh, are their upgrades good yet? Uh, no. One attack, three shields, and no armor. That's why you don't see them doing all that much damage. The DTs, though, are going to be holding for now. We should see some Overseers on the way, and indeed we do. The poor observers over here are just terrified of what is currently unfolding. But, I mean, at what point as Protoss do you just wait until the Zerg is mined out? Because Cat still has 11,000 minerals. That's after building six Void Rays and starting an attack upgrade. He still has 11,000 minerals, almost 4,000 gas right now. And uh, that is actually just kind of absurd. This is one of the silliest games I think I have ever seen in my StarCraft casting career. And I imagine that if I was casting this game live, that uh, the crowd would be going a little bit bonanza. Bonanzas? Yeah, they'd be going banana, bonanzas. I was going to say bananas, but banana bonanza is, uh, is the name of my fruit stand that I'm going to open up one of these days. But uh, anyways, we do have now Spore Crawlers once again in the center here. And uh, got to be holding this off, I guess. I mean, there's Vipers out now. At this point, do I even need to cast? Or can I just sit back and play some sort of comedic song? And it would just add to how hilarious this game actually is here. 
It does look like a cat, so it's going to be chilling out here for a little bit. We do have some sort of an attack over here. I believe that was just an overseer or an overlord to scout that out. Locusts are still apparently a thing. And now, instead of going for Tempest, it is going to be Archon Void Ray. Infestor, Corruptor, Hydra, Spore Crawler. Queen is his unit composition of choice. I, I count these Spore Crawlers as units just because, I mean, look at them. They're basically units. Oh my god, how many Spore Crawlers are we up to again? Uh, we are back up to... I can't even tell because it's... 47! Look at this! Look at... <laughs> look at this structures tab! Are you kidding me? It's about to run off the screen. And uh, here it goes. Cats right now going to be pushing forward here. Got to be doing lots of damage. The, uh, the angle, though, actually was not that good because he's got a, he's got the uh, Protoss Syndrome, which is known as Death Ball Syndrome, which is where you just group up all your units. But, hey, it's bound to happen when you mind control this many Protoss units. But uh, he's going to go ahead and push down to the bottom right side. Can Zions actually hold this off? I mean, he's being out-upgraded by a Protoss player, and he himself is trying to go for... Uh, trying to go for a ground army, which is not going to work. He has to rely purely on air. But I feel like there's actually no way to beat this. It's one of those just don't let your Zerg opponent get to that situation. I mean, DTs are doing great just because there's no detection. But uh, if, if he's out upgraded you and he has all of the units that you can make, what are you supposed to do? Plus, of course, he has the Zerg units as well. Let's just go ahead and hide this UI. Let's just sit back and enjoy one of the most glorious games I have ever cast ever. The Corruptor's gotta be moving forward right now. Archon's gotta be joining in as well. Void Ray's mixed in. And I, this is just a beautiful thing. I just wanna go walk on a sunset lit beach. I wanna drink wine. And I just wanna reminisce about the greater things in life because this is a thing of beauty that we are with. You know what, I wanna thank you guys for experiencing this with me. I feel like I may shed a tear of happiness as I as I reminisce about my childhood and the meaning of life because this is something uh, it's basically a work of art at this point. So uh, anyways, we do see some else over here. Oh my god, he even went for size storm, you monster. You absolute monster as now apparently he has size storm. When have you ever seen someone researching Protoss Air Armor Level 3 alongside Muscular Augments? And he still has 13,000 minerals. That probe has been mining for quite some time over there. Has, uh, has, I mean, there's no segregation in, in his base at all. I mean, Protoss and Zerg living together as one, as equals. I have a dream, and that dream is Protoss-Zerg hybrids, man. Which I think is what Duran said before he made a bunch of Zerg Protoss hybrids. But anyways, Archon's got to be morphing in right now. Apparently he's got Side Storm. There's the GG and the W. Maybe that was meant for a well played. I cannot. I, for a second I felt like I was watching Bronze League Heroes. But then I remember that this was Grandmaster League Heroes. Now I do kind of feel bad for Zions because I felt like the Mass Tempest. It was a lot of fun, but uh, there are a lot of ways to counter that. You know what Zions reminds me of, and I feel really bad for saying this? You know all those uh, basketball pictures of, like, Michael Jordan or uh, Kobe Bryant going in for a fatty dunk? Zions, Cats is that. Actually, maybe one of you guys could. Maybe one of you guys could actually Photoshop this, because I know there's a really good picture of Zions on T or on Liquipedia, and there's lots of good pictures of cats out there. But anyways, it's like those pictures where cats is jumping up. He's Michael Jordan. He's going for the fatty dunk, and Zion's is the guy like trying to block, uh, trying to jump up to block, but he's just getting a face full of like Michael Jordan crotch. Uh, I love Zion's. He's actually really really good. He's won a lot of cups and stuff like that uh, out there previously. He's actually a really good player. But cats, boom, is your winner. Go follow this fool on Twitter, man. If that doesn't deserve your Twitter followers. Uh, I, I really don't know what does. So I'm going to put the epic tag on it. If you guys don't agree, that's too bad because look at the screen right in front of you. You've got Void Rays, you've got Corruptors, you've got High Templar that are morphing into Archons because he just used Psy Storm against a Protoss player at whatever. I, I'm, just, I'm just rambling on at this point because the game was so great. Ooh, I got nerd chills after that game. Anyways, hope you guys enjoy it, and I'll see you guys next time. Hello everyone, this is H to the Yusky Husky here. I am going to be casting a one versus one between our red Protoss player, Grubby, spawning down here in the bottom right side. I'm going to be talking about him in just a second. 
but his opponent is going to be Empire Hobot up in the top left side. I'm guessing his name is just Hobot as Empire is a clan, kind of like Empire Kaz is going to be a member of that clan as well. Empire Kaz, of course, an extremely powerful player who I believe I casted a couple weeks ago. Very fun to watch. But anyways, we will see how his fellow teammate does in this game as I don't believe I've seen Hobot play before. Maybe I have and I've just forgotten and I do apologize. And that's where you guys say it's too late to apologize. Anyways, Grubby down in the bottom right side. For those of you who do not know, Grubby is a former Warcraft 3 player. And I know I've said that a lot about not only him, but other Warcraft 3 players. But the significant thing about Grubby is that he was one of the top two, always trading places with Moon. So Grubby has finally made the switch over. Uh, Moon has had much more practice time, is a Korean player, and so is, you know, living in the team house and all that in Korea. But Grubby, on the other hand, just recently making the switch. I'm sure he's been playing the game for quite a while, but he has basically completely quit Warcraft 3. As far as I know, maybe he's still playing it just because maybe he can keep those skills and there's not as many professional Warcraft players as there are StarCraft players. But yes, he was one of the top Warcraft 3 players, if not the top Warcraft 3 player. So he is extremely fun to watch and it's really cool to see players from Warcraft 3 move it on up to StarCraft 2. And I I shouldn't say move it on up. I know there's people out there who like Warcraft 3 as their favorite game, but for as far as StarCraft goes, it's really awesome to see these players be in the competitive scene. They can be competing against each other, and also all the different players from different games kind of having an even play field here on StarCraft 2. So everyone from Warcraft 3 to Command and & Conquer and other RTS games out there, um, yeah, it's really Really awesome to see that, and I, I can't tell you how excited I am. Grubby is leaving a probe right here. Not sure if he will use it to put up a pylon just because there are six Zerglings on the field. Four of them are going to be running by. You can see Grubby is forced to throw down a Chrono Boosted Zealot, and this is going to be annoying to deal with just because there will be Zerglings there. Looks like uh, Hobot was going for additional... Uh, units there by canceling that extractor multiple times. But the Zerglings are now going to be in the base. And these probes, Grubby just needs to micro them a little bit and should be able to save them. Really phenomenal control there, keeping all of those probes alive. Yes, they took a little bit of damage, but that is no big deal. That is what the shields are for on those units. And now Grubby just needs to deal with these couple Zerglings. Does get a little excited with his Zealot here, which means this one Zergling is going to be inside, running around forever, driving him crazy, but... The important thing is, is that he is not going to be losing a lot of units to these Zerglings. So, yes, there will be scouting here, but there's not going to be too much for that Zerg player to see anyway. Now, Grubby doesn't want to let these Zerglings do too much damage here. So, you can see he's trying to get out another Zealot, and that Zealot's going to spawn. Unfortunately, his rally point was set right there, but the Zealot, since it was pathing blocked by those Zerglings, did spawn inside of his base. And so he does have another result right here. He should be able to clean these up. These poor two little Zerglings right here will get taken out. One probe says, no, I want to be a Zealot when I grow up. Holds position with it right there and six the other Zealot on this Zergling. So you can already see the APM of running around pretty high for Grubby. Just multitasking there, keeping his economy on track while allowing those Zerglings to do virtually no damage. Only the scouting of that one Zergling. You can see he wasn't even able to break through these shields, which that is a big deal because if the... If the uh, if the gateway takes the shield damage all the way down and then starts taking kind of the physical damage on the HP, the HP doesn't regenerate. So a Baneling Bust or a early Roach Attack can be even more effective because the buildings have less HP overall. It, it's small things like that at high level of play that players may not think about while watching a game but definitely can play a huge role here. And at this point of, in time, Grubby going to be pretty comfortable because he killed off those Zerglings and that is going to prevent the Zerg player from getting out his expansion super early since he was forced to make those six Zerglings or he decided to make those six Zerglings and that is also less larva for drones right now completely equal on the worker count which is not where a Zerg player wants to be really at any point in a game if he can help it just because Zerg are able to uh, produce so many drones once you get a couple waves of inject larva then you generally have a nice drone advantage you can see multiple drones are going to be on the way after that kind of pops off of there and we do have Grubby up at around 50 energy and he is going to be finishing his warp gate technology right now and has two gateways on the low ground. I'm really curious to see what he's going to use those chrono boosts on. It looks like it may be on this stargate and he's up to 60 right now so he's very deliberately saving these. A player like Grubby isn't going to sit on that much. Uh, okay so he is. I was going to say he wasn't going to sit on that. However, he is going to be chrono boosting out probes. So here I am all hyping it up. 
and Grubby gets the last laugh on that one. However, he does have that Stargate and should have enough energy in a little bit. You can see 25 energy now stockpiled on this Nexus to Chrono Boost out Phoenix or things like that if he wants to. Or he can just keep Chrono Boosting probes and make me just look like a total fumbling idiot. So thank you for that, Grubby. And Empire up here is going to have his expansion up and running. He also has a Roach Warren on the way. Roaches seeming to be extremely effective against Protoss these days and a Hidden Spire. It's very interesting to me, very interesting to me what Empire Hobot is doing here because he is going to be hiding a spire, but he's hiding in a place where if it does for some reason get scouted, that uh, the Protoss can easily access that and kill it rather than putting it, say, somewhere right here or even over here where a Protoss might not find it. But if he does, the Zerg player will be able to defend it. One hero zealot running through here. He wants to be a Zergling when he grows up, so he's going to scout exactly what's going on. Sees the Roach Warren, would normally see the Spire, but is not going to. Now look at this, delaying the Void Ray production with this Overseer. That is something you almost never see, but I definitely got to hand it to Empire Hobot for uh, utilizing that one unit, and that's going to give him time to react to that, get the units he needs. He could get out more queens if he wants. How many queens does he have? He only has two queens. Maybe he realizes that the Void Ray is so far away across the map that he's not even going to worry about the anti-air right now and instead can focus on Mutalisks. However, he is going to be going against some Phoenix pretty soon. Not saying that Phoenix completely annihilate the, uh, the Mutalisks, but if you get out three to four, Depending on what on what Grubby decides to do, then microing microing the Beatles against that can prove to be quite the challenge for a Zerg player. So one Roach over here decides to take out the entire Protoss army. Is not going to do it. Literally getting tickled. Look, taking four HP and damage. We're getting tickled by these sentries, but eventually tickling does kill, and with two force fields trapping him there, that is going to prevent him from surviving that. The Phoenix is gonna fly through here. He's gonna see one hatchery, and Grubby's gonna be like, okay, buddy. What are you doing up here? So he's going to see the expansion, does not see the uh, the Spire, which is very important because you can see there's a lot of Mutalists here. Literally Empire Hobot rushing to these Mutalists. And now they, no, he doesn't want to reveal them quite yet. Yes, he does. Decides to reveal them. Puts the Mutalists right on top of the Phoenix so it cannot get away. And now all of a sudden Grubby's scratching his head like, where did these Mutalists come from? And he's working towards Robotech, which isn't exactly what he wants in this position. You can see, uh-oh, I need to get out some anti-air. He does have a lot of Stalkers, which he can keep in his base to defend. Sentry, surprisingly effective against Mutalisks as well. And uh, the Void Ray is going to go down as well. So now there is zero map control for Grubby. However, he does know what he is going against, and that is going to be a handful of Mutalisks. You want to keep an eye on the production tab. What are the, What is the transition going to be from our Zerg player? Well, right now he's going to be going for a lot of, I mean, he has the upgrades, more Mutalisks on the way, three more Mutalisks, and he is double expanding. So there's an expansion up here in the top right and one in the bottom left. Now, if you're wondering... Why is he not taking this expansion right here? The reason for this is he wants to keep himself completely spread out so that the Protoss player has a difficult time locking down any of these expansions. Because you can see, with these rush to Mutalisks, they're just going to be swooping around, harassing everything. Every time Grubby tries to do anything, there's going to be Mutalisks right there to attempt to stop it or right there to counterattack. See, he can't even set up a pylon in his own base. And that means that the Zerg player can start making drones. You can see he's squeezing out a couple right now and expand once again. So we do have that hatchery on the way. So a very interesting tactic here by Empire Hobot. This is a very spawn-specific build that he went on this map, and it is proving to be extremely effective. Now, Guardian Shield is so good against Mutalisk, just because the Glaives, a lot of the DPS of a Mutalisk is the Glaives bouncing around and causing damage, uh, that kind of that splash damage, although it's not really splash. What is it called? Is it Lynx damage? Because it's kind of like Chain Lightning. But for now, it does look like the Mutalisk got a little excited and do get taken out by this cannon. Just one Mutalisk goes down, a second one getting extremely low on HP and does snipe right there. Nice focus trying, trying to use these Phoenix as Phoenix can move and shoot at the same time. Now this is the timing when a Zerg like, oh, needs to be careful here. Doesn't want to fly directly into this Protoss army. He will get completely decimated at a very cost inefficiency. So he wants to use this to counterattack and maybe kill all the Phoenix. Two Phoenix are very low and are all that remain. A third one spawning. But it's all about positioning with these units. You can see that a Mutalist does have a range of three. And the Phoenix over here, if he micros them correctly, do have that range of four. But the Mutalists get right on top of it just like that. They can take him out quicker than you might think. And so two more of them do go down. The Phoenix are pissed. Do snipe one more Mutalist. And, or one more Mutalisk. Excuse me. And uh, so it's kind of a back and forth battle here. 
Units lost, though, heavily favoring the Zerg play right now. Will snipe a couple of Zealots. Now, the problem is for Empire Hobot is he's never been able to reach a critical mass of Mutas. I, I really got a hand to Grubby for taking the time to whittle them down, not getting too overzealous, too overconfident, and instead just whittling them down as, as quickly as he can. Looks like a slight miss rally here will cost a couple Mutas their lives. That is a fairly large deal, but look at the map presence right now of our Zerg player. Just the mini-map over, I would say over half of it really has vision of the of the map by the Zerg player. So now all these these zealots here will get taken out as well. I think that I honestly think Grubby realizes I don't need these right now. It's hard to get up new pylons where I want them. So I'm just gonna go ahead and sacrifice these zealots. As the Zerg player is just sticking with mass mutal as you can see five more mutals on the way plus two attack nearly going to be completed here and the Mutalists, can you, as you can see, are down here. The Zealots sneaking in, doing a little bit of damage, and two spine crawlers aren't going to go up for Empire Hobot, but it does look like the Spire will get taken out. This is after that plus two attack. Oh, no, the plus two attack didn't finish. I don't know if he canceled it or if he realized he was going to lose it anyway, so that plus two attack did not finish. Nice timing window here by Grubby, but he is going to have to deal with all these Mutalists, and the Phoenix getting a little uh, kind of in the mix of those Mutalists. Not sure if it's ideal. This is such a close battle here. If Grubby can keep micro will be able to take out those Mutalists, especially now since he has that equal plus one attack. Drones are going to escape here. The Sentry is not able to force field and trap those in time, and it looks like Grubby's just going to go ahead and leave these units. One random Mutalisk over here kind of hanging out will need to join up with the remainder of the pro or of the Zerg army. Nice patrol pathing here on this observer, by the way. Look at this. He has it set to patrol, so it's always scouting these areas. Very inventive. Uh, a lot of players actually don't do that. They'll just leave an observer sitting around. So definitely worth it. We should be seeing some graviton beam usage here on these drones. We absolutely will. Those drones really have nowhere to run. And you can see just how much damage they can do with that plus one attack, how quickly they can kill these. Here come the Mutalists. Are they going to be able to take on this mini Phoenix? Kind of hard to tell. Neither player wants to lose their air, air superiority here. Although it does look like that is enough Phoenix to just fly directly into it. Who is going to win here? It definitely should be the Phoenix cleaning house. I mean, you got to remember with that plus one attack, they do additional damage versus light as well. 11 damage with two attacks. Uh, not a good situation to be in. So Mass Muta is not going to be working anymore for our Zerg player. Now Grubby can finally expand without having to worry about that harassment. And his supply advantage looking pretty good. Almost double the Zerg players now. I'm curious on the worker count. 53 to 56. So the Zerg player definitely isn't out of this economically at all. But he is only on three base, so he needs to take a fourth. That's exactly what he's going to be doing. And he needs something to deal with these Void Rays. Not Void Rays, excuse me, Phoenix, which is why he's getting Infestors. Eight Infestors on the field. The Phoenix completely ignoring this Spore Crawler. And the Spore Crawler does not get a single kill. So only one Spore Crawler there is not going to be enough. Looks like the Queen able to rake in one. That could potentially be a Zelt, though. This expansion right here would be the fifth for the Zerg. He needs to cancel it. And he does. Just in the nick of time. First name, Justin. Last name time, able to save that. That was down to the second. And Grubby is going to be following this up with some Immortals as well, just making his big ball of units extremely powerful. He's not going to be defeated by any Mass Roach, but what he may be defeated by is Mass Fungal Growth because the Void Rays, excuse me, Phoenix, they are not Void Rays. Um, yeah, the Phoenix. I wish I could reveal something about Void Rays, but I can't. You guys will see what I mean in the near future. Anyways, um, yeah, the Fungal Growth can trap all these units immediately and start killing them off. I'm not sure why Empire Hobot made a couple more Mutalists. That's really not the unit he needs right now. But these Infestors do have a lot of energy on them. Could Fungal Growth, he does grab five of them, is going to allow the, well, I guess there's really no anti-air right here. Just need to keep Fungal growth in these to kill them off. And it does take quite a few. The poor Infestors, though, are getting too excited and taken out by these few straggling Phoenix. But the Infestors finally are going to clean that up. Let's look at the units lost tap here. 11,000 resources lost, only 7,000 for the Protoss. And Grubby getting so confident, he's just going to cut the map in half by using cannons. I think his kind of thought process is, well, if a Zerg player is stuck on an even amount of bases when I have this giant ball, then I should have an economic advantage, especially since I got my third base up and fully operational quite easily. And if we do look at the workers killed, 38 workers killed, by Grubby. So Grubby really doing an awesome build versus that rush to Mutas. I think it's kind of one of the reasons you don't see Mass Muta very often is simply because, well, I mean, Protoss had the answer for it. Just get every unit that can shoot air, and then they don't really stand a chance. But 
Our Zerg player does have plus two attack range on, or the yeah, damage upgrade on the way, while our Protoss player, Grubby, only has the plus one completed. So in a little bit, uh, the Roaches could prove to be difficult to deal with, and these poor Phoenix now are finally going to be dead. Look at this, five kills, four kills, four kills, two kills, and three kills. They definitely have paid for themselves a few remaining Overlords flying in here to see what's going on but it will cost them their lives. Now, if you're wondering why it takes so many fungals to kill that, those units are not armored, so the infestors do not do their full potential damage to them, and this creep tumor is just creeping over here, doing the creep, uh, doing the creeper to that expansion over here, but it will see that fourth base on the way. Now, they will be even in expansions. The supply counts are getting a little bit closer. Empire Hobart gonna try and peek in here. He is not gonna like what he finds. And that is a massive Protoss army. We do have Zealot Legs on the way, plus two attack, as well as double Templar Archives. Don't think that was intentional, as there's only one upgrade you can get from that building. But we do have double Templar Archives on the way, and there's one of them. The second one is somewhere in clicking range as well. Nope, nope, they're right next to each other, so I guess... Yeah, there we go. He does cancel that one. There was no crazy strategy for doing that, and that was just a slight misclick by him. And now, warping in, these are all High Templar guys. I don't know what a Zerg player can do at a point like this. It's going to come down to Fungals versus Feedback as the Roaches, they aren't going to get completely decimated by the Psy Storm. It's the Feedback that's going, to, that's going to really hurt this army. Look at this, Empire Hobot. I am in love with you. You're being so smart. A Zerg player who is behind, going for a Nidus Worm, waiting for that big Protoss ball to move out. And then Nidus, your main, which is my favorite pickup line. But regardless, we could see a base race, which is exactly, I would say, what our Zerg player wants. Because you can see he's kind of stuck on these roaches. He's going to have that plus two attack. He will have Neural Parasite. That's not going to play a huge role unless he Neural Parasites High Templar and storms the army. That would be hilariously awesome and something I've never seen before. Don't know if we are going to see this, though. Now they are loading up inside the Nidus Worm, and it's loading up our unloading over here so it does look like grubby can safely move back simply because there's so many cannons here the death uh, march of the overlords here going to attempt to take out these cannons but here comes the attack right now not going to be too doing too much damage but there is a nice choke right here even a spine crawler in position here to defend this ramp and grubby's army taking a surprising amount of damage these overlords not really doing a lot though as empire hobot will have to remake these a huge mistake on his part the investors trying to take down a nexus Silly investors, though, you cannot attack, so you need to summon some infested Terrans if you want to hope to do damage. That Nexus will go down, though, and it does look like Grubby will be moving in over here, but uh, it looks like the Nidus Worm will be unloading the units maybe to their demise or to the destruction of Grubby. There's feedback on a lot of them storming the remainder of them, the rally point storming right on top of it. The investors do remain, though, so our Zerg player doing a surprising amount of damage in that attack, leaving a couple units behind to deal with it, and even saving his Nidus Worm. They're all loaded up inside. Is there going to be another Nidus attack, or is he just going to unload them right here? Look at all the pros getting taken out. Is he going to even the score? Now killing 21 workers and all. Can the Zerg player actually whittle down this Protoss army? The investors running to their doom, though. A huge mistake. This is a fungal growth there. Nice blink there to seal off any reinforcements as well as the escape path. However, these, these stalkers did take quite heavy damage there. And the force fields will prevent the Zerg army from doing too much damage. But look at the supply counts. Both players having a difficult time staying maxed out. Even though usually in these situations one army will completely decimate the other. Looks like Grubby wants to commit here to take this out. Look at the look at him blinking individual stalkers everywhere. Just for uh, just just to be annoying, really. And fungal growthing these probes, they will not be able to escape. Grubby will be losing a lot of them as well. Is there an investor down here? No, there's not. But really, the probes have nowhere to go, and they are all going to get taken out. So our Zerg player really doing hit and run tactics. It's now 200 supply. That storm right on top of the roaches, not going to be doing a significant amount of damage. But once again, blinking to trap them using the stalkers as if they're force fields. The roaches will escape though, and this battle is is turning out to be quite epic as the supply counts, again, are still even. And like I said, it's going to come down to size storms and feedback versus the fungal growth, which is exactly what we're seeing. These High Templars getting a little out of their league by running up there. However, the Stalkers are here to save the day. Plus two attack done on those. These are units only have the plus two as well. Grubby has carriers on the way. Feedback and storms on the ramp going to be cleaning that up. But the supply count still similar. So as, as you can see, there's still a nice little army up here of investors just waiting to fungal growth as much as they can and unloading more reinforcements here. We literally have carriers on the way for Grubby, which carriers can prove to be extremely effective 
if you can just get a couple out and keep them alive. So Grubby has been hanging on uh, to the best of his ability. He's lost several expansions and at the same time though, able to kill the army over and over for that Zerg player. But again, roaches are extremely powerful. We don't have all the roach upgrades. Like we aren't gonna be seeing tons of burrowed roaches running around. Now the carriers have revealed their, their hand, so to speak. Should be able to kill the Nidus Swarm before the units can escape. That's exactly what Grubby is going to do. So now he just needs to kill this army that's kind of behind enemy lines, so to speak, being on the right side of the map. And he may try and free them with this renegade group of roaches busting down this to try and force Grubby back. And right now, Grubby, I think, is missing an opportunity to kill off this army. That poor stalker, I don't know how long he's been there, but he is there no more. Now, Grubby is out of position, so these roaches will be able to move down. And if he blinks down in time to kill these, he could able to force field a lot of them. The roaches do burrow. There's not a single observer here. And there we go. He must know that these roaches do not have the ability to escape. And so he's just going to keep storming right there, take those out. But at the same time, he will be losing this Nexus. Gift forces the cancel there. And now everyone in this game, also known as both players, are in a very uncomfortable position. The roaches will be able to escape. Will this roach survive? Nope, he decided to turn around, got a little excited, and got taken out. Now, Grubby does have a lot of carriers, but you got to remember the reason that players never go for these capital ships is they can just get taken out by Vikings, Void Rays, and Corruptors, which is exactly what unit Empire Hobot is going to be going for. At the same time, though, he is going to be going for Broodlords, which the Protoss player won't really have an answer for it should the carriers get taken out. And so right now, this expansion could easily go down. A couple of burrowed roaches right here. And the ra these roaches down here are back for blood, able to go for the Nexus. And you got to look at the supply count. So the Zerg player in a surprising, comfortable spot right now. And the Corruptors need to get taken out, if possible, by the Protoss. But he does snipe that hatchery. And I think... Empire Hobot may be making an epic comeback of epicness here. The Protoss player was completely maxed out, but now he's having difficulty hanging on to a single mining base. You can see that there's only one mining base available for the Protoss. Thankfully for Grubby, there is no creep here, although Empire Hobot could position his Overlord. He does just that, so Grubby is running out of time if he wants to position a Nexus there. And now, all of a sudden, he has to spend these few remaining resources wisely. I don't think carriers are the wise investment. Just getting a couple of carriers to try and force a reaction from the Zerg player to overreact and get too many corruptors. Don't know if it's going to be enough, though. A couple roaches here will get sniped. Not a big deal, as there's a lot of reinforcements here. You can see that both players have gotten to their capital ships, so to speak, as the Broodlords are now on the field. And really, if you just go mass Broodlord, mass corruptor, you can deal with a lot of Protoss things, but sitting your units in the storm, not ideal. And it does look like, though, these cannons are going to be taken out. And can Grubby hold here? This is going to be his last stand. Whoever wins this battle, I would say, is going to win the game. Here come the carriers right now. Storm's going down to clean up some of the Zerglings and the Broodlings. The Corruptors are going to be running in here. These carriers will melt away before your very own eyes. And, however, there's just not enough, uh, I, I think, uh, units for the Zerg player that can attack around. Although running the Stalkers through the Storm is really working in the Zerg's favor here. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on. It looks like the Broodlords are slowly getting whittled down, though there's only three Broodlords remaining, storming the Corruptors over and over and over again, but the Stalkers are sitting under them, and all of a sudden now the, the tides have turned back into the Protoss favor, but here's going to be a counterattack with all of these Zerg things. It does look like the probes are forced to evacuate. Grubby will have nothing in response. This is the two most useless units in this situation, so he will be losing these two Immortals, it looks like, unless he can save it with the Storm, he cannot, and and the Zerg is once again just hammering time and time again to try and prevent the Protoss from doing the killing blow. Looks like he's going to be running down here to this expansion as well. One random Hydra in this entire army is like just one of these units is not similar to the others. And it does look like Grubby will be able to clean this out. Grubby doing it. Starcraft once now sending a couple Zealots over here to attack this expansion. Will be able to take out those workers. Workers killed 43 to 44. Identical damage dealt there as far as the workers are concerned. But uh-oh, Zerglings over here are burrowed, are ready to pounce at any time. And now it does look like the Zerg army is slowly getting out of control. 168 to 109. Can Grubby put on enough damage here, though, as he does now have an Archon, which will be extremely effective against any amount of Zerglings if he can keep it alive. Only a couple carriers remain, but you got to remember there is no anti-air for the Zerg player. And there's even more Zerglings running up here now, though. The remainder of the Zerglings unburrow are going to intercept. It looks like every single probe will get taken out. If not, it will be a lot of probes. And really, Grubby has nothing he can do about this. And yes, workers killed now up to 57. As you can see, these probes trying to evacuate out there. They will escape safely. Can start mining at this base once again. 
But look at this, getting attacked by a single Broodlord who has two kills now. Killing out the probes, the Roach is running inside the main base, just forcing Grubby to have to run all the way back here to kill it. At the same time, going to be losing that Nexus. Grubby seems to be falling apart here by extremely superior micro from these Roaches and or by the player and the carrier. Looks like he just spawns in time. But is that going to be enough as there's a couple roaches here probably going to burrow these? He does indeed. At the same time, there's going to be attack over here as well as over here. Grubby, though, leaving units at each base to defend. Only one carrier, though. Don't know if he's going to be able to kill it quickly enough. And if Grubby can just group up his army and move out, that's really the only chance he stands. But I don't think it's going to be enough. Here's that Archon I had mentioned before. Is going to survive for a little bit. Enough to kill 15 Zerglings. The Archon, though, will get taken out. One last shot there as he does fall. And this Grubby army not looking too hot right now as he is just running quickly out of units. But our Zerg player doesn't have that many units either. However, I mean, his supply is vastly superior. Is able to sight the Nexus at the last second with a few remaining units. Grubby has to commit here and attack. There's literally nothing he can do. There's no reason to even come back and try and defend these. He needs to move out right now. He knows that. Can he do the same thing that the Zerg player managed to do? I'm not so sure because, well, there's just nowhere for him to mine right now. These roaches are going to take out this Nexus as well. So these probes will literally have nowhere left to mine. If we look at the units tab, there is one singular probe left. That is him. So if he dies, Grubby has no more probes at all. Barely enough money to even make probes. And so he's going to try and keep his army together and just do as much damage as he can. I don't know if it's going to be enough to actually kill the Zerg player off, though. Will Blink over here trying to kill as many of these drones as he can, but they are going to burrow. Storm, however, works on burrowed units, and there goes that last probe. So Grubby, if he loses this Nexus, he cannot make another one at all. Will be able to kill this expansion. I don't know if Grubby can hang on long enough to kill off this Zerg player, but Empire Hobot not mining as much as you might think is actually mining nothing. So it will come down to this remaining army. And you got to remember that the Zerg army is at 128, but 44 of that is workers. And right now, though, Grubby has nothing to make any buildings on the map. And so I think the Zerg player in a base race situation should be able to win. And here comes the attack right now, storming on these Corruptors. But it doesn't matter as the Corruptors have so much HP, 200 HP with that two armor is going to allow them to kill the carriers. And this may be Grubby's last chance, although somehow able to save one carrier and when the Zerg player has virtually no anti-air that is something that is incredibly important keeping this last carrier alive he's kind of the last hope for the Protoss race in this battle and can Grubby hang on to his main base does Grubby have an observer uh no you know he does have one observer one singular observer does he know about it yes he does he's gonna be regrouping with his army sending a stalker around trying to find any expansions could use a stalker on these corruptors here as well is going to force field them here the observer is here to spot it you gotta remember the zerg player is only mining off of this one base so income tab is laughably bad 500 and those mineral patches are going to be mined out here fairly soon as well so can grubby hang on this is one of the more epic games that I think I've seen is going to be storming and taking out these remaining units. Now the good thing for Grubby is that now that he has these High Templar, they are free damage because the the energy is going to continue regenerating and all that. But does our Zerg player, ooh, looking at the supply counts now, it is 91 to 39, but again, 44 of that is drones, which is helping. I mean, if you look at the income tab, it is a little bit, which is more than what our Protoss player has, but this Immortal and Carrier proving to be very difficult to deal with this carrier up to 24 kills. He is now an executor, so he can go start playing the campaign because that's what you play as is an executor. But um, I don't think it's going to be enough. Empire Hobot wisely going to be moving his spine crawlers down here. It may be a little too late. They're burrowing as quickly as they possibly can. And you got to remember that does take that 12 in-game seconds. Don't know if Grubby will be able to break this. May need to find an alternate route to get inside the main base. Don't know if he's going to be able to, though. And every second that goes by is crucial because Grubby, I don't think he has a single probe. No, he does have one probe now. Probably long distance mining. He is indeed. Should probably spend those 50 remaining resources um, or he may sit on them to try and get interceptors. But this carrier, uh, he has the plus one attack and thankfully his carrier does have eight interceptors. He really can't afford to reproduce those. Is going to kill a couple of crucial drones here, preventing even more mining from our Zerg player. However, the Zerg player is sneaking more mining over here on this side. And the Zergling run by coming down here. This one probe needs to stay alive. And Grubby really has no way of dealing with the Zergling counterattacks like this. Here got the Roach is going to be able to attack the High Templar here. They are going for bust here, trying to kill the High Templar. Does kill two of them. 
And the remainder of the Roaches, though, do have to back out. You gotta remember, though, our Zerg player does have income, so he's able to slowly reproduce his army. Here's this carrier. He did indeed decide to move back with the carrier to kill this off, so we'll be able to kill these Zerglings, albeit slowly, and the Observer is in suit, going to take that out. But this is all Grubby has left. Although Grubby could kill these Corruptors, and he absolutely needs to, otherwise his carrier's days are numbered. But can he win with a single carrier? I just don't know if it's going to be enough. There is going to be a hatchery on the way for Empire Hobot if he can get this hatchery up in time. I feel like that will be the end for Grubby. But again, but this is such a back and forth game. I don't know who to root for. The only reason Empire Hobot's been able to hang on is because he's been long distance mining and should actually send drones on here just because every mineral counts right now. And I don't think Grubby's going to make these into Archons quite yet. Wants to keep them for that storm. And there's five Hydralis on the way. Not a bad choice. It just depends on if he can split those Hydras effectively. And now all of a sudden Grubby's like, well, great. What do I do in this situation? As he has so few units, he may, I think it would be very wise of him to try and take out this expansion. This is really the last chance for a Zerg player. Feedback on the Queen. Got to one-shot that. Very unstandard to do that. But here come the Corruptors. Here's the entire Zerg army. This is all that remains. Storms. On these few remaining roaches, they really have nowhere to run, but neither does Grubby in this situation. His carrier still remains with 34 kills, and the hatchery will get destroyed, or at least forced to cancel. And I thought I saw a second carrier, but that is incorrect. And if we do look at the units have here, still, that one probe, though, did get taken out, so Grubby has to remake that probe if he wants to, or he can just use the money on interceptors. He is now moving down here. Drones getting in on the action, and the carrier still remains, though. How many Hydras are going to be on the field? Five Hydras. Is that going to be enough to kill the carrier? The carrier needs to get microed back. The drones are trying to take down the stalkers, but blinking them back. Feedback on that queen as well, going to take her out. And Grubby somehow hanging on here just barely. These High Templar, though, are completely out of energy. He could easily make them into an Archon if he wants to. Or he can try and finish the Zerg player with just a carrier. I don't know if it's going to be enough. But how many kills does this guy have? 36! This is the most executor heavy army I've ever seen. Another executor in here. So you do not want to mess with this army, man. They are experienced. And here come a couple roaches right here. But it does look like Grubby will be able to take this out. And if he does, he may be able to win the game. The Observer, I think, is here somewhere to spot. I honestly don't know exactly where the Observer is. No, it, it is not right here. Did it get taken out? Ooh, the Observer did get taken out, and he can't afford to reproduce it. So, and there's no roach movement, so these roaches can't even escape. So Grubby in position to go ahead and deal with those. Grubby, I think, has finally realized there is no roach speed. But again, there is the long-distance mining of the Zerg player. So the longer Grubby sits here, the longer that the Zerg player has to rebuild that. I think he's just waiting for storm energy, which is exactly what we're seeing. Here's one lonely stalker going to try and take this out. Won't be able to, though. There's one Hydra with his machine gun, as always, to go ahead and defend that. So this is a very tense moment, as these do have enough energy for their storms now. And he knows exactly where they burrowed. Right there, one storm. And they do unburrow. Will be able to kill those. However, he did force a storm and is going to re-burrow these. Should have enough energy for one more storm in just a minute. Yes, he now has just enough. And is... No, he did force the unburrow. And this is, I feel like this is like a whack-a-mole game. And there's going to be the TT, which is usually a crying face. And it does look like Grubby going to try and go for the kill here. Needs to keep his carrier alive, as I think he will be able to. Although it is getting shot by the Spore Crawler, which was getting healed by that Queen. Only 53 HP remains. That Queen transfusing to the best of her ability. And it is going to pay off, as there's only two Interceptors remaining. On this carrier, Grubby getting a little bit sloppy. And the units tab here, I don't... Nope, there is no no way for Grubby to even make a work. I literally think that slight misclick could cost him the game. As... I mean, he has no energy or no, no money for interceptors. There's literally only one interceptor on this carrier. And I don't know if that's going to be enough, though. Trying to take out one stalker here. Is going to be moving around. Is forced to burrow the drone. So that's going to prevent any more mining from our Zerg player. The Zerg player only has 200 HP remaining. And the Zerglings are now inside the main base. Carrier going to go back. But you got to remember, he's only got one Interceptor. High Templar going to be moving in here. The Hatchery now is going to get bombarded. Really, the only thing this Hatchery is used for is that long-distance mining. And I don't know exactly what will happen. No, the Immortal in a tough spot. He's trying to run it around to keep it alive. The Immortal with 39 kills will get sliced down 
even though he was a veteran. And I don't know if even one interceptor can save this base in time. So Grubby now needs to run away from these broodlings. Shouldn't be taking damage from them. And really, I think Empire Hobot could unburrow here to try and get the surround. The High Templar, though, will have enough energy for Storm. And is he going to storm it? And feedback, not able to get that one off. And the carrier does need to get back to the main base immediately. But the last interceptor gets taken out by a hero queen. And so now it's the, the carrier is a flying paperweight, literally. And will take out the queen. Almost kills his, his sentry, though, which he does need for those force fields. And I almost feel now like this is a campaign mission and you, you're, it's like you must keep carrier alive is the is the rule. But Grubby's army is going to get taken out here. It looks like, although with Blink, I don't know if these drones can, if they have what it takes. However, I think that all the High Templar got taken out. No, there's still two High Templar being morphed into an Archon, but it does get sniped at the last second. And this one carrier is just sitting up there crying as, oh wait, yeah, he doesn't have enough for an Interceptor still. So Grubby, I don't think, can win this. I think it's impossible for him to win it at this point. Unbrewing there, does get the surround, whittling down the Stalker counts. There's only four Stalkers remaining. Just kidding, there's more. But now there's only four Stalkers remaining. And the Roaches are going to get taken out. There's going to be the GG. That came down to that one Spore Crawler killing off all those Interceptors, because otherwise this would have been taken out. Grubby could have focused on his army a little bit more and he would have gotten it so wow what an epic game guys i don't know how you couldn't enjoy that one as i don't know if you hate my voice or something but even if you watch it on mute that was absolutely worth it my god and imagine how effective it would have been if empire hobot was ever able to squeeze out that roach movement but i think he didn't think he would need it so at a 49 minute game one second away from a 50 minute game grubby has 10 supply empire hobot has 20 and that supply is two stalkers right here, which are going to die, and one carrier with no interceptors. So, man, if you want to call someone worthless, just be like, yo, you're a carrier without interceptors. Bird! Hello, and this is HDS Yeski here, and I am back with some more StarCraft 2 action. I feel like I have not been saying that nearly enough over the last couple of weeks because as you guys know last weekend I was at Red Bull this weekend I'm going to be at MLG and right in the middle of all that the last three days have been E3 so very very busy as far as traveling as far as doing events but I also realized that hey a lot of the other personalities out there are also traveling and doing events so I'm gonna try and get a little bit of more content out there I'm casting this right before heading out to MLG again I will be at MLG Anaheim this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Make sure to tune in. They get something like two to 300,000 unique viewers at a time, which is like millions of people throughout the course of the entire event. So definitely check it out. You don't want to miss it. Lots of money on the line and lots of the best casters. Unfortunately, Sean won't be casting, but there will be basically every other caster ever there, as well as all the top players from around the world. So I'm super excited about it. But speaking of being super excited, I cannot wait for this game. A lot of people did send it to me up in the top right side. It is going to be Grubby. Most of you know him of Warcraft 3 fame, but of course he is also from StarCraft 2, having switched from Warcraft 3 completely for quite a long time. And down in the bottom left side, it is going to be Slivko. And a lot of you may not know Slivko, but a lot of you should. He is quite a powerful Terran player, as you might be able to tell from the name. Sounds like quite a Russian name. And uh, this guy is actually sick good. He's currently ranked fifth on the European ladder, which is no small feat by any means. And uh, yeah, that, that's the most up-to-date score as well. So he's, he's right in the thick of things right now, ranked five on the European server. He's also done pretty well in some of those cups that uh, we would like to talk about. So Zotac Cup, he defeated uh, someone 3-2 in that one. Craft Cup, he defeated uh, Satini 3-0. And very impressively, in the scan invitational number four, he went 2-3, so he did get second place, but 2-3 out of a best of five versus Stefano. Most of you know that Stefano is the most successful non-Korean player in StarCraft 2. We do have a pylon dropping down there. That may be for a cannon to try and spook Slivko here. I don't know if Grubby is going to actually allow this to finish or not. It does look like drones have been pulled off the line now. Is this probe going to be able to get it off? Nope, as it does look like the drones did force the cancel there. So good reaction here from Slivko, but keep in mind the map is going to be Tall Dream Altar. The, the spawns are at cross spawns locations. And also, I mean, this is a huge map. So if there's gonna be a long-winded game, it's most likely gonna be on a map like this because it's very easy for a Protoss 
to secure the natural. Zerg, I mean, if they try and do a timing attack, they have to rush so far out across the map. As I get a text message here, you people, I thought I muted my phone. And muted. I got some StarCraft to cast, guys. Can't be bugging me while I'm getting my StarCraft on. We got the gateway before a cannon here. So Grubby is playing it out a little bit more greedy. And that is definitely what you want to do here with these cross spawns, given the timing of his opponent's spawning pool. Also, according to Liquipedia, and if you've seen his games before, um, Slivko does like a macro-oriented style of play. So there could be a lot of drones going on. We will definitely be watching the game of drones in this matchup. Especially going against Grubby. I wouldn't expect Grubby to be doing anything too crazy here moving forward. I just realized that I'm casting a bunch of StarCraft right before I'm about to cast StarCraft for three days straight. So hopefully my voice is able to hang on, man. And again, the action starts Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I do want to mention that Grubby currently ranked 61st on the European server. Still top 100, not bad at all. And that is with 265 wins, 153 losses, which is a 63% win rate. Right now we do have the early plus one. This feels so good as Protoss to be able to get away with starting this plus one right away because it's basically something you can always dump your Chronos into if you don't want to have your economy going as highly. Like if you want to do a timing attack like this, you can dump it into that plus one attack. Also, even if you don't have the tech for the plus two attack right away, which a lot of times Protoss players will, but if you don't, then you can start working on the plus armor attack, which is still a great upgrade. Even plus shields is great for Protoss because of Link Stalkers. Most of the time, they don't even lose all their shields, so having that shield to uh, reduce some of that damage is wonderful. But what exactly is Grubby going to be doing here? He has added on the robotics facility, and that's going to most likely be for an observer. Sometimes you will see a two-base immortal timing push that a lot of Protoss players have been utilizing lately. And not sure if we're going to see that out of Grubby or not. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of hard to tell right now, simply because, I mean, he is working on the plus one attack, which as a Zerg, if you do see that early, then you have to realize, okay, plus timing attacks, plus one, plus two, even plus three timing attacks are all something you have to watch out for. And uh, right now we do see the Queens with their plus range upgrade. They're going to make quick work of that Stalker, force him out of there. And has Grubby scouted the rocks down here? I don't know if he has super recently. But uh, he has scouted around there at least a little bit, so he will know the timing of that expansion. Rock's still uh, getting busted down here by just a couple of Zergans. How many Queens are we up to? Just three. So it does look like Slifko going for that designated Creeper. We see some players do this. We see some players like Stefano not do this, which is uh, always an interesting choice to me because I feel like Creep spread is so important for Zerg, but a lot, of, a lot of players decide not to do it. We do have four gateways being added on here. If you're wondering why these gateways are being added on the, at the expansion, this is exactly why. The Overlord speed buff, making Overlords able to scout that main base before he's able to kill it off. He does have them hidden down here, where it's much less likely for an Overlord to scout this. You may be wondering, well, Husky, why is it unlikely that an Overlord will be right here? you got to remember, for an Overlord to get to this position, they have to fly out through the center of the map. And that does leave them vulnerable, so the chance of them getting sniped is very, very high. Circling speed only about halfway done, but that's because Slivko going for early pathogen glance. He's starting to tech up early. He's already got his lair tech done, his infestation pit done, macro hatch on the way, and the third base here. So this will be a wonderful timing for Grubby to try and punish. I don't think he's going to be able to get away with it, though, although he is working on getting out the Immortals and wisely using the Immortals to bust down these rocks. Every time that Immortal shoots the rocks, man, they just take so much damage because, of course, they do additional damage versus Armored. And, of course, destructible rocks count as armored. But if you ever find yourself in a war game, do not make a tank out of rocks because it's not actually good armor. We do have four infestors now on the way. The four gateways in full uh, swing here as far as warp ends should he decide to use those. And having those four is going to be nice, but he does decide to go ahead and go for an expansion. So he, he played it a little bit safe here. By getting the extra gateways, he can warp in some few uh, additional sentries to start getting their energy out. And then also he can play it in a more defensive way if he needs to while securing this third base. The circling told to sacrifice his life to spot the Nexus. He does indeed do just that. The third base is now up for Slivko. So 10 minutes and very few units have actually died. Just a couple of Zerglings and uh, that is really all. So right now, look, oh, no, there's only getting taken out there. He did spot the amount of Immortals, was able to see the amount of upgrades as well. That plus one armor now done. Plus two attack is on the way here as he does have the tech to go ahead and be able to unlock those additional upgrades which is exactly what he needs to do. He needs to try and get out those upgrades as best as he possibly can, especially since, uh, you know, this this could be a long macro game. As Protoss, you want to get out that plus attack. The plus armor is great as well, but uh, you always have to rely, of course, on the Twilight Council to start getting out more upgrades. You 
see the photon cannon is going down at the expansion. Grubby says, I'm, I'm going to play this for the long haul. We do have an observer scouting out here. The fourth base it does look like uh, they had to pause the game there, which is not too uncommon. Make sure the lag settles just a tiny bit. We did see, I believe, a warp prism. There it is now moving out right now, and he is getting the warp prism speed here. This game is already starting to get extremely awesome. The Warp Prism speed right there researching. This is not Thermal Lance, which is a player does not necessarily know this. Even if he scouts that out, he doesn't know that it's going to be Warp Prism speed. We could see a Warp in at this expansion. These drones, not completely vulnerable because they're actually going to be long distance mining here for a little bit. You may be asking Husky, why is he going to be long distance mining? Actually, if you're talking to your monitor like that, you're, you're kind of weird. But that's fine. Why is he long distance mining? Well, he's basically saturated at all of his bases already, and he just has a lot of drones overall. We mentioned how he likes droning. Well, he's up to 80 drones. So if Grubby does not deny this fourth base, does not prevent you know his drone count from getting ridiculously high, then he is going to quickly fall behind. He does have a second Warp Prism on the way. Grubby going to be relying on some sick micro here. This is something that uh, I I'm honestly surprised we don't see more. Because this is this was standard in StarCraft 1 was to do multi farm wrestling like this, but he does unload the cells perfectly to be able to take out a lot of these drones. This guy goes straight for the hatchery. Slipco doesn't actually have any units right now because he's been making non-stop drones, but he is gonna lose his expansion. I do believe, although that is a lot of Zerglings, as Grubby though is picking up these units to keep them alive. The hatchery very low on HP, 25 HP. He realizes, hey, those two cells have got this. Sacrifices the zealots to take out the hatchery. He is still ahead in the units loss, but more importantly, he's delaying mining time on that fourth base. If he can stay equal in the bases, also he could take out this base on the bottom right side. Where is the other war prism? It is moving out on the left side. This is where uh, the micro starts to get a little bit crazy for Grubby. He does realize that there's a hatchery on the right side. Can he do anything with his war prism on the left side? There's dropping them right now. The plus two attack is done. Plus three now. Just starting, he will force the cancel there. That poor drone, not gonna escape. He decided to stop retreating and just give up and sacrifice his life. The supplies are looking almost identical here for these players, which is kind of surprising. Usually Zerg wants to be ahead, but right now you gotta remember Slifko has saved up a lot of money. He can invest it into an army whenever he decides to do so. And it does look like the War Prism gonna be moving out here. There's no anti-air, but there is enough for Fungal Gross. He could take out this War Prism with relative ease. And where's the attack in the main base? There it is, right here in the mineral line. He's got to take out the queens immediately. More cells are going to be warping in here. Is there anything else that he can actually take out that's worthwhile? He is going for the base over here. Is it going to be canceled? No, it gets taken out. The multi-prog harass absolutely out of control for, uh, for Grubby right now. He did kill off that infestation pit, though. He did kill off a couple of queens, and there's only two queens on the field. And denying the space here is going to be huge. But has Grubby actually done enough damage? Yes, he's denied the expansions. Yes, he's technically ahead in the units lost, but he has lost quite a bit of zealots. Now, one thing to keep in mind though is that he has managed to secure a fourth base in the midst of this. He's starting to warp in a more standard Protoss army. I mean, of course, he has the Immortals still because he hasn't attacked them, but also getting the High Templar out could easily turn those into Archons. He does immediately, but more importantly, is a Fleet Beacon just finished. Where are you, Fleet Bacon? I love bacon. And it must be in the main base somewhere. Am I missing it? Yeah, it is right there. I'm so blind sometimes when it comes to these buildings. So there's Fleet Bacon, baby. Is he going to work on carriers, or is he just going to go straight for a mothership? I wouldn't be surprised to see a late-game mothership. But it does like the first got to get taken out here. Grubby not really focusing on that anymore. He is instead focused on this second base and storms on the drones. And you do not see storm drops very often in StarCraft 2 because they are not as good as in StarCraft 1, but Grubby making that one work, and now the Broodlords are out, though. Does Grubby have a response to the Broodlords? We do see 18 drones on the way from Slipko. We mentioned how he likes macro. That's exactly what he is gonna be doing here. He also has a hidden base up in the top left side, which is such a risk, because since Grubby has a War Prism, he can easily fly around with it and spot those, especially with War Prism speed, but he's taking a risk trying to hide the expansion. He knows he's lost expansion after expansion. Even this one's not, not fully up and running quite yet, but uh, don't count our Zerg player out yet because his resilience has been resounding so far in this game. Yes, he's lost a lot of workers. Yes, he's lost a lot of bases, but at the same time, he's been taking risks. He's been making a lot of drones. He's been teching up heavily. He's been doing pretty good on the upgrades as well. So the longer this game goes on, the more and more he's actually going to get back into this game. We do have a mothership on the way right now. Which Nexus is it at is the real question. It does look like it will be inside the main base. And that is indeed the most difficult base to scout out right now. We do have Thermal Lance on the way here for Grubby as well. And this game 
is starting to heat up, guys. So far, already a great game with multi prong attacks from Grubby, but the resilience of our Zerg player, Slipko, showing us why he is one of the highest ranked in Europe right now, at least on the ladder. And we do see now a fifth base. Yep, fifth base on the way here for Grubby. Hasn't quite spotted the base up here, and I love what Slipko's doing. He's taking this base, realizes his income on the minerals is pretty darn good already, so he immediately takes the gas, which is so important for Zerg. I mean, obviously you need gases every race, but Zerg especially. Uh, Protoss is definitely one of the races you need a lot of gas too, but he can use it for those Broodlords. He's gonna need a lot of Corruptors as well to deal with the Colossus, deal with the Mothership. And that is where that gas is going to be invested. And also, investors are great for fungal growth. They can uncloak any units that may be hit by the Mothership. Um, if there's any DC harass or anything like that, then you can deal with that quite easily. There's gonna be a drop over here. Storms once again, the drones getting owned. Although quite a few of them do survive because they're spread out. But it does look right now like this army has got to get completely annihilated. This is what I'm talking about, Brood Lords. There's no super cost effective way to deal with them without getting your mothership involved. And you do not want to get your old mama ship involved. But uh, anyways, that's what I'm talking about, man. Slipko immediately crushes through that army. Makes it uh, very even here all of a sudden. And now Grubby's going to have to realize, oh, that's a lot of Brood Lords. That's why he hasn't been making any roaches. That's why there's no Hydras, no other Mutalists. Because it is going straight in the Brood Lords. They do have the plus one attack, plus one armor, and plus two attack is on the way. Neural Parasite is on the way as well. If you can actually get off that Neural, take control of the Mothership, and be able to Vortex the Protoss army, that could be it. But we'll see if that actually is what happens. It's all going to come down to this Mothership. That's kind of how late game PBZ tends to play out nowadays, is that, uh, you know, it all comes down to the Mothership. Can he actually make anything happen with that Mothership? We do have a shield upgrade on the way that is going to benefit the Carrier which I'm really excited that Grubby's actually making a carrier. Carrier will indeed arrive, and I'm kind of excited about it. I'm surprised to see Grubby not get more upgrades here. He would really benefit from that plus three armor, although his uh, his Archons would love to have some shield upgrades. Again, remember, Archons have 350 shields and only 10 HP. So I guess when they're taking a shower, man, that's when you should attack them because they got no HP. Changes over here, scouting out everything that's going on. And by everything, I mean they're just chilling out over here, waiting to die. And uh, it does look like right now, I mean, this this expansion up in the top left hasn't been spotted. The Broodlords, where are the Broodlords? Where are they chilling out nowadays? There's some Broodlords down here. And for realsies, there they are inside the main base. So when he decides to attack, the Broodlords have a movement speed of 1.41. So it is going to take him a long, long time to get out across the field. That is going to give Grubby time to react. It's going to give him time enough to get enough energy on his mothership and also to get out some carriers. You can see the Graviton Catapult on the way, the plus three armor on the way, and the plus one weapons. Although he needs to be careful the mothership. Can't afford to leave it here. And oh no, they stored themselves. Oh my god, absolutely disgusting. Loses the High Templar, but also triple storms at once and takes out most of those links. Um, not a devastating loss for either player because you got to remember, Grubby has a lot of money here that he can invest into whatever he wants, and he is doing that like crazy. He's got more prisms on the way and all the upgrades we already talked about. More cannons, more stargates on the way, even another robotics facility. This game is going to be sick. And I am kind of surprised to see Grubby not go for more gateways. Instead, he's going for much higher tech units. Usually, Protoss want to try and win by warping in a reinforcements on the front lines. But he is instead going to be going for the higher tech units that you don't normally see out of Protoss. I mean, we're talking about carriers, motherships, and this late game Colossus as well. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how Grubby plays this out. He is working on 1-1. One, one. Both upgrades on the way now for his air units. He is pushing the creep back just a little bit. This is definitely an unorthodox game that we're witnessing here, as it is a big, big macro buildup. A lot of Broodlords, probably the most Broodlords I've seen in a game uh, almost ever, I feel like. He does, oh no, those aren't Broodlords, excuse me, those are Overseers, but he does have 17 Broodlords and 11 Corruptors, which can easily be turned into Broodlords as well. So at this point, man, we're sitting, sitting back, waiting for the action to happen, because both these players are completely content just sitting back on these bases. The creep has finally or the expansion up here has finally been spotted. This will be taken out. There's nothing that Slipco can do. He might as well send these drones to mine out their final days. If they try and run by these cannons, they are going to get owned. And really, Slipco, does he actually need this expansion anymore? Not really. Killing off a couple Archons, though, is going to be nice. And the Colossus could get taken out as well by these Corruptors, which do have two attack, one armor. And he does recall back to the main base. And I don't know where that motion actually was. Oh, still right there, as he does manage to save those units. Now, this is quite interesting because Slipko doesn't have that many bases in comparison to the 
Protoss, but he does have a lot of money. He's going to be able to, to bankroll a bunch of larvae. Right now he is at 32 and uh, is going to be injecting larvae still here a little bit. This late into a game, it's kind of difficult to stay on top of your inject larvae. These zealots, though, stand on top of this expansion as Rubby doing a surprising amount of harassment here in the late stages of the game. And he's going to be moving out to take out the uh, the creep tumors. And he may be just purely relying on mass recall here to slowly pick apart the Zerg. He knows the Zerg, his army is a mobile. And so he is going to actually try and be more mobile than the Zerg. Not something you usually see. He may be able to snipe this expansion. And then mass recall out. Is he going to do it? One Colossus goes down. There's the mass recall. But the Colossus gets taken out. You gotta remember your army is not invulnerable to damage while it is waiting on the mass recall. And I cannot believe a Protoss player is actually out harassing a Zerg player and being more maneuverable than the Zerg. These Zealots, man, you gotta kill them off at some point. There he goes right there. I feel like a Roxkis, or not Roxkis, excuse me, Slivko has slipped a little bit here in this game. I mean, he, he does have so many Broodlords, but uh, at the same time, he's losing base after base. He's lost so many drones. How many drones has he actually lost? A hundred? Uh, he's lost a hundred workers and only killed off one. That is literally a one to one hundred ratio. I don't think I've ever seen that in a game. Grubby, if you lose this game, I I, I feel for you, Brotoss, because he has killed a hundred workers. I I gotta look at that again. One hundred workers killed. Grubby, I I just got a hand to you, man. You are a beast. Now the main problem is actually killing off the Zerg because at some point he has to deal with this army and even though Slivko has virtually no income, even though he has very few workers compared to where he's at, he still has basically the best unit composition that a Zerg player can ask for right now. He's going to have crazy fungals, infested terrans, neural parasite. He's also of course got the broodlords and the corruptors themselves. You got to remember if fully upgraded, they're going to have five armor. Just think about that for a second. Five armor on a Corruptor plus 200 HP. That makes them almost impossible for a Protoss player to kill. Because what, what anti-air do they have? I mean, the, the Archons kind of, the Corruptors can easily kite those. He's not going to have that many Stalkers. And the Corruptors are going to be good versus the uh, versus the Mothership and also versus the Carriers. What is going on over here, man? This is quite the Zerg party we got to have, have, have happening. But so right now we do have three, three air upgrades on the way. Plus the three shield upgrades on the way from Grubby. I almost feel, man, like they had the gentleman's agreements here in this game. They were going to say, they were just like, yeah, let's let's try and play out the most epic game ever. I'll transfer my drones over at the 28-minute mark, and just, just go ahead and let them live while they're transferring over there right through your army town cool. All right, so this expansion is going to go down, but the Broodlords could get a good angle here. You have to remember, though, that Fester is still parasiting these stalkers. What? And there's the mass recall, but guess what? This Archon is no longer yours, so it's going to get taken out here. Focus down. The stalker going to get taken out as well. That is so many Broodlings. I wish that Broodling showed up in the unit stab, but uh, that is going to be a sick amount if he actually manages to, to engage the army directly. And really, what does Slipco do here? Oh, oh, what? What? Oh my god, that, that's a probe. That is a Neural Parasited probe. That is a Neural Parasited probe for the Zerg player. He's going to re-Neural Parasited, I would imagine. Oh my god, is he going to make... He, he just made a Nexus with Grubby's Neural Parasited Probe, and then he's got to kill it off with the Broodlords. He is actually going to do this. Is he actually going to go for some Protoss units? Now, you have to remember that in uh, in StarCraft II, you do not get extra supply for mind controlling a unit. In Brood War, Protoss had the mind control. If you mind controlled an SCV, for example, you immediately were able to make a 200 supply Terran army. Now, it may sound overpowered, but that actually never happened. At the pro level, that was something that was not viable. But uh, right now, Slivko, what could he do here? He could go for Storm. He could go for a Mothership. He could go for Carriers. Oh man, I don't even know. The DT, has he spotted this Nexus? Does Scrubby actually know that this is going on? He has to, to have a feeling. I mean, maybe he didn't even watch that probe, though. I'm kind of curious on his unit vision if he was paying attention to this or not. Because this Nexus hasn't been spotted. Spine crawlers are going to get set up here to actually guard the Nexus. I cannot believe we're watching this, guys. This game is so awesome. I can see why people have sent this to me now. As Grubby has full upgrades on both air and ground. That's I don't know if I've ever seen that in a 1v1. We also have a Neural Parasited Probe building a Protoss base right now for the Zerg player. And the Nexus, here we go. The good old 31 minute expand into a different race. 
the hatchery is going to be alive there as well. Does Grubby spot this Nexus quite yet? Yes, he does. He managed to actually grab the sensor tower here, so he knows that something is being built here. You have a base going on, are going down over here. Not much going on for the Zerg as that expansion gets completely taken out. Is he going to use the mass recall? I just can't believe that Grubby is actually managing to harass more than a Zerg player. This like never happens for Protoss, and I kind of hope that he continues doing this. A lot of Oak Lords are a little bit vulnerable here. You got to remember that uh, they do 47 damage versus Biological, which is basically everything that a, a Zerg player is going to have at this point. Is he going to use the Master Recall? Yes, he does. The units stop attacking, take a little bit of additional damage there, but they do make it back home safe. Oh my god, he's making a gateway, guys! Feedback! On an Overseer that has no energy, I don't know what these uh, High Templar are doing down here, but he he actually just counterattacked with High Templar. Like, do you guys realize that that just happened? He counterattacked with three High Templar. This this I don't even know this game anymore. I I feel like this is the weirdest game I've ever seen, and the fact that it's played out by two of the uh, best European players out there has me pretty darn excited. Units lost overall is almost identical. We do have now the unit composition for Grubby. Look at this. This is just, it's going under the name over here. And also take a look at Slivko. He's got probes in this army now. Actually making three probes. Not quite sure why he decided to do that. Maybe hiding one at some point. Oh, feedback, triple feedback on the queen. This High Templar is now ranked faster. I, I almost don't even want to commentate this game anymore. I just want to sit back and make a list of the first things I've ever seen in a game and how many of them are in this game. He just triple feedback the queen. And no, don't lose that High Templar, he's a master! No, the master High Templar gets taken out. That was Tastar himself, man. Coming back, enlisting in Grubby's army. He's heard about how epic this battle is for Tall Dream Alter. The expansion, the bottom right side, could get taken out. The mothership, where is that mothership? Still like in the exact same spot. Does have enough energy for a mass recall here, should he decide to go for that once again. And we do have now, oh my god, he is going to go for a mothership, isn't he? He has to start out of the way, more feedbacks, counterattacks with the High Templar, keeps them alive, turns one of them into an Archon, and uh, this Archon may get taken out here, but what is Slipko really able to do here? He is able to finally kill off that counterattack, does save Grubby though, two of the Archons by putting them inside that warp is, I cannot believe Grubby is counterattacking here back and forth just non-stop. And we do though have a mothership on the way. I honestly think that Slivko has just given up trying to win straight up and is instead going to just go straight up for a mothership. Like like nothing else. That is his game plan. Now one thing I do want to mention about Grubby is that he does not have that many gateways. Um, considering where this game is at. Oh, no, he added on way more down here, excuse me. But he could still even add on more because you have to remember, he has 12,000 minerals. 12,000 minerals. That is 120 zealots, if I'm doing my math right. I I, I probably... I think that's right. But anyways, he can warp in a lot of units here. So if he manages to lose his entire army, then uh, he could be in a lot of trouble. But at the same time, he's slowly just picked apart the Zerg's economy completely. And we do have a fleet beacon now on the way by Slivko. So he is going to work on getting out a mothership. He saved up all the Chrono Boost there, because really what else is he going to Chrono Boost out? He can't Chrono Boost buildings. Another Archon is going to get taken out. Grubby can definitely afford to lose units here and there, though. His army now is in the center, but you got to watch out for Fungal Growths. Although, plus three attack, man, that makes you feel so good. Two Broodlords and a Corruptor going down immediately. The base in the bottom right side is going to go down as well. Grubby saying, Mama Ship, question mark. Slivko says, yep, as it's really no secret at this point. Um, he's saying he does lose this game, but we're going to see exactly how it plays out. How many how many units has uh, Grubby killed off? How many workers? Um, overall, the units lost tab is relatively close. Workers kills up to 154. And Slivko seems to be counting himself out, but he is also going to have a Mama Ship of his own relatively soon as Grubby deciding to finally push in here 37 minutes into the game. It almost feels like this game has been longer than that. But uh, no, it indeed has not. The mothership is nearly here. Are there observers for Grubby out? That's the real question. Yes, he does have more. Okay, I was going to say for a second there. He doesn't have observers, but he does. The Broodlord's trying to get away. They're going to get melted away so quickly if they engage this army directly. And he could fungle on the uh, the Void Race here. That's exactly what he wants. 
prevent these Void Rays from retreating. And he does Mass Recall. So that means that this Mothership is going to finish. Slivko is still in this game. And uh, does look at Grubby, though, continuing to harass. He's warping in more DTs. He's got units all over the place. Uh, War Prism still chilling out over here. And what do we have building up over here? Oh, another Infestation Pit as he did end up losing that. Now he's going to put these probes to work. And there's the Mama Ship, the very first PBZ I've ever seen that has two motherships in it. Oh, Cloak Zerg units look so dope! Oh, God, this looks sweet, guys. I'm so excited for this. His army is now maxed. No, it's not maxed. He doesn't have enough money to actually be... No, he does have enough money to be maxed. What am I saying? He is killing off some rocks up here. But can he actually engage his army directly? Honestly, he should make, like, some roaches or something to absorb some of that damage. But uh, at this point, what... Are you guys doing the, the Infestor Dance there? What was that? The Cloaked Infestor Dance is a very, very specific type of dance. But uh, he does need to make more Corruptors. That is what he's doing right now. And I believe, yep, he still does have his Spire. I think making Corruptors is really kind of his only choice at this point. He's only mining off of one base, though, and uh, that's why he cannot afford to shoot anymore. Mass Corruptor would be nice. These Archons aren't that useful versus the Broodlords, uh, but there may be too many Broodlords to begin with because does he have enough anti-air? At this point, he needs pure Corruptor. He does have 19 Corruptors. I do believe that these Corruptors are going to get taken out, though, as soon as they spawn. Yep! Does end up losing more there, so the units lost slowly and more and more as the game goes on, trying to favor here. Our Protoss player, but it does look like Slipko finally moving out with his units. He does have detection here, so that DT does not stand a chance. But both these players need a lot of detection. It's got to be tough for Slipko because he needs to snipe all of the observers, and that is really tough to do. Although, Grubby only has one observer with his army here. Something that's very important, the Hive Tech has gone down. And actually, I think our Zerg player only has one building uh, on the entire map. I don't see any other buildings for him. Oh, these units are going back towards the hatchery. Oh, they're going back towards the Nexus, actually. Sorry, I forgot that he does have, you know, Protoss buildings as well. So these units are long distance mining to a Nexus. And this is just so absurd right now. Like, this is actually the most absurd thing I've ever seen. The production has halted right now for, for basically everyone. Grubby, though, is continuing to be maxed out as he did warp in a bunch of Stalkers there. And he will be able to slowly whittle away the Zerg army. I mean, the production tab is almost useless at this point. I, I feel like I need to look at the units tab. And we just need to see these armies clash. These armies duke it out. But what a ridiculous game this has been. I know it's been a little bit slow at times. But let's just let's just recall. Haha, <laughs> get it? Puns. Let's just recall what's happened. Lots of recalls out of Grubby. Started out with a double War Prism harass. We saw a High Templar feedback. Three queens and one shot all three of them. And we've just basically have seen absurd amounts of things. Lots of carriers as well. Not something you see very often. Changelings moving out. Kirby's probably going to deal with those. Not that he really needs to. Oh, Micro there. They move so slow when they don't have Zealot legs. And they do get taken out. So five kills for that Zealot. And right now, Slipco wants to engage us directly. He wants to get a good Vortex. He has to avoid the Archon Toilet. That's something that can make him lose this game immediately. But it is 150 supply to 200, but he does have such a good unit composition, but can he actually gain it directly? Feedbacks on the Overseers, I believe that was. How many Overseers are actually left? Are there any left? Um, yep, there is still the three. Maybe it was on the Investors as well. A spawning pool being built. Mark. That's always nice. It does look like this expansion kind of get taken out. Not that you can really call it an expansion, but no more Protoss units for the Zerg. He has managed to keep these probes alive, though. Um, so we could eventually rebuild that up if he decides to, but I don't think we're going to see any more Protoss units. Instead, we are going to finally see the engagement here, I believe, is the Mothership with this army. No, it's not, so we could Mass Recall out, and he does, but at the cost of one carrier. And where did he Mass Recall to? Down here. His Mothership does still have enough energy for a Recall in just a moment. Feedbacks do go down. Are these the counter-attacking High Templar? I, I don't know, but I can't believe that he's actually managed to be counter-attacking with High Templar. That's another thing I've never seen before. One Broodlord slowly hacking away at this expansion. It's going to take quite a long time as he tickles it to death. But uh, he will lock down two bases and manage to take one of his own. He does decide to go for the Nexus, which is, uh, I think, the wrong choice because he doesn't have that much money. And building a Nexus costs more than a hatchery. Also takes longer to build as well. The High Templar are going to get taken out here. Does feedback on the Mothership, though. So maybe that's what he was feedbacking before. It's kind of hard to tell in the chaos of things in that last battle. So that Mothership does not have enough energy for a Vortex. He does have Layer Tech on the way. But you got to remember that his tech has been completely reset here. 
and what that means is is that uh, he has to he can't actually make anything he, he basically has to rebuild up everything he has he may be able to kill off this expansion the nexus does go down and these i don't think that the uh, the pros are going to escape here no they are not that is going to be a lot of early summon here but every zerg base has been destroyed and that's why it's completely reset here and this game is still just ridiculous. I imagine watching this game on stream was probably one of the most hilarious things if he ended up playing it on stream. Here we go. Grubby's got to be going in here. He has left it. No, he brought his mothership finally. So this could be the final battle. We do see Fungos going down on the carriers. Neural Parasite on the Void Rays. He would really like to Neural Parasite a carrier if he could. But uh, losing a couple of the Void Rays there is going to be huge. But does he actually have enough to engage this directly? He should be using the Corruptors on the carriers. And Grubby may actually end up losing this battle. He will, though managed to kill off the entire base here. Mothership goes down, but not before the Vortex. Are there any Archons? Yes, there are. Does he get them inside the Vortex? That is the real question he's trying to, but the Archons are unable to get past the Broodlings. A wall of Broodlings able to prevent that from happening. And here we go. His own Mothership has popped. The Observer still stands. And uh-oh, he's actually managed to hold on here. Grubby needs to warp in a huge amount of Stalkers but he actually managed to hang on and stay in this game. He's only got one building left. It is the Nexus. Fungal Growth's going down. He knows that this is the last building. Can he actually kill it off though? I don't think so, not today. Um, at least not right now. Oh, oh, it's getting dangerously low though. He can't see the DTs. Is he gonna kill it off? Where's the Fungos? He is, it is the last building I believe. Nope, nope, he has another building somewhere. Oh no, he just threw it down in time right when that was getting killed. Oh my God. Grubby wants to snipe these buildings so badly, and he is gonna try and run over here. The drone, you have to build another building. You have to build another building. He did build a Nexus, down it goes. Back and forth, teeter-tottering to keep the Zerg player in this game. The drones are invaluable at this point, but unfortunately he's gonna lose all of them. Almost all of them. And it looks like Slipko is just laughing as he is going back and forth. And it does look like this may be the last building. Does he decide? To, uh, no, but he decides to end it right there. And GG, what, what just happens? I, I, I don't know, guys. This game was absolutely hilarious. And I just gotta say, this is probably one of my favorite games I've ever cast. I am gonna put the word epic in the title. I don't care what anyone says because this game was absolutely hilarious. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And of course, I'll see you guys next time. Hello everyone, this is HDS Guest here, back with some more StarCraft 2 Heart of the Swarm action. This time it is going to be between none other than White Raw as the Red Protoss in the center left side and up in the top center side, it is going to be QNK Fatalimer. Fatalimer, maybe I'll just be calling him Limer this whole time, but either way, it is going to be a PvP. You can see that they are speaking a different language there together and uh, already saying, I would assume, good luck, have fun to each other. White Raw, one of the most manner players out there. He has given Sheth a run for his money as he has consistently been an extremely manner player for uh, really since the kind of the beginning of his StarCraft career, at least as far back as I can remember. One thing that's awesome about Wyra is he has been playing the game since it's come out. He's one of the few players who can say that and uh, is one of the oldest players out there. I know he's in his 30s now, pushing 31 or 32, I can't remember which, but he is one of the older pro gamers out there. You don't see a lot of guys out there playing who are above the age of 30, so I always got to be rooting for kind of the underdog here. But I don't know too much about Fatalimer, Fata, Fatalimer, other than he's got quite a fun name to try and pronounce. And also, a lot of people were recommending that I cast this game it's been making its rounds around the internet. Apparently, it's pretty good. Also, it is a PvP, and I know some of you at home are like, oh, Husky, stop with the PvP. Why you have such an annoying voice, I don't know in this example, but uh, I, do, I just want to say really quickly, guys, that honestly, I feel like PvP is one of the most interesting matchups right now in Hard the Swarm, and I'm going to explain myself for a little bit. Number one, the last patch greatly buffed and changed Protoss in a lot of ways. Um, we've talked about this in the last couple of PvPs I cast, so I won't go into too much detail, but the Mothership Core is very viable, the Tempest is becoming more viable, Sentries now are viable in this matchup, so they've given Protoss a lot of 
tools to engage other Protoss in in these mirror matchups. So I'm kind of curious to see exactly how these play out, especially on the map Core Hall City. The reason I say that is, bam, expansion right inside your main base. You can wall in relatively easily. Not that you normally wall in in PvP, because in PvP you want to have as big of a concave as you possibly can versus the army that's attempting to attack you, whether it's Terran or Protoss. Versus Zerg, you always get a wall in, man, because those Zerglings are so good killing off all your probes if you let them actually get inside the base. But uh, right now, we're going to kind of see when exactly do both these players decide to expand and what kind of tech paths are they going to go. Because on this map, honestly, you can get away with an expansion relatively easily. Now, we do have a Stalker and Warp Gate on the way for Limer. Do we have the same thing here for White Raw? Looks like he's going to be skipping that Stalker in favor of getting out a second Zelt. We'll be able to save up a couple more resources here. But what does he decide to invest that additional money into? That's kind of what I'm curious to see here. It does look like it will be a Mothership Core. 100 gas, 100 minerals there to get that going, and that two supplies. So saving that stalker is for that exact reason. We do have Limer up here, going to be able to throw down a Nexus here pretty soon. As soon as he cleans out this probe, he doesn't want to show White Rod that he's going to expand here, although he may just go ahead and do it anyways just because the probe is... Uh, nope, he does decide to throw down gateways, and the probe is going to spot it here, managing to swing back around. Now, this could be a feign. This could be a fake build here where he's going to be feigning four gate pressure and then falling back onto an actual expand. The stalker should be out here pretty soon. Surprised he never chrono boosted that out, but uh, right now, no! Limer not feigning anything. He's going to go straight forward but with the Mothership Core here and two Zealots. I can't imagine these pylons are actually going to get up. Another pylon going to go down. He may throw down one more before it dies. But does like the pylon will fetch. He decides to cancel it there as it was getting dangerously low on HP. Does he cancel this one too? No, he doesn't. So he could easily warp in some units. Now remember, this motion core does not have enough uh, energy right now to use Purify. He can't use that for defensive capabilities. And right now he is actually going to finish these pylons here. Does he decide to warp in though? I don't know if the warp gates are quite done yet. He's still got a couple of seconds in that regard. His warp gate's not even done yet, but the pylons do remain. This does show you how difficult it can be to deal with forward pylons as Protoss, even with the two Zealots out. He's having a difficult time. Now, can he throw down a couple of units? Yes, he does. Four Stalkers on the way. The Pylon's not going to fall in time, and that means that the attack is going to commence right now with four Stalkers. The fifth one going to be swinging around as well, and the Mothership Core could go down. It does look like right now the Mothership Core does not have enough energy to do anything that useful, and you can see was not able to use that ability on the Nexus here. So right now, it does look like Fatalimer able to snipe that Mothership Core of his opponent. Does he have one of his own? Doesn't look like he does here. So both players suffering some losses. Overall, it has evened out, kind of stabilized. However, White Rot has not been able to mine this entire duration. You can see the income about cut in half here. So every second that goes by, White Rot is a little bit further behind. Now the supply block, though, for Fatalimer is actually pretty annoying. Just now finishing that just now. Got to be starting up that pro production. Once again, needs to be careful here. The sentry is now out. Does have enough for one force field. And while force field is not enough to block up this ramp, you get a good angle and you're going to be trapping two stalkers long enough to actually snipe them, especially when they're so low on HP here. Two of them uh, are in the single digits of HP, it looks like. Oh, wait. Let, let's, let's confirm that. 13 HP and 5 HP, so pretty darn close there. And both players unable to expand just yet, so already a pretty action-packed game in the early stages. Surprised to see Fatalimer go for a 4-gate. I think the reason he did that was because on this map with such a wide-open choke, you know, just try and warp in units. I'm surprised he didn't set up a pylon down here, though. Send an early probe. Do something like that to take your opponent by surprise. But White Raw was able to hold that off for now. He has his own Twilight Council on the way here, and where is that actually going down? In the back of the base. So it's going to be difficult for him to scout this with ground units. Might have to get out an observer here. Does he decide to go for the observer or does he go for the immortal? Right now he doesn't even have enough for either. And it is going to be an observer. So it is now on the way here. So he will be able to float that around inside the main base. See exactly what's going on. And we actually do have a Dark Shrine on the way for Wyra. Win behind Dark Shrine. But I don't know if... Uh, if he's really that actually far behind here, so he could be using that for Archons. I mean, yes, he lost a little more resources, but he also says opponent way back, especially with that supply block, and that helped kind of lessen the blow as far as the uh, the lost mining time there. Now, I do like this from Fatalimer. He is going to be going for the Observer inside the main base, following it up with potential for Colossus here. Could also be Speed or Prism, but uh, he does have enough money here relatively soon to go for that Colossus. There it is. Colossus going to be on the way. Now, how this shapes up is if White Rod decides to go for lots of DTs, he is going to get owned by the Colossus. But if he decides to go for charge lots with Archons, that's actually relatively good versus the Colossus. Now, on paper, you would say, well, the Colossus are going to own it, and then you just kill the rest 
rest of the Archons with the Stalkers. But the, the thing is, is that the Zealots have, with, with Zell legs anyways, they're able to get on top of that Colossus so quickly that the splash damage becomes moot, and then all of a sudden the Colossus are out of position, you're too busy microing them instead of doing anything useful with it. It does look like White Rob may lose the Mothership Core. No, decides the Mass Recall at the last second. But uh, that is like the smallest mass recall ever, recalling just the Mothership Core itself here. But he was using it for a little bit of a scout. Here comes the DTs right now, but the Colossus is out, and the Observer is here. So he's got to spot these right away, and might be able to kill off at least one. The DTs do split up, and it does look like this one will be safe for now. But I mean, really, are you actually that safe running away from this big of a death ball with an Observer inside? I don't think it's going to survive. White Rod's going to try and juke it here, but it does look like the Observer will eventually catch up. And goodbye, DT. We are going to have to keep an eye. Oh, there was actually a little bit of harassment up here going on. That's what I was going to say. Was we got to keep an eye for the multitasking. Only one worker was killed there, though, by White Rod. So this is going to put him way, way behind. However, he still does have the Archon uh, trick up his sleeve. Not that I would really call it a trick because it has been scouted at this point, but Archons are pretty good versus this. And I don't know if White Rod trying to sneak in more DTs is the way to go, although possibly could be as there is an observer up here though should be able to warp in reinforcements easily to deal with this as long as he has the cooldown as long as he is not supply blocked although right now he is supply blocked so Wyro might actually be able to get oh no there's stalkers here she's gonna be able to clean it up i got a little too excited for no reason because there was units already there now the pylon supply block is going to be a problem but thankfully for protoss it's not as big of a problem because as you can see right here he doesn't even have any warp gates on cooldown so the only thing he can be making is a couple workers but here we go cannons actually in position here three no four cannons now in position and you can see the next is acting as a giant turret itself, doing 20 damage with a range of 13. Got to be pushing this army on out of here, and you can see just how far it shoots, covering a little bit of the ramp. This is something that we've seen in the past um, uh, of White Rai use in, in games I've cast. This. Anyways, and with the cannons here, the cannons are actually useful now because they're covered by the Nexus, and it does like White Rod losing almost every single unit right now, and that means he doesn't have a whole lot left. There is a DT here, though. It does look like the Observer actually got sniped here, so White Rod gonna hang on by the skin of his Dark Templar's non-existent teeth because there's no detection. This Colossus could fall. That's gonna help even up the supplies quite a bit. The Observer finally showing up here, and White Rod now in full retreat, but more cannons are on the way to try and buy himself some more time. A sentry does warp in, does start with enough energy for one, uh, force field might not be able to use it though. Nope, he does manage to. That's going to help delay the push as long as possible. The Archon getting taken out. That's going to be a huge, huge loss. Why, but what are these Zealots doing so much damage to DT? Even though it can be spotted, there's not enough DPS to burn it down. Why, might able to be able to hang on for just a few moments. But he's still got to be careful because he is still behind it in supply, about 20 supply behind. He does almost have enough energy for another Purify, but it's still just a little bit a ways off. So he's going to have to rely on the cannons right now. So Waira seriously barely in this game unless he can expand, which he actually just did. Just finished his expansion up. You can see his probes have mined about 100 minerals off each mineral patch. And so that means that he does have a supply advantage now. The Mothership Core does go down really cannot afford to be losing units like that at this stage of the game. He may still make another Mothership Core, though. Just because it's a flying unit, it does quite a bit of damage, and also it has the defensive capabilities here. Wyra making a smart choice here by setting up these cannons. Now, right now, unfortunately, he doesn't have enough to hold on here as the Stalkers are going to go down to this corner, maybe able to take out this Nexus, and if Wyra loses this Nexus, I don't know what else he can actually do at this stage of the game. Oh, wait, no, the DT loose to the main base. 15 kill DT. Indeed, he is a master DT. DT, you can see right there, the game knows it. We all know it. The DT got to be able to keep him in this game for now as Fadalimer must have moved that Observer or something. As No, I mean, there is one right here, but way too many kills there for Fadalimer to easily recover from. He is still ahead in supply. Needs to be careful not to lose all of his probes. Could go for the Dark Shrine. That'd be a nice victory for him. Could go for the Nexus. That would be even better because right now, Wyra has an income of zero as he literally has units just sitting here. The Dark Shrine could go down. Now, remember, Dark Shrines do have 1,000 HP, which is quite a bit, but uh, still not that much with this many units going to be blasting away at it, and uh, I mean, facts are facts. White Raw is not mining while Fadalimer is. He's also chrono boosting out probes to get himself back in this game as far as the economy is concerned, but he is behind an economy, so he actually has to delay this for quite some time, although as soon as this motion has enough energy, it's going to turn into a giant turret. Here we go. He's waiting for it, and 100 energy. He hasn't selected, uses it right away. The Nexus could fall, though. Does Wyra have enough to rebuild it? I don't think he does. Here comes the probes. Here comes the Zealots. Got to try and hold on. More tech has been taken out. But I think all these stalkers are going to fall. There's so many Zealots here. Can't kill the Mothership. Can't kill the Nexus. He's got a full-on retreat here. 
the angle for White Raw, absolutely beautiful. I can't believe he actually did enough damage to hang on a little bit longer. However, Fadalimer able to get his worker count back uh, almost even here. No, he, he's ahead now. 12 workers to only 9. White Raw still chasing this around with the Zealots, with the Stalkers. Another Mothership Core has fallen. But I can't help but feel like that mothership has already done its job and the rest of these stalkers most likely trapped here and unable to kill off anything. He can try and delay White Rod any way that he can, but there's just not a whole lot he can do. The stalker is going to go down. But where has everything settled? Fadlimer ahead in supply. He should be ahead in the economy. Yes, he does have more income right now. You can see White Rod also chrono boosting out. Taking a look at the units loss tab. You can see White Rod, no surprise, is a little bit behind there. However, he has managed to keep himself in this game. He's managed to stabilize a little bit. He himself is not that far behind in the workers. Uh, let's take a look at the army supply. It is 12 to 15. So both players are suffering greatly in this game. The stalkers got to try and do something. Trying to juke the zealots as best they can to kill off these stalkers. But the angle for White Rod has been absolutely perfect. Although the Zealots do need to be careful. Another Stalker going to be warping in, and a couple of Zealots here, so he's going to continue pressing forward. If nothing else, he can get center map control, maybe secure his own expansion, and force the army to stay inside the main base. So far, the White Ross control of these Zealots has been far superior to the Zealots of Fadalimer, and uh, may end up losing one Stalker. He does but it does look like Limer about to lose one as well. White Rod going to be giving chase. No one has any upgrades at this point. Normally in PvP, I would say upgrades are about the least important in all the matchups. And the reason I say that is because so many of the units do so much damage anyway that just adding a little bit of additional damage doesn't matter all that much. Now, if there's a lot of Colossus or Archons, yes, it can matter. But in these minor skirmishes, they don't matter as much. So the fact that they're both at 0-0, zero, zero, they're going to be okay with this. They're a little bit comfortable with this. Um, it's not like in PvT, for example, where the Protoss wants a bunch of upgrades. Right now, those are a Battle Lime are getting the upper hand here as this game has been non-stop back and forth. And the Zelts over here have managed to retreat, although it does look like Limer will be able to snipe these as well. They're going to be running inside the main base with more Zelts warping in here to deal with that quite easily. And it does look like White Rod now in full retreat with his few remaining units. These ones up here, though, have gone rogue. They're going to try and kill off some of these probes. I don't know if they're going to be able to do all that much damage, though, although the angle is favoring White Rod here. So he's basically just lining up the Zelts right now and killing them off one by one. Finally going to take those out as the Limer looking to stabilize a little bit. 21 supply again for White Rod to the 47 of Fat Limer, but these... I don't know how else to say it. These cannons are actually keeping him in the game. He has cannons with multiple kills, almost something you never see in PvP. I mean, you never see cannons to begin with, let alone ones that are actually being this useful. More Zelt's going to be running up inside the main base. I think Fadalimer needs to never leave his base at all. He needs to expand. He needs to defend. And these probes right here have got to transfer away. He cannot afford to lose any of these probes here because he's ahead. He doesn't want to fall behind. He knows his expansion timing is ahead. You can see the Observer up here he is going to be spotting that. And it does look like the Zelt has been pushed out for now but two more swinging around on that side and a sentry here trying to say hey hey I'm, I'm i'm intimidating right right not really but as for at least for now the probe counts have been minimal this zealot should probably stop running a marathon through the main base and head back on home does Fadalimer actually spot this Zelt, or is it going to be the hero Zelt? that's the question all in our minds here and it does look like well maybe able to hang on to him for now as it's uh, just barely out of vision. Oh my god, how is he? He's like the invisible zealot right now. This guy needs to get promoted to a DT because he has not been spotted. Just going to be hanging out at this uh, location. And we do see White right now actually killing out these pylons. Going to be doing everything he can to try and even the score just a little bit. Because, you know, at the end of the day, units lost tab is very important. It's not the end all, though, because if you're unable to mine as much as your opponent, then they are able to lose a lot more. But both pylons do go down. Does not supply block him, but is going to show him, hey, you don't have center map control anymore. If you want to, you know, basically deny me moving out the map, you've got to move out in the center of the map again. And we do have the robotics on the way. White Rod does have his own expansion now completing up as it does warp in. The observer is catching a glimpse of everything. This zealot's still somehow alive. Is this going to be the special tactic? Zealot right here. Is this going to be the Zealot that wins the game for White Rod? I mean, it's definitely going to be tough, but uh, let's be honest. Both players are very low on the economy right now. I mean, if we take a look at the tech, they still are all on gateway tech. Not a single non-gateway unit on the field except for the Observers, which I don't really think uh, makes your army that much better. A Colossus is going to be on the way here. White Rod, though, he's trying to size up the army, trying to see exactly what's up there. He does see a lot of Zelts, a lot of Stalkers, and he's got to know that there's at least a couple of Observers on the field, although I don't know if he knows that there's three right now. And does decide to run up here with the move command. That was a bit uh, a bit silly right there. As Waira taking a little bit of a risk trying to move up there, but at the... Oh, what is this? Why are these probes so bad? 
Oh my god, these probes are actually stupid. There they go, getting back to work right now. And Wyros says, you know what, I don't need an Oracle. I'll just throw down force fields. Was that even his force field? I feel like it wasn't. Um, that actually ended up hurting Fatalimer right there. Let's take a look at the income tab here. You can see Fatalimer should start skyrocketing a little bit. White Raw managing to stay ahead because he just simply put has more mineral patches in his main base because he was unable to mine it as quickly. You can see the singular mineral patch right here for Fatalimer, and he does have the Colossus now on the way. So really, what is White Raw's options here? The only options are try to expand again, go for more Colossus than your opponent and uh, take a bit of a risk there, or he can go for some sort of Warp Prism play, which is exactly what we're seeing now. I wouldn't be surprised to see a uh, Robotics Bay with Warp Prism speed. He could still go for Colossus, though. He does have the money to do that if he wants to go for a Colossus drop. Um, he does get a Colossus on the way right now, and oops, Chrono boosted a little bit early. We'll see if he starts. Yep, Thermal Lance right there. So he may be going for a Colossus drop, but at this point in the game, it is going to be Zealot Sentry. Now, one thing that's awesome that you can do is kind of force field here, force field here, and if you get it just right, you can actually trap all those probes with your Zealots and begin attacking them if you have a Zealot hold position here and here. Anyways, if he's got the micro for it, he could delay the expansion uh, mining by quite a bit. Here comes the War Prism right now. So far, a non-stop game, though, I must say. Wouldn't be surprised if he starts unloading the Zelts right up there, and he does. There's the sentry. Does he decide to force field, or is he just going to full-on retreat? I think it's time to go. Thankfully for him, though, there is no blink. The gas guys are saved by the Vespine as those units could not weasel their way through there to go ahead and shoot that down. Stalker's running inside the main base. fatalimer has got to be careful here because Waira, I mean, he's in special tactics mode. He knows he's way behind, and he knows that his opponent's starting to get Colossus with Thermal Lance. So what does that tell him? He needs to use some special tactics. And so uh, I, I think Fatalimer is adapting correctly. He has split up his army here. He's not getting too overeager. He's not moving out too soon. He's just going to continue pressing his advantage. Because you got to remember that if both players have the same amount of expansions, got to be careful here with the war. Prism almost ending up losing it there, but uh, anyways, if uh, they, they had the same amount of income, then Fatalimer is going to be the same amount ahead for the duration of the game, and that's uh, something Wyrod's going to have to consider here, is how can I secure a third base? Does he want to go for this third base, the one that's closer to his opponent? Does he want to go for this one, the one that's further away? Either way, he should clean out those rocks and uh, try to get thinking about those expansions, which he does have enough right now for. He's also got a Mothership Core, though, so we'll see if he decides to use that for something. But uh, right now, I think the correct answer is just to try and expand here, unless Wyrock can get very lucky with the drop, which right now there's a Stalker in the main. Anything left behind? Yes! Several Zelts and a couple of Stalkers as well, so he's going to be just fine as long as he doesn't let DTs or something silly take him out. But guess what? There is no Dark Shrine. There is Double Robo, though, and that's something you have to look out for, as we do have the Zelt kind of be moving out around. Taking out a Stalker or two, the Colossus here. Going to be able to clean that up easily. No air units to kill off this War Prism. And here we go again. The Wyrod does have three Colossus. I'm kind of wondering if uh, Fatalimer realizes they're real. Yes, he does just now. But uh, is going to go ahead and attack as quickly as possible to try and end this game. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, though, the supplies are almost identical. How is Wyrod actually doing this? He's going to push this back for now. And uh, still has not pulled ahead in supplies, but at the same time, he is making two Colossus at a time. So it is going to be four Colossus versus three. Not a good situation to begin. Wyra, though, does need to keep these units alive. He's actually working on plus one attack. Fatalimer has no upgrades just yet. I mean, we're at the 28-minute mark, but it's been such severe losses. No, no attacks happening in the main base up here. And it does look like Wyra, for the first time in this game, may actually pull ahead in supply in just a moment. But with more Colossus on the way, um, Wyra definitely falls behind in that regard. It is going to be a very close game here. Very low economy. When I say that, I mean that these players have not gone up to three, four, five plus bases. Instead, they're trying to attack, do timing attacks essentially off of what's been a one base play this entire time. Because neither player has been mining out of their mains for quite some time here. Got to try and use the high ground advantage here. He knows the War Prism is also low on HP. He needs to be able to take that out. More Zelts are here. The Supply is still favoring Fatalimer. Wants to kill off these Colossus if possible. But at the same time, his own Colossus is very low. Down it goes, but he does get the War Prism there. Huge, huge loss for White Raw. But guess what? His Colossus are here. They are pissed, and they are going for blood. We do have a second Robotics on the way, and may lose yet another Colossus. Yes, he does. White Raw falling is severely behind in Supply once again. Oh my god, this game is non-stop. I haven't had a chance to breathe or drink a little bit of water, man. As it does look, he's going to continue chasing this down. A couple of Stalkers may be the casualty, though, as White Rod does have to sacrifice three Stalkers to try and save one Colossus. Not usually a very good trade at all, um, especially since, uh, well, I guess he did manage to save one of those Stalkers, so that's going to end up working out in his favor. But he's got to be careful with these two Colossus because Wyra is still behind. He's not out of the water yet at all. Now, he does have Gravitic Drive here to try and do those drops inside the main base. 
Fatalimer should probably put a couple of probes on that gas there just because he needs every resource he can get here. You can see that he is hovering a few additional resources, especially with his opponent, um, or a few extra minerals, excuse me, as he could be using some gas. Especially when your opponent's going for double robo, you need to get an answer for it. Whether it's Phoenix, whether it's Void Rays, whether it's Archons, whether it's Charge Lots, it doesn't matter. You need some way of dealing with it, because if you just let your opponent get Mass Colossus while you yourself are going Mass Colossus, but you're behind in the Colossus production, that is going to be some bad news bears for whoever it is that is uh, trying to win in that regard. So he needs to figure out a way to deal with this, especially with the uh, Gravitic Drive on the way now. That's going to be even more frustrating. White Raw, very good with the War Prism. He was using it before it got those buffs to its HP, and that's why he feels very comfortable doing this. It looks like he's going to be moving in with a Stalker, a Zealot, and two Sentries here. See if he can do any additional damage. There are a couple of Zealots here in order to deal with this. The Stalker looks like it's going to go down right away. Not a whole lot of another plan here, it looks like, for White Raw as he uh, is just basically focused on this Rast unit, pulled off the line once again. Did clean those up with relatively low losses. Nice force fields there. The army is trapped. They will once again get us around. The Stalker, though, is focus fired down, um, or focus firing down on those weakened probes here. But honestly, it's just going to take a Stalker to push this out of here because the Stalker inside, very low on HP, and we all know sentries are the tickle cannons. Not a whole lot that they can actually do at this stage of the game. So uh, right now... Just turning out the health bar so we can see the big blob of units a little bit better. We do have several Colossus out now for Fadalimer. It is though 6 to 5. White Ross still managing to stay in this game, even though he's behind in supply, behind in the income, although it may have evened out. Yep, he's just a tiny bit ahead right now in that income tab. And that is going to be great, great news for White Rock because he's already got the tech advantage in the amount of Colossus he has. I guess it's less of a tech advantage and more of an army advantage. But uh, he is going to be able to do a Colossus drop. Are you serious? He is going to go for this. You know what? I got I to gotta just follow. I got to follow this War Prism here because this War Prism is the War Prism of fun. This is like the limo that you rented on prom night. Uh, although apparently you're forever alone Colossus. But hey, your limo was flying and can warp into your buddies. So that's pretty cool there. The Colossus drop is going to commence right now. We will keep an eye on this Colossus, see if we can actually do substantial amounts of damage here. I mean, it's going to be it's gonna be unlikely, but at the same time, he's already doing quite a bit. Six kills on this Colossus already. Um, it becomes increasingly easy. The more that this Colossus shoots, it's got to do more and more splash damage, which means he will get more and more kills per shot if he can stay there long enough to let that splash damage accumulate. If he's just doing one shot here or there, it is not going to be enough. Now, Wyra, for the first time, I believe, in this game, is ahead in supply, and that's going to be amazing for him, as he does have more and more reinforcements. Got to be warping in right here. And more Colossus on the field here for Fatalimer. Let's just take a look at the units tab now. Eight Colossus to seven. There is an upgrade advantage for White Rye. I believe that did get completed. Yes, it did. Plus one attack. He's got the uh, expansion on the way as well. Here's the Colossus drop inside the main base. Ten kills now on that Colossus. Possibly more. Yep, it is up to 11. Needs to keep the War Prism alive, though. It decides not to go save the Colossus. So this is the hero Colossus to be crowned by the hero DT. I think those stalkers will get taken out. And oh my god, this Colossus is getting a bit lucky there before dying. His last wish was kill more probes. That wish was granted. And uh, White Rock going to be in pretty good shape here, although he has to be careful because he doesn't have that great of a concave. But this is the most amount of lasers you will ever see in a game, man. Colossus versus Colossus. Lasers everywhere. I'm just going to keep an eye on the units tab here. Does look like White Rock once again got to be falling behind in the units count. But uh, at this point, his plus attack really paying off. You can see the Zealots right here just hacking away, doing lots of damage. Where did the Colossus go? They all died at the exact same second. And you can see this Colossus right here doing the stutter step. Not quite sure what that was. Maybe listening to dubstep while he's killing these noobs. But uh, right now, White is going to lose his own units. Looks like the Mothership Core maybe it'll do some stamps. Oh my gosh, this Colossus is going to survive. I think it actually is going to survive. No, it goes down. Last second, but the Mothership Corps are going to finish off these units here as both players now have reset once again, especially with this Colossus retreating. Got to be able to kill off these Stalkers um, with the Zealots if he's not careful, and that's exactly what Fatalimer is doing. One HP on this Colossus. Oh, my God, the Zealot wants to kill it off. Is the Probe going to be able to kill it off? That's the real question. Is if a Hero Probe actually manages to come through? No, it's the Stalkers who seal the deal. Who would have thought that this game was going to be so close? <coughs> oh, excuse me. This game's so awesome that I, I just need to cough. I gotta cool off by having a cold. And he does say GG here. I do want to pause. Let's take a look at this. If this was actually GG income, 
is heavily favoring White Raw. Units tab uh, is favoring White Raw as well. And yeah, with only five Stalkers, two Zealots. I mean, he can't do anything versus that amount of Stalkers, Zealots, Colossus with another Colossus on the way. I mean, he could have sent everything plus his probes and maybe made it to his base. But other than that, this is why I love PvP on the uh, on the new patch, is that, you know, Mothership Cores actually delay those 4-gates quite perfectly. I don't know the exact timing of it, but I imagine that if a player 4-gate rushes, the Mothership Core could prove to be very vital in holding that off, as, I mean, you know, early rushes in PvP have been common since basically the beta days. So I, I personally like PvP and Heart of the Swarm right now, but uh, that's just because Protoss is getting consistent changes. They're getting a lot of changes, and we're going to see exactly how they shape up. So make sure to follow Whitera on the uh, on the old Twitters, on the old Facebooks and all that if uh, if you haven't already. Um, you can follow me on Twitter as well, just Husky Starcraft is the uh, is the name twitter.com slash husky starcraft. Anyway, so hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys next time. Hello Ren, this is HGS Gaski here back with some more StarCraft 2 Heart of the Swarm 1v1 action. This time it's actually going to be a game from the CPL, which I'm going to talk about that in just a second, which is amazing. But let's go ahead and introduce our players down in the bottom right side. It is going to be IG's Jim, and his opponent down in the bottom left side is a name I cannot read, but I believe that it is Marine King. Uh, all of the replays were actually in Chinese, and I tried to line up the ones with the brackets that I thought were the correct ones. So hopefully this is correct. I apologize if this is not correct. I believe that this is Marine King. But I'm going to talk about the tournament a lot. There's actually a lot of cool info in there, but it is going to be a PBT on Whirlwind. Whirlwind. But uh, anyways... Let's go ahead and talk about that. So Jim was in the uh, WCS America Finals. Um, didn't make it all the way to the very final, final finals, but he was in the top uh, eight, I believe. And I was able to cast him. It was a lot of fun to meet him, a lot of fun to see him play live, and uh, just all around a great guy. Of course, Marine King uh, have seen a lot of him. A lot of him. He's a super stylish one man with awesome glasses. He's been very consistent for a long time. Uh, I would say that recently he has definitely fallen off, really struggling in a lot of tournaments, not doing as well as we are used to seeing, but uh, doing quite well in this tournament. And I also do want to mention the CPL. If I remember correctly, I think the CPL has been around since the 90s, which is not something you say for a lot of esports organizations. And the fact that they're hosting a tournament, they're actually hosting it in China, is pretty awesome. That is pretty dope. Uh, first place is $3,500. Second and third place uh, kind of go down from there. But uh, first place, $3,500, not bad, especially since CPL has been around for so freaking long. And this tournament did actually take place in China. Um, Jim, for example, is a Chinese player. Marine King is Korean. But uh, either way, PVT should be a lot of fun. And I was really excited when I actually saw that these replays were released. Uh, CPL, I haven't heard from those guys in for freaking ever. So hopefully they're going to be making a big splash. Whether it's in StarCraft, whether it's in Counter-Strike, I, I don't really care. I just love esports, man. Also, speaking of esports, this is uh, something I've wanted to talk about a little bit is is on the internet for StarCraft 2, there's lots of doom and gloom talking about StarCraft 2 as a competitive sport. I think that is just stupid because if you go to google.com slash trends and type in esports, esports as a whole are, are going through the roof right now. It's actually the most searched it's been in the last five to ten years which is awesome because the more people who are watching esports that is the more people who are watching starcraft 2 that is more people who are watching any competitive game out there whether it's going to be uh league of legends dota 2 counter-strike even tf2 starcraft 2 they all kind of ride that wave together so i personally have never been more excited for esports and uh, anyone out there who's kind of championing championing it or, or what, what's leading the basically singing that StarCraft is on its way out. Nope, StarCraft is a pretty good game. It's definitely here to stay, guys. But uh, either way, that is awesome. Esports is on the rise. Is esports actually going to become mainstream? That's the real question that uh, we all are wondering. Is uh, is League of Legends ever going to be on TV? Is StarCraft ever going to have its own channel? Is Command and Conquer ever going to make a good game again? We're going to have to wait and see, but uh, for now we do have the next going to be coming on down. We actually are having a crazy macro game unfold right now. I know I haven't said a whole lot about the game, but basically it's just been a macro game. We see the command center going to be going down for Marine King. We have two barracks right here, both going, uh, well, well once for a reactor add-on, but they're both getting add-ons right now. Lots of Marines out for him, no surprise there. Uh, always living up to his name. 
But uh, yeah, super macro. I mean, I think we even saw Twilight Council. Unless he canceled it. No, it's right there. He has robotics on the way as well. So Jim going to be going crazy tech mode. I assume he's going to get an observer out of this. But what is the Twilight Council for? That's what's uh, kind of bugging me right now. He doesn't need upgrades. He doesn't need uh, zealot legs yet. And it is going to be for a dark shrine. Now, we could actually be seeing a DT drop or a DT warp in, depending on the timing of the Dark Shrine, because what you can do is actually make the warp prism, fly it over here. Um, if, the, if the Dark Shrine is done by then, you can warp in DTs, load them up, and drop them. Or you can literally just wait right here, hover it over here, and then warp them in on the low ground. So I guess it's technically high ground on this map. Yeah, a little bit. But uh, either way, we'll see if he does go for a warp prism or if it's going to be an observer. It is going to be a warp prism here. This isn't uh, a big surprise, all things considered. What is a big surprise, though, is that Jim is really unable to scout a whole lot other than the timing of this command center here. And what that means is is that he's hoping that uh, Marine King is not doing anything super sneaky. He's hoping that he's just macroing up pretty standardly. Now, thankfully for him, he is right. But uh, definitely going to be a close call here. Looks like the War Prism is going to be done. Dark Shrine. I actually don't know the timing on this. Is this War Prism... Uh, a little bit later than he would like. We're about to find out. The War Prism is already headed on over. We'll see at the time of this. Keep in mind, they recently are, are recently-ish buffed the speed of the War Prism. So that's moving out down there. And the Dark Shrine is done. Actually, it looks like the timing is going to be perfect to do exactly what I had predicted, which is going to go be going ahead and warping in those DTs, load them up into the War Prism, and then go directly into the main. And then what he can do on this is either warp in more DTs or warp in Zealots. I don't think you're going to be seeing anything like Stalkers or anything like that, just because they're not really that good versus Terran right now so two DTs are loose inside the main base and actually no engineering bay is in sight and this is something you don't see a lot out of, out of oh wait there's an engineering bay right there it's just out of my sight because I'm blind as hell that's why I have to wear glasses but anyways one DT doing lots of damage the other DT moving on down over here and unfortunately for Marine King he didn't realize that this was coming so he is going to be losing quite a few SCVs overall we'll see the uh, total damage once it's all said and done actually going for a uh, refinery there an interesting choice this DT trying to slow down the gas it just seems like Jim's main focus was delaying the gas as much as possible. Kind of an interesting choice. That SCB should die. Mr. Turtle will go down with it or at least be forced to cancel unless he scans. Nope, there's going to be the cancel. Another DT is in position. He'll probably load that one in the War Prism and get out of there. Indeed he does. So the damage has been dealt. Not a whole lot of damage. I mean, I know 13 workers sounds devastating, but if we take a look at the workers tab here, 28 for Terran is really good. Gem, oh my god, is that the 52? What? I guess he's been chrono boosting those out the entire duration of this. He's already uh, oversaturated on both of his bases here coming up. So he should be seeing a third base go down for him pretty soon. But uh, either way, the amount of workers killed there is a lot. But I wouldn't say that that was crippling damage by any means. I mean, I know on paper it seems crazy, but you got to remember that uh, Marine King was able to get up those double command centers or, or get up the expansion so early and has been making workers the entire time that uh, he's, he can recover here, especially if he goes for a third base right now. Should be okay. And at some point, he's going to be able to pressure Jim with a big power play. I mean, the supplies can be very misleading. Even the army supplies can be misleading. Right now, it is 25 to 42, which is not misleading. Basically, what that means is that if Marine King manages to make it all the way across the map with his army and it is undetected by Jim, it could actually just end the game right away. Even with Photon Overcharge, these drops can do a lot of damage. He's going to try and go for it right here. We should be seeing a Photon Overcharge almost immediately thrown down, and we will. That is going to be enough here to clean this up, and I think that Marine King's going to have to get out of there. But you got to remember, at the end of the day, he forced a Photon Overcharge. He forced a warp in of Zealot right there, maybe at a time that he wouldn't necessarily want it. He spotted the Colossus, and uh, it, I, I think he even killed a worker or two, maybe. Yeah, he killed two workers, literally. And we shall see if he can start dropping the main base. I mean, I honestly think continuing through the drops is the way to go. Maybe scouting out to see if there is a third base. That's why he's going to be moving here and then going into the main base. Also, I mean, look at this. Only two pylons right here are going to be powering all of this. So if he can kill this off, that is going to be a big delay in production. But nope, not going to be able to try to kill those DTs. If nothing else, the scan forced the Archon, but at this point, I think that's kind of what he wants. But look at this. Marine King going to be going to the natural as well. We'll be able to kill off the Colossus immediately, and at the same time, going to be raking in the kills on the probes here. A very close back and forth battle in this game. The supply is almost identical. May kill a refinery here to return the favor. No, going to go straight for the Zealots. I think he's got to be careful here, though. The Archon should be able to snipe these uh, medevacs with some splash damage does decide to load up at the very last second to get out of there. Can he do anything? No, the Photon Overcharge should focus down the other medevac if possible. But no, it's actually going to go for the one of the units inside. Almost gets taken out at the same time. There's going to be an attack over here, though. A big warp in of Zealot. That warp prism is still harassing. Great play here by Jim. But guess what? This drop's not actually done yet. It is going to kill off several more probes. So very intense game here so far. 
the Zelto going straight into the production line. These SCVs, though, are relatively protected here. There's a bunker right there to prevent any units from running up there, and also the reinforcements have actually ran all the way back home. The production line, though, is getting taken out. The Widow Mine should probably burrow to try and kill off one Zealot here. That is what's going to happen here. Has to watch out for that splash damage. Poor Marauder over here just getting blasted by that Widow Mine. He is still alive. The War Prism is going to evacuate out of there. So double drops, uh, really, from both of our players here. A great play overall by both players to stabilize. I mean, look at this. 22 workers killed to 18, but at the same time, Jim was putting out enough pressure to stop the reinforcements from killing him outright. Looks like this uh, drop squad over here is still going strong. Don't know if he's going to be able to get out of there with it. Oh, God, the angle is so good. One Stalker there could have taken it out, but the Medivac will narrowly escape with its life and may go ahead and boost out of there just to be safe. But uh, either way, we do finally see a third base on the way for Marine King. Should be seeing a third base on the way for Jim as well because at this point, it's getting to where they need to start expanding. There goes uh, exactly Jim right there. And at the same time, by the time this is upgraded to an orbital and floats over either up there or down here, it's going to be about the same timing there. So I think, though, these thirds a little bit delayed. However, that's because a lot of them did focus on going for aggression. Right now, though, 3,500 resources lost by Jim. Only 3,000 lost for Marine King. Again, the workers killed is just so interesting to me. 22 to 18. Rarely will you see that close of workers killed when one player lost so many more than the other in the beginning. I mean, it was 13 to 0 there. But uh, either way... The both, the both players have stabilized, and it's going to be, it looks like Marine, Marauder, Medivac choice for Marine King moving forward. I mean, that's not anything that's completely uncommon by any means, but uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult to maintain those units later and later the game goes on, because look at the Psy Storm on the way, Colossus on the way. Uh, we already have extended Thermal Lance, so if you do not have the Vikings to deal with those Colossus, then your your fun times are, are not so happy fun times. They're going to be miserable times. But right now we do have six medevacs out. That is enough to heal the majority of the army. And I'm kind of curious to see if Marine King decides to go for more medevacs. Oh, he actually intercepts the War Prism here. War Prisms are quite fast, though. So those four zealots inside, that would have been a lot of supply lost if that War Prism did go down. For now, though, it is relatively safe. Looks like this drop attempted to make something happen. Did it spot the expansion, though? No, not quite yet. But he should know that there is indeed something up there. I feel like, though, this big drop could do lots of damage. I think he's trying to distract him with this army over here. This seems more like a distraction play. And uh, is hopefully trying to intercept the army here as long as possible. Again, this Nexus is gone for sure. As he's going to be able to focus that down right away. Again, this army is trying to bait it out as long as he possibly can. Kills off the expansion. Got to go straight for the probes right here. This is a big pickup for Marine King. But at the same time, still about the same amount of uh, supply right now. The War Prism is finally going to get taken out, but guess what? More Zelts already loose inside the base. Two armor is done. Upgrades for Terran, though, are at 1-1, one, one, so they're going to be matching those those upgrades equally. A big drop into the main base. Is there enough here to uh, defend it? Looks like still only two pylons. We'll see if those ones get taken out or if he's going to go straight for the tech. He could actually go either way at this point. It's going to be hurting his, his opponent. Um, he does manage to get two of the gateways. He will get the Dark Shrine almost instantly. But at what cost? The Storm going to be eating him up, trying to get out of there. So much damage laid down by those clutch storms. We do have another third base going to be coming up. This is not an ideal location. This is not his dream home. He does not want to be living down here because the drops are so easy for town. I mean, look at how short of a distance you can almost see. Actually, if you zoom out here, you can see just how short it is. If he loads up right here, all he has to do is fly over there very, very close. Widow Mine over here going to be delaying that base as well. Nice play by Marine King to try and delay the bases as long as he possibly can. But guess what? The uh, Zelts up here are going to be delaying this base as well. So, I mean, it, it kind of it's a street that runs two ways as both players trying to deny each other quite a lot. Um, for now, I do want to give an advantage to Marine King. He's got a supply advantage. He has killed more off and has been more cost effective. But the main problem is, is even though this army looks terrifying, even though he has a supply lead, even though he's able to deny the scouting there by killing off that observer, at the end of the day, Colossus Storm Archon can turn games around instantaneously. And really, I mean, it, it shows Jim's resilience here, rushing towards the Colossus and Psystorm tech, and to try and force his opponent to have to overreact one way or the other. Is it going to be too many Vikings? Is it going to be too many Medivacs? Or is it going to be too many Ghosts? That's what Jim is hoping for. It's going to be one of those. Um, when you mix in the High Templar and the Colossus, the Terran player, remember, they cannot warp in reinforcements instantly. They have to rely on getting out the exact unit. So far, though, no ghosts, I believe. It doesn't get lost in the back. Big storms on the ramp. All of a sudden, Marine King realizing he cannot engage this just yet. The uh, upgrades for Protoss right now, one attack, two armor. I think the armor's going to be the most important, but the Zelts trying to gather. Good storm dodging so far, but equally good storms. I mean, they're still doing lots of damage. The concave was good. 
not good enough though there towards the end. The high Templar count way too high. Where are the ghosts? We need to be seeing ghosts. Guess what? They're all Archons now. Uh, the high Templar that is focusing down those Archons has been quite pleasant. What is not pleasant though is the Zealot follow-up. That is so many Zealots, especially if they had more armor. That would be a bit ridiculous. I think that Marine King here will hold though a very close battle for either player. I mean, this army's backed into a corner, but the Concave established either way and is going to be able to clean this up, I believe. I mean, the Immortal in the back is going to get some kills. Another Zealot here going to be joining in. This Zealot alone has five kills. More reinforcements on the way. It does mean Marine King will lose this base, but you got to remember that supplies are still actually identical here. I don't think I've seen a game this close in a very, very long time. Actually, Hellbat's going to be coming out. These units are extremely robust if used correctly, and we shall see if he manages to do just that. 2-2 two, two, nearly done from Marine King. He knows he's got to wait just a moment or two longer to see if he can actually engage his army directly. I don't think Jim has enough to bust up this ramp. I think what he's trying to do, though, is just lay down one or two storms. He does have enough energy in just a moment. It's not quite yet. Now he's got it. It just ticked over, so if nothing else, wants to throw down a storm or two. There goes one. I think he's got maybe one more in him, and uh, then he's going to have to retreat, I believe. It looks like the bunker's going to go ahead and burn down if Jim decides not to repair it, or excuse me, continue pushing up the ramp. And Marine King is going to, oh, he's actually going to salvage it. So he does get a refund. And basically, that's like returning to like returning something to Costco after you've eaten half of it. It's like, well, you know, it's in bad shape, but hey, they got a good return policy. So might as well salvage that bunker, get my 75% back. And SCVs are in the mix here. I don't think this is actually intentional. He wants this to be mining right away. There they go. Uh, does finally get his third base up. And uh, what is shocking to me is that this third base for Jim still actually remains. Hang on, though. He's got to try and bust up the ramp right now. A crazy good concave established. Once again, the storm's coming up. Not landing. There's a much better one. The SCV is just getting roasted away. But speaking of roasting, the Hellbat's going to be eating up those Zealots. And I think that, once again, Marine King's got to narrowly hold by the skin of his teeth. And, uh, yes, he will. Going to be killing out that Archon as well. Oh, my God. These trades are so... So, so equal. Looks like there's going to be a minor counterattack over here with the Zealots. Remember, Zealots are two armor. They are not going to die to SCVs anytime soon. So they will gladly attack those SCVs. And it does look like Marine King got to try and go for this. But again, more and more storms could be devastating. Still no EMP, though. I think that, you know, Marine King's been able to barely hold on this entire game. And that's why he hasn't been able to get ghosts. He hasn't had the money. He hasn't had the time or the extra bases to start getting ghosts. Basically, everything he's doing is to prevent the Protoss from snowballing out of control. And that's why he hasn't had the money to do that. Now, medevacs are going to be very cost effective here because he can start healing up this army. But uh, at the end of the day, you got to be able to deal with those storms. And if you can't deal with the storms, then you're going to the graveyard because all your units are going to be dead. And I think that's why he's also starting to mix in Hellbats is because they're much larger. They keep your army spread out a little bit more. And so the size storm's not going to be doing as much splash damage just because your army has more surface area, whereas Storm is very good versus clumped up units. So I think, honestly, at this point, denying this third base is exactly what Marine King has to do. He is behind right now. Overall, resources lost, though, is still favoring Marine King. That's why he's hanging on in this game. Army supply, 70 to 59 here. And that shows you that if he gets a good engagement, if he kills off these High Templar, oh my god, he's actually mixing in Reapers right here. I do not think I've ever seen this this late in the game. We'll see if he can actually harass that. And this might actually be perfect for harassing that base uh, at that location. Looks like the Hellbat there will be the one to go down first, but that is allowing the Marine Marauder to kite here as much as possible. Notice he's individually focusing down these units. May have to load up to get the hell out of there. More reinforcements do get taken out, but uh, three Reapers are on the field. We'll see if any more end up showing up, but he could start harassing with these Reapers. Also, Reapers can easily be microed. I mean, they don't do the additional damage versus light, but they still do damage, so maybe that was an accident. Maybe it was intentional. Look like he's actually going to lose these Reapers right away. I thought they would have been good for harassment, but that was a little anticlimactic. Overall, though, I mean, look at this. The uh, drop over here is going to be denying this base. The Widow might up to five kills now. He's been denying that base for an extremely long time, and the supplies are now relatively even once again uh, 119 to 108 guardian shield has been activated i think that's going to uh, activate the retreat right here he has to hold on to this base though if possible trying to go for the high templar not going to get that lucky he will be able to intercept reinforcements though marine king making moves over here if he can actually just kill off these couple of gas i mean that's going to be a lot less archons a lot less storms but guess what the scvs have gone down that was his only third base uh, he doesn't have a follow-up third base he's not going to be able to really land anywhere else it does like this one is burning down. Marine King needs to make sure to go ahead and save that. This has been nonstop commentary literally since the beginning of the game. This is why these Chinese tournaments, uh, they just got hard. The Swarm are going to be awesome. Marine King, though, pushing into the main base, but at the same time, he's having his main base pushed into, and uh, it looks like with Zealot Archon 
and the one immortal in there, High Templar. I don't know how he can actually hold on here. He is going to try, though. Nice storm dodging already out the gate, but ah, running into that one. He's got to try it by time. He, he just has no ghosts. His four ghosts are an absolute um, necessity. Reaper's mixed in, man. We'll see if he actually managed to do anything with that. He has cut into the production, though, of Jim. I don't know if he can actually make anything here. All of his gateways are unpowered now. And is there enough units inside the main base? This is actually literally going to come down to this. A big lift off of these barracks here. Probably going to start flying them around every which way. It does look like an attack over here. Storm should be able to clean it up. But there's going to be the stamp chasing the High Templar. He needs to start dodging. He's trying his best to. The one cell they're going to be buying enough time for the Archons to get more in. It looks like those few units are not going to be able to clean out that entire base. But at the same time, this base is going to get taken out. 35 supply to 96. I mean, at some point... Marine King has to engage this army, and I don't think that that is going to go very prettily. Prettily, as uh, we do have this widow mine over here now up to eight kills, still denying those bases in a big way. This game's actually getting dangerously close now, as uh, our Terran player, if he stays mobile, stays active, he might actually be able to land and start rebuilding his infrastructure. We'll have to wait and see, though. Widowmine got to finally move forward. Needs to burrow it, though. Cannot afford to lose his rear. There's no detection on the Protoss. Is he going to lose that Widowmine? No, he's not. That's going to be another Zealot kill. And which is huge. Every single unit right now actually matters in a big, big way. Are there any observers out on the field? There is one. There's one observer over on the right side, but I think he is currently forgotten about it. He's got to try and micro here to the best of his ability. Still taking out more and more Zealoth. Needs to load up and get the hell out of there. Probe's trying to join in as well. But uh, at some point, you got to start dropping mules. You got to start long distance mining. That's exactly what he's going to try and do here. We'll see if it's going to be enough. Unfortunately for him, he is supply block with no supply depots remaining. That will definitely happen. At this point, though, it looks like Marine King may be running out of steam, although he's still going to be killing off units here. He's killing off the probes. He's killing off the zealots. I don't know if he can get the archons or not. Uh, might be able to escape. There's just so many medevacs. There's literally more medevacs than army units, so they're just going to keep getting healed back all the way to the top. Cyber Next Corps going to be on the way. At the same time, though, the archons taking out these buildings. The Zealots are going to be taking out the Mules. Even a High Templar getting mixed in. But uh, I don't know. This is such an interesting game right now. The Pylons, if they get thrown down here, that's going to be some big, big warpens. I think he is focusing a little bit too much on the army here as opposed to trying to recreate his base. He does have the one Widowmine. How many Widowmines does he have overall? Does he actually have two? Yes, he does. There's going to be one. Second one's over here in the main base. Needs to bring that one down for sure. I almost feel like this is a Bronze League Heroes. Just played at a million APM. Look at that, 226 to 216. An absolutely outstanding game, though. Got to be honest. Got to love the Chinese. Got to love uh, the Koreans in StarCraft 2. Showing us some of the best games ever. Ah, slight miss rally there. He's got to keep it alive. I think, though, he's run out of options. Remember that High Templar have been feedbacking on these medevacs. That's why they are substantially lower and trying to get out of there. Does kill off the pylon, but, you know, he's unable to land anywhere. I mean, he might be able to land on this side. Guess what? Two gateways over here. We got a Nexus on the way up here. I think our Protoss player has this finally able to get up some sort of warping in possibility. And the Widowmine here almost able to kill a High Templar. That would have been huge. I still don't think it's nearly enough, though, trying to kite around this one Zell because every single unit matters. Look at the amount of resources lost. This is as close as it gets. 30,725 to 30,248. Just narrowly, narrowly eking out a victory right now. Irking out a victory? I don't know. Eking out a victory sounds like something fun to say. And the Widowmine there does get yet another kill. Up to 11 now. There's still the Observer on the right side. I think he's definitely forgotten about it in the midst of all this chaos. Lost in chaos indeed, as it does look like these production buildings are going to get taken out. But still, the attack is continuing. More big warpins, so that's going to be very demoralizing right now, as he needs to kill off these barracks. He just doesn't have time to. And still a back and forward battle here. I think that uh, SCVs do need to be created here to start making up those supply depots. But this might be it. I think Jim might actually have this 12 kills now on that Widow Mine. And uh, actually mixing in another Widow Mine would have been quite nice. We'll get the Assimilator here, but uh, that actually serves no purpose at this point. As the barracks start to go down, though, so does the production capabilities of our Terran players. Still got quite a few units, though. Has grouped everything together that he has remaining. Loses only one Marine there. Kills off everything he can. 69 supply to 23. I believe some of that's probes. Oh, my God. A lot of that is probes. 33 probes. Big Zach needs to dodge that storm, though. He's only got three medevacs remaining. Ah, that might be the one. That might be the game-winning storm. Even though the High Templar went down, it softened up the army enough to kill everything else off. And that is going to be that. Literally, this game could have gone either way until the very, very last second. And that is going to be it. I mean, the one SCV is here, but cannot make anything else of use. He's got the two Widow Mines, but I don't think it's going to be enough. I mean, having those Widow Mines has been great. And there's going to be the GG, an absolutely outstanding PBT here. 
one of the better ones I've seen in a very, very, very long time. Jim showing us some stellar play, but Marine King showing us that he is not too shabby either. Anyways, hope you guys enjoy it, and I'll see you guys next time. Hello everyone, this is HDS Guest Gear back with some more StarCraft 2 Heart of the Swarm action. Oh yeah, we got a pro moving out right away here. As, uh, yeah, we're gonna be seeing a proxy right away. My voice wasn't expecting something to happen just yet. It's like, oh god, Husky, stop casting. You're making way too many videos. And I'm like, shut up, voice. I make the rules. Down the bottom left side, it is going to be paranoid. Oh, look at that. He knows how to do the, uh, oh, you guys like that voice crack? Was that pretty sexy? Look at that. Got the little heart going on. No, this isn't a game that is live. I can, I can talk to myself all day. Hey, guys, you can't hear me because this game is already done all right so you can talk to yourself there which is quite nice it is going to be a pvz and it does look at the protoss right now oh is this even going to be a proxy or is it just a super early block of the expansion that is the real question and you can see right here that uh our protoss player sage is going to be making a little bit of small talk right now and if, oh, that Overlord totally would have spotted that too. I think it's going to be a gateway, right? Yep, a gateway coming up right away. This is going to be making Paranoid. Well, he should be more Paranoid right now. If you were to send out a drone, then he would have spotted this. Oh my god, this is such a crazy build. Because if you think about it, if he goes Hatchery first, which is very common in this matchup, then uh, it would have blocked this up. Although I am surprised to see him actually reveal that that pro because what he could have done is just delayed the, the hatchery that wouldn't have ever gone down. So anyways, we'll have to wait and see if this actually does pan out. I'm very curious to see how this pans out. I don't like, what do you do in this situation as Zerg? I honestly don't know as I have not seen this before, but we should be seeing a zealot here on the way right away. I do want to talk about these players and the game a little bit. I did not expect this game to get started so quickly. The drone right there is indeed going to spot it. Goes straight for the pylon. Not going to be able to kill that off though before the zealot gets out for sure. He will have to make a queen, maybe a spine, and a couple of drones, or excuse me, zerglings right away. And uh, Paranoid right now, probably a little bit paranoid. He is Paranoid Parrot about this game, as uh, he probably did not expect this whatsoever. I would personally throw down a spine right away. That's just me, though, and he does decide to do that. One zealot is on the way. Here he goes, six lings on the way as well. I don't think his zealot's going to be able to do all that much. There is a second zealot. Following it up, though, and Crota Boost makes Zealot surprisingly quickly. Here comes the first Zealot here, though. Notice how he's going to hang on to that Zealot for just a second. He doesn't want to lose it right away. He knows that the spine's almost done. He knows the lings are on the way. So killing the probe would be nice. It's not, uh, it's not that he needs to kill the probe. But uh, one probe shot and two zealot swipes will kill Zerglings. Now, he's going to go ahead and run by. This is actually a beautiful maneuver right now. He's going to go straight for the main base. He knows that there's nothing here. The cannon is not going to be done in time. And the zealots are actually going to be falling all the way back. So this game got very interesting very, very quickly. Now I can talk about these players for just one second. He's going to try and kill that probe. I think he's just go straight for the main base. I guess the cannon will be done since uh, he took the time to chase down that probe. But uh, it, he at least did force the cannon to go down before the Nexus. Ah, those are going to be just a moment too late to be able to actually kill. Oh, well, uh, I don't know. Zerglings do run pretty quick. Does he decide to go for this round? No, runs into the main base and does not lose a single Zergling. Oh, they're on the move command there for a second. The probes there are going to retreat. That does leave the main base very vulnerable. I'll, I'll talk about these players later because this game is underway right Right away, only 13 drones though for Paranoid right now, so he has to do some sort of economic damage right now. And so far, it's just not happening. Yes, he's killed off one probe, might be able to get a second, and he does a uh, third one as well. So now it's starting to even out just a little bit 18 to 18. That's exactly what he needed. Plus, the long distance mining here is going to be quite nice. Now, four lings is still enough to do quite a bit of damage, but the zealot control of Sage is probably going to be enough. To, uh, to eventually clean these out, but the four links here do remain. I don't think he can actually kill off that Zelda, especially now that all three are uh, completely weakened right now. So we can talk here for just a moment. Um, Paranoid is a Polish player, which is awesome, and Sage is going to be a Korean from Team Root, which is, uh, which is pretty awesome. There is apparently a lot of Polish players out there. What is it with Poland and esports, man? Is that just, is that just a country that breeds competitive gamers? Uh, we do have a supply block here. This is a pretty severe one as well for Sage. I think there's just been too much going on. Hasn't been able to drop down the pylon in time. He is spotting the timing of the gas, though. He knows, hey, there's two gas on the way. There's also going to be probes already in that gas, and he knows the expansion timing. So he knows he's actually not in that bad of shape. Um, the fact of the matter is, oh, the Zell right here trying to make something happen. He is going to get intercepted right away. I mean, the fact of the matter is that Paranoid is now on three bases. He's got his natural, quote-unquote, which is just his second base out here, um, and he has his actual natural going to be taken here relatively soon. 
So he's going to be okay. This is going to even out in a big way. He did enough probe damage to be able to stay ahead in drones and uh, is going to be okay moving forward. Now, he's going to be a little bit paranoid here moving forward. Yes, guys, I can't help but make bad puns, okay? All right, I'm not a sage, okay? I just have to make... Okay, I'm done. I'm done with the puns, I promise. We do see this organ's going to be moving around, though, because he is actually paranoid and uh, wants to spot if there's going to be any sort of crazy rush here. Because, you know, right now, he could be throwing down seven gateways. He could be working towards doing something like that, hidden from the sight of the Overlord. Um, although, double Overlord inside the main base. These Overlords are quite ballsy. They're able to spot everything that's going on. I think even when the uh, Cybercore was wrapping up there, he was able to spot that as well. So, I'm kind of curious to see... Um, I don't think the Stargate gets spotted. Let's take a look at that. Uh, he has not spotted the Stargate. I would love to tell the Overlord. I would love to tell him that there is a Stargate there, but unfortunately he does not know. Mothership Core is on the way. Now, I think a Roach timing actually would have been really effective here, especially with the Stargate on the way, because uh, Roaches are an interesting thing in that you can get so many of them that the Void Rays can't actually kill them off quickly enough, especially if Sage is going to be going for a Phoenix here, which I have a feeling he is going to be doing that. Um, a Roach timing would have done great damage, but now the, uh, I wouldn't call it the momentum, but the pacing of the game has now started to go back towards Sage, especially if he gets a Phoenix right here. Is that what he's going to go for? Phoenix? Phoenix? Yep, it is going to be a Phoenix there. The reason I'm predicting Phoenix is because he's going for an aggressive stanced attack. Look at this. He's got two Zelts. He's got a Stalker and a Mothership Core out in the center of the map. And so going for a Void Ray, it would take too long not only to make, but to also get across the map. And also, since his early attack was so aggressive, it was actually as aggressive as you can get as Protoss. Uh, versus Zerg, is that he he was so aggressive that he knows if he lets his opponent sit back and macro up, he's going to fall behind. So he wants to go for the most aggressive um, follow-up that he can, which is going to be Phoenix's. Uh, of course, Phoenix move very quickly. They're going to be able to snipe those two Overlords that we saw kind of floating around. And it does look like Zerg over here trying to make something happen. I don't know if this is the correct choice. The Queen is working on the Mothership Core, though. He does have enough for Mass Recall and will use the Recall there. So he got a little bit too worried about that. I think he would have been able to... No, I don't know. That was a lot of lings right there. But uh, the Phoenix should be moving out here relatively soon. I don't think the Overlord is going to spot this, though. Notice how the Phoenix are staying hidden from the Overlord. It can be tempting to send your Phoenix over there to kill that Overlord as quickly as possible, but the Overlord honestly might not even... Oh, he, does. he has spotted the Stargate. But uh, either way, don't want to reveal your Phoenix to that Overlord as tempting as it may be. Two Phoenix are now on the field. A third one going to be joining them right now, and uh, a fourth one actually being produced here. So certainly speed got to be nearly done, but so far a very interesting game. We have a very, very early fourth base right now out of Paranoid at the 10-minute mark here. He might be getting a little bit too greedy right now. We do have the Infestation Pit on the way as well. Should help him deal with these Phoenix. Another Queen going to be brought up. Does he have enough for Transfuse? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Now, losing a Queen or two right now, losing an Overlord or even a Drone or two is actually completely acceptable as long as he deals with these Phoenix at some point. Now, three Phoenix, I don't think is enough to kill it in one pickup. No, it is not. We'll have to pick it up once again. Does not have enough for transfuse. Almost kills off the one Phoenix right there. Sporecrawler at the main base. Quite nice. There is one at, uh, two at the natural, actually. So we got to get some free shots off here. Does he focus down the weekend one? It didn't have time as it was backed up just a little bit too far. But uh, I got to be, I'm, I'm quite surprised Paranoid actually able to get away with macroing this hardy still making drones. And we have double Spire on the way. Uh, there's one Spire. Where's the other Spire? Uh, there it is right there up here. So he has one at the natural, one at the main. Now, this is a bold move, as Kerrigan liked to say in Brood War. A bold move. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that there's already Phoenix on the field. So I think he's kind of counting on the fact that there's not going to be too many more Phoenix on in, in play, and he's just going to overwhelm them with Mutalus. I can't imagine what else he would get from the Spire. I mean, really all you're going to get is Corruptor at this point as uh, the Viper is something that you're not going to really see at this stage. A fifth base? Are you kidding me? Paranoid, you are ridiculous. 12 minute mark, fifth base. I cannot believe this. This is awesome. This is awesome. He may be the new macro king here. We'll just have to wait and see. The Overlords do need to get back by the Spore Caller. There's a second Spore Caller going to be constructed or waddled over there. Uh, looks like it is going to be constructed right now. Queens are getting taken out, which is quite annoying. But considering he's going to have his fifth hatchery here pretty soon, he doesn't even need inject larvas all that much. Take a look at the units. Is that 86 drones? Oh, my God. No, we're not going to look through every single one. But I believe that that is 86 drones at the 12-minute mark. He is uh, He's taking Rhett's spot, man, as the macro king. And you got to remember that that involved an early attack as well so this game is going to be ridiculous losing overlords honestly at this point i would say you know this is starting to add up a little bit it's starting to catch up to him but since he has so many bases he has so many drones his income is going to be ridiculous 2300 here um it honestly doesn't matter it does not matter if he's losing a couple overlords here and there it doesn't matter if he's losing queens as long as he rebuilds them at some point he's got to be just fine now, i think that the mutilus uh tech 
is a little bit precar precarious because you can see right now that Paranoid um, loses his first Muta right away and all of a sudden Sage is like, okay, well, I'll just keep building Phoenix right now. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, to see the plus one attack as well for those air units. Uh, but the Phoenix right now, he can easily Chrono Boost those out. Now, the Colossus tech is going to be an interesting choice. Ah, Corruptors are actually mixed in. This is a lot of Mutalists here on the field. He's going to be maxed out in no time off of his income that he is currently sustaining. I got to say, though, Sage has managed to perfectly saturate all three bases. Look at this saturation, 16, 17, and 18. If you want to know how to get maximum um, income off of three bases when you're not fully saturated, look at that. Uh, basically, you get about 17 to 18 on each mineral or uh, each expansion. Gets you in pretty good shape. Honestly, got to take out some drones here. Again, this doesn't really matter because more drones are already following it up. Now, if he gets below 80, then maybe he'll start to add up here. This fifth base, though, is completely undefended at this point. It does look like drones right now getting taken out by this Zealot. Uh, two kills on him already. Looks like the hatchery may go down as well. This is exactly what uh, Sage needs to do right now. But the Mutalist count is just so freaking high, I don't even know if the Phoenix is going to be able to deal with it. Uh, he's going to definitely wear the deal with the Shades. This is so many Mutalists, it's actually ridiculous. He needs to engage these Phoenix directly. That's exactly what he's going to try and do here. But uh, the control right now of Sage is just too good. There is the Corruptors are trying to absorb the damage. I don't think I've ever seen a battle quite like this. Keep in mind the fifth base did go down. Again, that doesn't really matter for Paranoid. Ah, this does, though, losing four stray Mutas right there. But at the same time, it could have been the old uh, bait and switch. He's been duped. He's got to go ahead and go straight for the probes. He's not going to be able to kill off the Nexus here. Keep in mind... That Phoenix Void Ray basically hard counters Mutalist Corruptor if everything is in even numbers. Ah, the Phoenix right there. I've got to be careful. Gets a couple nice shots off there, though, with the Corruptors. He can easily use that Corruption ability if he wants. A Void Ray right there could be caught out of position. But a very interesting strategy here by Paranoid. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this. I think it's pretty awesome. I hope he continues with it. But there is the Anion Pulse Crystals. That's going to increase the range of the uh, Phoenix shots by two which just makes them so ridiculously good versus Mutas. So I don't know if going for pure Muta is going to be worth it. I think going for uh, Corruptor is a better option. Lots of Spore Callers around can help out. Um, two Spore Callers at each base should be enough, but I wouldn't even uh, advise against three. Just because that's a lot of Phoenix, you're forcing your opponent to go for Phoenix, because what you can do here, force the Phoenix, force the Void Rays, and then maybe switch to Mass Hydra, maybe even switch to Ultralisks with a lot of Zerglings so that the Void Rays can't keep up, um, especially if the Corruptors to, to absorb a lot of the shots there. Oh, some nice shots here, taking out the Phoenix here as well. I'm kind of curious to see overall units lost here is heavily favoring Sage, but oh, look at this, forward cannons at a potential fifth base here to protect those uh, Phoenix. Very interesting, very interesting game so far. I gotta admit, I haven't, I have, I know I've said this already, but I haven't really any, seen anything like this whatsoever. Some zealots over here will get taken out. This is exactly what Paranoid needs to do. Now remember, the fact that Paranoid is choosing to go Mutalisks means that he is almost guaranteed to not be cost effective in this units tab anytime soon. And what it also means is it allowed him to get a fifth base. A sixth base is already on the way. I, I seriously am not even surprised at this point. I wouldn't be surprised to see a seventh base go down at this point. But 18 minutes, sixth base. Lings over here might get a nice surround on the Nexus. Should be able to kill this off. And this Nexus was about halfway done. Will force the cancel. He does get that. Upgrades on the Zealots 1-1. One, one. Zergling's currently seeing it at 0-0. Zero, zero. But the, the, uh, the air upgrades already at one attack, two armor. Not too shabby. Uh, our air upgrades right now for Sage... I don't think he's got anything just yet. Take a look here. No, he hasn't started the air upgrades, which is very shocking because Sky Toss is so good now. But I got to say, the Corruptor Muta Ling combo, very, very interesting. Links aren't going to be doing that much in this case. We'll see if he can manage to actually engage this directly. No, he's going to go around that army. The Phoenix have been out here harassing at the main base, but he's got to go straight for probes. We'll be able to take out the cannon right now. There's a second cannon there, and the army will be able to back up. This is a lot of massacred probes. How many did he kill overall? 24 to 16 killed off, but the Phoenix have showed up. They got the perfect angle here. The, the Corruptors could go straight for the Colossus if they want to, and the Muta's trying to run straight into those Phoenix. I wish the uh, Corruptors would kill this Colossus, but it looks like the Muta's will finish it. Oh, God, how is that Colossus still alive? That is the real question. Still one of the wonkiest battles I've ever seen. I mean, what are we watching here? I don't even know, but I got to say, I love the play style that Paranoid is trying to make work here, and uh, we'll be able to eventually chase these Phoenix all the way back over here, but there's so many cans here, the Mutalists cannot engage, but this shows you why the Annie and Pulse Crystals are such an important upgrade, because the Mutas are getting taken out very, very quickly. Great control here by Sage. This is exactly why you don't see Mutas versus Phoenix that often. Will be able to kill off that poor Phoenix, which unfortunately had a bad rally point, but uh, it's so interesting because Paranoid is going for the most aggressive build I can even imagine with the Mass Muta. We'll be able to kill off these, uh, uh, the Corruptors gave up. They weren't giving chase. 
Will be able to kill off a couple of these Phoenix, though. Not going to get those two Void Rays just yet. And, uh, yeah, not going to kill them off. But either way, he's continuing to do this. As Ah, he is going to do it. I almost feel smart, which I don't say very often because it's almost never true. He is going to tech switch into the Ultralist Cavern. I think this is a good move. Um, it's going to be very effective versus just the pure Stalker. And uh, there's not that many air units at this point. Um, Sage has not done a full transition into Sky Toss. As you can see, he's going to be working on some Ultralist here. It does look like base number five will go down, but that will reduce the bases to five as uh, the new established sixth base over here will be his fifth remaining. The Milo's going to be moving out, and he's going to be buying himself a little bit of time, getting this army out of position. And i got to say that, oh, no, the Corruptor's flying over the uh, the Archons there. That was an ideal situation. What's not an ideal situation is he's linked inside your main base. Got to be killing in the freshly warped in Stalkers. He's going to try and go for the Nexus, but you got to remember that these Zorkings do not have any upgrades. So I don't think he's going to be able to kill that off in time, showing us how important those upgrades are. More Corruptors are on the way, and... I, I don't know how to say, guys. This game is awesome. I know a lot of you are going to be sitting back there and being like, Paranoid, what are you doing? You're being so stupid. I actually really like this because his build is uh, its a very unique play style because it's forcing him to have to be so aggressive with his army and so aggressive with his expanding that uh, he just has to keep expanding, but he has fast units to keep the Protoss army in their base. Unfortunately, he did not find a perfect counterattack timing, so it's going to be very difficult to deal with. Now, one thing I've noticed Protoss players doing a lot is throwing down lots of cannons, like more cannons than you would ever expect. There was six being produced right there, and uh, it has started to prove to be very effective. Now, static defenses are something you wouldn't expect to be very useful. Here comes a huge attack. Can he actually kill this off with what he's got? We're about to find out. The Mutalists here actually able to kill off the, uh, uh, the Archons. Not so much on the Phoenix here, though. The Phoenix count is still relatively high. Not as high as it's been, though. Six kills, or excuse me, six Phoenix overall. I'm kind of curious to see how many kills these Phoenix actually have. That one has zero, but these other ones have eight. Uh, five kills on that one. The Mutalists are going to be engaging here. I think that Paranoid may be overcommitting. He realizes that he's going to go ahead and retreat right now. There is a minor battle for the Watchtower. That Voidra has six kills. He's almost been forgotten about by the Protoss, and it does delay the base right there. I don't know if you noticed that. Killing off that probe with a little bit of micro, but uh, I still think that Mass Hydra might be the best choice right now, or at least get out some of those Ultras like we've talked about. Corruptors right now trying to take out the Phoenix. If you kill the Phoenix, that is huge, because that means the Mutalists can actually start harassing the main base, which is really what Mutalists were invented for. That's why Abathur made the Mutalists, because to begin harassing the Protoss when and where he can. But again, it's just so many cannons, it is absurd. No, no Zerg would ever expect this many cannons, but what he really needs to do, though, is separate these uh, these corruptors from the music. You can see he does have them on different hotkeys, but the main problem is is that they are currently with the mutants. Those corruptors basically just need to fly home, fly home safely at this point. Can he kill off any of these phoenix? So, and I gotta say, Sage, um, this is what I was trying to say for like 10 minutes, is that the playstyle of Paranoid is so aggressive with the expanding, so aggressive with, uh, with with how many units he has in the air that Sage has to be cost effective. If he was going toe to toe on units lost, he would be losing this game. In, in droves, he would be so far behind. So when you're watching this game, keep in mind that the playstyle Paranoid is using, Sage has to be cost effective in his engagements, otherwise he will lose. That is the uh, the playstyle that Paranoid is trying to force here. Sage, though, not really falling for it just yet, as his control has been very, very good. And let me even look at these three Zelts. They're going to be going in here, and they spotted the Ultralist Cavern. That is a huge tell as to what the potential tech switch is going to be. And you can see he's working on the upgrades for those Ultras right now, so he eventually wants to tech switch to that. And I love the Zergling counterattacks because their upgrades are so weak right now. I'm trying to click on one. There we go. 1-1 one, one upgrades there, but compared to the Protoss, 3-3. Three, three. And that doesn't even include the shield upgrade just yet, which we could easily... I, I think the shield upgrade would actually be really smart. Considering we're starting to see Archons, we've seen a lot of air units. Air units also benefit from the shield upgrade. Ah, the Mutas right here are going to be killing off a lot of cannons. This is why you have to throw down like 10 plus cans. He's actually going to go straight for the Nexus. Might actually manage to get it. The army is not going to be back in time to defend it. Looks like the Phoenix have arrived though. The Corruptor is actually finally doing their jobs and killing off these Phoenix. But look at this. The swing around attack with these units. Can he sandwich them? Yes, he does. But there's just not enough Phoenix to kill them directly. So he is still forced to micro around. Paranoid now finally doing an insane amount of damage here. Evening it up a little bit, but it's still not enough to get ahead in that unit's lost tab. Overall workers killed though, 49 to 18. This is such 
a ridiculous build from Paranoid. I gotta say, normally Zerg players are just like, all right, well, they have this thing called the Phoenix, so I'm gonna stop making Mutalisk. He says, oh, hell nah. He's gonna continue with that. 12 more meters on the way, and you can see he's got the bankroll to make this work. Uh, I think he meant to put these drones in that gas right there, but uh, regardless, his income is looking great. Needs to put a couple more drones throughout these gas, uh, but either way, he can afford it to continue losing units here. Again, as long as he keeps that Phoenix Cloud a little bit low, then he's got to be in pretty good shape, but he's just had a difficult time in dealing with that sacrifice of that Phoenix there. Honestly, that was just to free up more supply for additional Phoenix because you can see he immediately began building yet another one. The meter's right here, though. Got to go for it. It's just one or two Archon shots could be the end and manages to back it out right there. I don't even want to know what his APM is right now. Almost 400 apiece throughout this entire game. These players very evenly matched. We do have to remember that he did manage to kill off one of the bases. Zergen's over here trying to get this round. But again, it's 3-3 three, three versus, I believe, 1-1. One, one. Maybe it's 1-2 uh, one, one, at this point as he does have the armor upgrade now. Yes, he does. So it's going to be 1-2 on those links. And uh, we're going to be starting to see multi-prong attacks here. You can see an army moving out here in the center. Does manage to take out one of those bases. And uh, looks like the Stalkers here. Might be able to take out yet another hatchery. Now, maybe watching this be going, well, there's not that many minerals there. What he needs desperately is the gas. There's only a couple hundred gas left there. And if he loses that hatchery, that gas is basically lost forever. It's not like he's going to rebuild a hatchery for that. And uh, he does manage to hang on to it. So that base is going to be mined out, I, I would say, before he ends up losing it here. But it does look like the Zorgans here are going to get in. And if he magic boxes the F, the, uh, uh, can he do it? Man, magic box him? Okay, he didn't take any splash damage from those Archons, so he's going to chase this one down. He could turn around and get one shot off, but that's not going to be enough. The Archon gets taken out. Now, Mass Blink Stalker, does he even have Blink? No, he doesn't have Blink. He's working on it right now, though. He's going to try and get out that Blink, but uh, he does. I don't know how he survives this long versus Mutas with no Blink. That is absurd. Four Archons on the way. Gotta remember, we're about 30 minutes into this game. This has actually been the most action-packed game, I want to say, that I've ever casted. Um, this has been the most non-stop aggression I've ever cast. I'm, I'm gonna say that. This game is insane. The map isn't even really cut in half. I mean, it's kind of getting there as our Zerg player is gonna be working down those rocks. But, uh, overall, it, it's been a relatively low econ game for Protoss. Given that it's a 30-minute game, because the Mutalists have been able to knock out one of the expansions and to establish another base, he has to throw down lots of cannons, so he has to save up lots of money to actually do that. So the expansions are a little bit later than you might expect at this stage. Now, I am kind of surprised to see no side storms, because one storm can kill off an entire Mutalist block. Oh, it's so tempting to go for this Nexus. Decides to go for the probes first. Uh, wouldn't have been able to kill off that Nexus regardless. Taking a look at the workers killed overall, 72 workers killed. Almost 100 workers right now for us. They're like, oh, we finally get an Archon shot off on those Mutas. The angle looking really, really good for Sage right now. The Archons doing their due diligence, and they have managed to whittle that army down substantially. About 10,000 resources ahead in the units lost. But here's a counterattack over here. Is going to be killing off some of the probes. Decides to go straight for the Nexus. Again, he is going to be killing off about 1,000 gas because the Protoss player most likely isn't going to rebuild that Nexus just to get the 1,000 gas. And does match to a delay mining over here as well. Again, non-stop, and he gets the Nexus right now. Paranoid getting a little bit of momentum during this. He wants to get this army out of position so we can kill off yet another base. He scouts up here, he sees, hey, our Protoss player is not mining that much. So Zerg is actually ahead in the income, even though he's mined out on three full bases, um, which normally for Zerg players, oh, oh, well that was just the Zerg, okay, that was just the Link being taken out. Almost had a heart attack, thought it was all the Mutas. But uh, anyways, Usually, you're not going to see Zerg players completely mine out a third base, but uh, that's exactly what we're seeing here. First, second, and third bases don't even have any gas. This one has just a little bit left. Here's another attack over here going to be taking place, but there's just so many Phoenix that, uh, again, he's able to hold his ground. Now, I'm trying to think of what either player could do here. I think Storm for the Protoss, which is what we're starting to see right now from Sage, finally going to be researching that. Does he have High Templar on the field? That is the big question. He's working him in right now. Um, I don't know if any of them have any energy, though. Yeah, he just warped in his first four. So storms are still about a minute out because he does have to wait for not only the storm research but also the energy. And a ping over there is apparently one of our spectators is like, hey, why hasn't our Protoss expanded there? But it doesn't get the Mutas here going to be delaying this. Anything he can do to delay an expansion is huge. Like drop, knocking that pylon down, that means no cannons there. Killing off the assimilator, that means no gas being mined. Lots of links on the map. Now look at the mini-map. The unit's going to be streaming out across the map. His upgrades are at 2-3. He is finally working on the third attack. I still think going for, uh, for Ultralis wouldn't be the worst choice in the world. Um, Ling's right here trying to counterattack. That's not going to really happen, though. There, there's just too many units at this point. They are going to spot the High Templar here, though. Can he kill off any of them? Not quite. 
Uh, oh, he does get one right there at the last second. But uh, main base is now exposed. The Phoenix trying to get back down here to defend this. But this may activate the attack right now. Oh, he flies in the Corruptors there. Once again, going to be baiting those Phoenix into those Corruptors. Killed off three of those Phoenix. Keep an eye on the supply. Neither player is actually maxed out right now. We do see the Mutas right here. He's got to be careful. Cannot afford a single shot from those Archons. The Archons are going to be losing lots of weight in this game. I mean, I know they look fat now, but they are going to be a lot lighter weight after running around this much. Corruptors there try and take out the Phoenix because he knows that the Phoenix are really the only thing he needs to kill off. Now, lots of Zerglings are on the way. I don't know if this is the best choice. We'll see if he manages to make this happen, though. What he's trying to do is attack one location and uh, uh, with, with the Mutas and then attack with the Zerglings in a completely different area. Ah, uh, Blink Forward there, a little bit premature. The main base is going to be exposed. I don't know if the Mutalists realize that, though. The Phoenix have now backed up here. Those Lings cannot attack up there. That's going to be suicide. Sends two links there to buy him a little bit of time, but uh, does find this expansion right now completely exposed. Should probably go for the probes, but he wants to delay that income as much as he possibly can. This shows you just how frustrating Mutalus can be, but Sage, I got a hand to him, man. He is hanging in there. He is fighting the good fight. Does end up losing another Nexus right there. I'm kind of curious on the income right now. Um, our Protoss player down to 500. Uh, does bump it up to around 600 right now. 1600 for Zerg, and uh, he needs to uh, get as many drones at that location as he can. He's already got 18, though, which is pretty good. He wants to mine out the bases closer to his opponent if he can. Try and save these right here, as silly as it is, just because they're easier to protect, but that's going to be mined out in just a matter of moments. 12 Meatless on the way, and I got to say, Sage has been so cost-effective throughout this game, but losing a couple Nexus is not going to be good. Go straight to the main base. This Nexus is worthless. Doesn't even need to kill that. That's why he's going to be going for the protection right now. I think killing out the Fleet Beacon might be a good idea. Um, I don't think we're going to be seeing really any Fleet Beacon units, though. And he does decide to go for the Nexus. You might as well. That's less Chrono Boost. That's going to be less probes produced later if he needs to recreate those. And uh, it does take away a lot of supply. Remember, the Nexus adds supply as well. But here we go. Going to be pushing forward with the Stalkers. And uh, the, the Archon as well going to be taking out a base finally for the Zerg. Uh, can he kill off these Stalkers? Is that even enough Stalkers to scare this army away? Sage would be smart to back those up. That's exactly what he's going to do right now. So the main base has been taken out. This army is going to be moving forward. These Mutalists will get taken out if they stay much longer. They decide to retreat immediately. Ooh, this base, he would love to hang on to this. There are four spine crawlers here. Uh, five, actually, no, there's more than that. There's like six. Seven? No, there's six. Okay, six spine crawlers there might just be enough to hold on to this base. He needs that base so badly. He is going to end up losing it, though. And watch as his income is going to plummet after losing this. As, uh, he's already lost a lot of the drones. He's lost uh, five left mining there. And really, this is his only mining base. You can see it has now dropped down to about 1,100. Oh, I believe that was Broodlings, not all drones that just died right there. But he's got to be careful with the Mutas once again. Doing a good job keeping his Mutalus count high. But I don't know if he can still hang on to this base or not. This is going to be really, really tough for him to uh, to keep this base alive. And this is the base that is going to start turning this game back around and uh, evening it out in a big way. Because look at the income now. It's going to plummet as soon as this base dies. Uh, he ended up losing the drones here, having to back them up right now. Big Zergling counterattack, though. This is enough Zerglings to kill off this base. We'll see if the uh, Stalkers can get back here in time. Kills off the cannons. More cannons going to be on the way, showing you the importance of the cannons. If you're wondering what these probes are doing, they're actually protecting the Nexus. They're hugging the Nexus. They're saying, no, do not kill our Nexus, and it looks like the Nexus will survive. Oh, God, no, it won't. No, it won't. He gets a last second surround there, and the Nexus has fallen. So this game is so back and forth. I got to say, I'm going to say hands down, this is one of my favorite games I've ever seen ever. Such a, such a good game. Both these players so evenly matched. Their APM is the same. The unit's loss is about the same, considering how many mutas we've seen. Um, the income is now the same-ish, as both players have lost a lot. Overall, uh, workers killed here, 106 to 142. Paranoid has killed over 100 probes. That is ridiculous. If I'm doing my math right, that's 5,000 minerals, right? 5,000 minerals in just probes. Uh, the Corruptors, as you can see, they really, uh, did they actually only take one shot? Uh, two damage per shot from the Phoenix right now? I think they do. So you can see the Corruptors, once they have that three armor, the Phoenix are worth, it doesn't even do damage to them, essentially. I think it does the bare, bare minimum. But uh, this is still anybody's game at this point. Protoss still behind in supply. Uh, I think the one thing that Paranoid can do better here is get out some sort of spellcaster. Whether it's going to be the Viper to pull those Archons in 
or the Blinding Cloud to make the Immortals worthless. Whether it's going to be the, I would say more important, importantly, the Fungal Growth, I think is what his army is really lacking right now. If he can get Fungal Growth, that's going to be a lot of damage because the army is so clumped up. It can force the army uh, to move very slowly across the map, and then you can fly the Mutas in for more, some more counterattacks, which is exactly what he's going to be doing right now, at least, with flying into the main base. He does drop a pile in there to try and reclaim that Warp Gate. That Warp Gate is going to get taken out, though. The Lynx here are going to be buying enough time, and this is a classic um, use of Zergling Muta here versus Protoss, forcing the army out of position here. He is going to be able to kill off Archons with Lynx. A nice little trap has been sprung. It, wait, are the Archons actually going to survive? No, they die, but they buy enough time for the Stalkers to get up here. And the Mutalus is going to be attacking right now at the natural. Now, this is not the most important base at this point, which I, I don't think I've ever said this, but the most important base for Protoss is in the center of the map right now. And Sage, actually, that's going to be his only Nexus remaining. This one's not really doing anything. So Sage, at this point, cannot lose any units because he cannot afford to reproduce them. Any unit that he loses is not going to be rebuilt right now. Uh, the ping right there showing, hey, there is still an available base right now. But I got to say, Paranoid looking to be in really good shape right now. He's got got some good income. He's got uh, uh, a mining base, which is more than uh, Sage can really say, or at least two mining bases right now for Paranoid. This one is almost mined out, but still, he's got the advantage. So look at the minimap for a second. Have you ever seen a game like this? I don't think so. And honestly, I cannot believe this game has been 42 minutes. It feels like a 15-minute game because it's been so nonstop. I could watch these players play all day, and at this rate, this game may take all day. The Phoenix right here, though, getting tons of damage off on those Phoenix. Beautiful control by Sage. But this is looking just so dire for Sage. More Zerg is going to counterattack up here. They see, hey, there is actually no base there. Um, killing off pylons right now is actually a huge benefit to Paranoid because you got to remember that Sage is so low on money that, uh, look at this, he has to build more pylons if he loses too many. Now, we do have Bailing Speed on the way, and you can see right now that gas is becoming an issue for Paranoid. So if he's not careful here, he's going to run into a, a major problem. So he needs to be mining gas there and here as well. So he's got uh, nine drones not mining gas that should be, which would greatly supplement his army. But, I mean, the problem is that all the all the takeable bases, for the most part, are on the right side of the map. He is going to be going for pylons here. This is actually good. Normally, I, I would say don't do this, but it is actually going to supply block him right now. He's risking his Zerglings for the sake of supply block, which is exactly what's going to happen here. And Sage, I mean, he just can't afford to produce more pylons. Let's be honest, the Zerglings up here are going to be doing a little bit of damage. He's trying to pull this army every which way. Ling's going to be attacking in here. That's not going to be doing a lot of damage. The Storm there will probably be doing more damage than those Ling's did. But uh, that means that the Mutalus is going to be flying over here. If he can kill off any production, then Sage is not going to be able to remake it. I mean, at this point, Sage cannot even build enough pylons to get unsupply blocks. So it looks like this is going to be his last ditch effort, moving out with everything he has got. And it doesn't look like the Spine Crawlers are going to be doing a little bit of preliminary damage. Can he kill off a Stalker? Yes, he does. Will kill off a couple of Zealots as well. Every single unit here, again, is not going to be reproduced. So these Mutalists right now should actually be going for this expansion. I just, oh, I don't know. That's actually some pretty stellar defense right there. But with no beef units, no beefy units for Paranoid, he just lost his only main mining base. He's got the half... Oh, uh, no, there's only one mineral patch here. So he has lost his only mining base right now. The storm there looking pretty good. But the thing you've got to remember is, oh, no, he's still mining down here. God, this game is ridiculous. The thing is that he's not mining off of these geysers here. It does look like the attack now finally spotting this with the observer. He knows that's where he needs to be. He needs to get down there and needs to take care of that. But 142 supply out of 58. The only thing that Sage can make right now is nexuses and pylons, nexi and pylon, which is not going to be enough. I mean, he's he can keep trying to build pylons, but I don't think he's ever going to be able to make another attack again. Uh, a huge Zergling swell right here, but the storms were perfect. The Ultra's going to be joining in. It wasn't enough. The Muta's showing up just a little bit late. I think that Sage might actually win that battle. The Storm, they're going to be finishing up a lot of these Mutalists. An absolutely ridiculous game here. The most non-stop aggression in a game that I have ever seen in like four years of casting StarCraft. I have never seen a game be this non-stop. I, I don't even know what to say. I'm at a loss for words. I am not normally at a loss for words, but at this time, I don't even know what words can describe this game. This is the story of, like, Tassadar and and Zeratul, man, holding the line. This is like them trying to... This is Ire right here. Let's pretend this is Ire and the Zerg, man, have taken over the rest of the Kaprulu sector, or wherever Ire is. They're, Ire is not in the Kaprulu sector, but uh, either way, able to take over all the other planets. We'll pretend that these are planets. 
And all that remains is, oh, look at this, he's taking a base over here, what are you doing? He might actually manage to pull this off as he's saying, you know what, Husky, the bases in the middle were the ones that have worked out for me the best. He's able to hang on here. He's got more pylons on the way. He may break the supply block, believe it or not. But uh, I just don't think Mutalists are going to be able to deal with this. Um, I got to say, I love that Paranoid was going for the Muta play. I, I already know a lot of people are going to be upset that he's stuck with Muta so long. And I think it honestly would have worked. But he needed a good engagement there with the Mutas, the Zerglings, maybe even mix in some Hydras or something, some meat to the army. More Ultralis, more Roaches, something like that. Or Infestors, always oh, finally going to be able to take out this base, though. Not a whole lot of mining going to be taking place right now, but he just doesn't have enough to deal with this army directly. That is the main problem here. Take a look at this army supply, 97 to 111. Um, kills off yet another pylon there. He's just trying to supply block him all day. But the Lings, there's really nothing left on the field to take out. Oh, more pylons over here. No, so he's going straight for the pylons. He knows he's already going to force the cancel there. So he wants to kill the pylons before this army gets back into position. This is such just a back and forth game between these armies here. I mean, honestly, Paranoid should have won, but he had one bad engagement. And now all of a sudden, he is in bad, bad shape. Uh, and look at this. This is all the Protoss has left. Nothing else on the map. Just this one center base. And Paranoid, I mean, how do you deal with this? Lings right there trying to take out the Nexus. That's not going to happen. Um, looks like the Phoenix might actually go down though Right when I'm trying to clear my throat I'm Trying to drink a little bit of tea right now Actually I am going to take a drink of tea Because this game, I don't know if it's over anytime soon Hang on Oh that tea is so good on my throat But uh, it does look like right now Sage has weathered the storm It has been a very long storm But he is in a position to actually be able to move out For the kill here The only thing Paranoid can do I feel like is make some infestors. Uh, I, I think that's going to be his only his only option here. But the problem is that fungal growth is not going to kill anything of what you see here. So I think that Sage may have actually done it. Loses the Nexus right there. This uh, Mutalisk Ball is going to have to retreat once again. But he's cutting into the resources. Keeping a Sage on one base at the 49 minute mark. Which is not something that I say very often. The Ling count's very high. The reason he has so many Lings is because, look at this, the mineral count is, is, is ridiculous here. I don't even know if he can get enough larvae. He does have 26 larvae. Does he decide to dump it into Zerglings? Does he decide to dump it into Roaches or something that he can try and be cost effective with this army? He's got to be careful. Storm right there. Going to prevent the Zergling run by. The Mutas over here cannot deal with this. So, I mean, really, what do you do as Paranoid and in this situation? I love that he's being aggressive, but he's got a lot of money in the bank, and he can make one more wave of units off of that larva. But what is it that he actually gets? Does have the three drones and gas right there. Needs three in there. He is going to go for it right now. Trying to kill off this base. This army is tucked away into a corner, though. The storms are going to eat up every single Zergling almost. That was so many kills. I don't know where all these High Templar are, but my god, they just massacred. Look at that, look at that. 16 kills on that, uh, on that High Templar. Where are these Hero Phoenix at? So many kills. 10 kills on that one. Uh, four on the other one. There's not many Phoenix left, but man, are these guys veterans or what? I think 10 kills is the highest. No, 11 kills on that right uh, <clears throat> on that Phoenix right there. And you got to remember that those are all mutilists. That is the Red Baron right there. You guys thought the Red Baron was dead. No, he survived all the way into playing StarCraft 2 and uh, does manage to hang in there. Now, do you have a base on the way for Paranoid? Honestly, the only thing Paranoid can do right now is sit back, try and macro up again which just sounds silly at this point, but it's 19 drones to 22, which is still a, a, a winnable situation here for Paranoid, but he needs to figure out some sort of unit for this army composition. I mean, Mutalists are just not going to cut it anymore. Zerglings not, haven't really ever cut it. He's got to try and go for the Templar Archives, unable to get it. <clears throat> Going for the pylons would be quite nice. Now, Paranoid knows... God, I'm starting to lose my voice because this game is so crazy. Paranoid knows that he's stuck on two bases here. So as long as he leaves the links here, delays that base, he himself can start mining off of two bases. But he actually needs to make more drones right now. Going for the Temple Archives. Once again, there's a storm. If you're wondering why he's going for the Temple Archives, because Archons right now are the most cost-effective unit that he can actually get versus Zergling Vita. And uh, he can't get the Templar to make the Archons if he loses the Templar Archives. Now, he's trying to do as much damage as he can here. He wants to buy as much time as possible. The army here, though, it is not falling for it as it is going to retreat right there. But I think, honestly, just making more drones is what he needs to do here. Try and buy as much time as he possibly can. But again, I still don't know if he has the right units. He will be able to uh, get a nice angle here. Oh, the storm doing lots of damage. Now, remember that Mutalists do regenerate HP very quickly. So take a look at this. Look how quickly that does go up. But the problem is that he can't afford to lose any of those Mutas. He needs to buy as much time as possible. So this game is starting to get... Uh, I mean, I know it's already been epic, but it's starting to get pretty serious. 
That's the word I'm going to use, and I'm going to stick to it. It's getting pretty serious because right now Paranoid has to make a decision. Do I make drones and risk the push out and lose? Do I, do I not make drones and risk not having enough units? What do I do? I honestly don't know what the correct choice is. Normally watching from my god perch up here, I can decide what a, what a really good choice would be. But I honestly don't know. I'm at a loss for decisions at this point. I really don't know what the best option is. Sage, I think, is making the best option. I'm um, going to be sticking to his technically one and a half bases now uh, because he is going to be mining gas. This is almost mined out, though. Only 60 remaining in there. 500 left in there. Uh, this map is going to be mined out before not too long. Uh, well, I don't know. Space still is not saturated whatsoever. Finally, some drones are on the way. I think Ultralisk is the correct choice. You kind of want to scare your opponent with those Ultras. Where's the army, though? Completely out of position, apparently. Uh, there it is right there. Almost lost a Warp Gate, which uh, really losing one Warp Gate is not going to hurt him all that much. And the fact of the matter is he killed off a Corruptor there. So to me, that is going to be worth it. But he needs to get some more income here. That's what he has to do. I don't know if he can do it. He's going to go for the final attack right now. I think he should have been more patient with the Storm. Got to be killing off everything. And, yep, that's not going to happen. I don't think this game's going to happen for Paranoid. He needed to wait, but there's just too many Archons. A ridiculous amount of Archons. It's got to move out right now. I think this game might be over. I cannot believe this game was an hour long. This did not feel like an hour long. If I watched this game before, like, going to work, I would have been half an hour late to work because this game does not feel that long whatsoever. Now, the Muta's trying to clean up the Phoenix here. My God, these Phoenix still in the game. Four kills on that one. The other one's up to 12 right now. Might be able to kill off uh, several more units before it's all said and done. Here's the Ultra, but unfortunately it's just too little too late. Look at that splash damage on all three of those Archons. Manages to kill him off. There's the GG from Paranoid. Sage weathered that storm for almost an hour and managed to come out ahead and end up winning that game. Now I want to say... I already know a lot of people are going to poop all over Paranoid for making Mutas for so long, but I want to say, imagine if Sage lost one battle for that entire game. He would have lost the game because he wouldn't have had anything to defend against the Mutalist Karras. Look at the minimap. When do you see a game like this? And uh, overall, I mean, it's just crazy. Units lost here. He lost over 1,000 units. Yes, I know that's a lot. A lot of that has to do with Zerglings, but that is still a lot. Archons look so badass when they don't have a giant orb around them. But either way, this is definitely one of my favorite games of all time. This is definitely the most aggressive game I've ever cast, and this is getting the epic tag for one of the awesome games. So if you have a friend who doesn't watch Lost Starcraft, this game was awesome. I think it's definitely worth showing them. So anyways, hope you guys enjoyed it. I gotta go take a break, man. My voice is about to actually die, which I would not, uh, I would not enjoy that one bit. So I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll see you guys next time. Oh god, my voice. Hello everyone, this is H the Husky Husky here. I'm going to be casting a one versus one between the blue Zerg player over here on the center left side. His name is Odin, and his opponent in the top center is going to be Vile Spanishiwa. You guys are probably familiar with him on my channel. A lot of people requested a ZVZ with Spanishiwa in it, and I've heard many times from Spanishiwa that ZVZ is not his strongest matchup. It is something he is consistently working on, and every player has their weakest matchup. And when you're doing a mirror matchup, they can definitely be really weird because some units are worthless in certain situations. Some units are much more powerful and things like that, so you really have to have a good mindset when going into it. Getting the right units and the right build orders is very crucial. And uh, anyway, so a lot of people requested a ZBZ with Spanishua. Here it is, man. So I'm hoping for a pretty epic game. However, as this game is getting underway, I just want to mention one thing really quick. I am super excited to announce this, and it's something I've been working on over the last couple of months. A lot of people who have followed me on Facebook and Twitter have been helping out, giving feedback, and uh, helping me out. I just want to announce that I am going to be launching my new site officially today. And big thanks to everyone who is there before the big announcement who have, has been helping out through Facebook and Twitter and things like that. It is going to be my own personal gaming website that mostly focuses on StarCraft, but as always, I can put anything on there I want, so any games or anything else like that. And the website is just nerdyshore.com, N-E-R-D-Y, and then the word shore. Dot com. So there's a forum there. I think we have a couple thousand members on posting very actively on the forums and things like that. So just nerdyshore.com. There will be a link down below. If that's something that interests you, then uh, definitely go check it out. And yes, I know the last website, SCA, did not work out. I mean, it is what it is. Sometimes things work. Sometimes things don't. We just did not have $1,500 a month for hosting back then. Our hosting was horrible. It just did not work out. So I apologize. Uh, sometimes bad stuff happens, and that is exactly what happened with that site. 
This site so far, though, has been much more active, much more fun, and I'm really, really enjoying it there. The community is starting to grow, and essentially, the idea is for a very um, friendly environment. It's non-elitist or anything like that. It's just a friendly environment for anyone to to go there and post and learn strategy and help each other out. It looks like we have a lot of Zerglings here. Spanish UI, you're not giving me a good game to make an announcement video as there's just Zerglings running around and attacking these drones. The angle of the drones is pretty good, but these Zerglings are just going to town right now as the spine crawler does force the cancel there. Four Zerglings are now out on the field. And it is pretty interesting that this is mostly just because of these spawn locations and the fact that Spanishiwa got a much later pool. He does have 100 gas, but he, he got that gas extremely early. Nice angling there by Spanishiwa. However, I do believe that Odin had the slight advantage there. You can see 250 resources lost, although I think part of that is that spine crawler that got canceled. So Spanishiwa just needs to make sure to hang on here. And Odin, what is he following this up with? He doesn't have any more Zerglings on the way. He did commit a couple of there when he should have just instead ran away. So he did lose all of his circlings there. He does have a one drone advantage, just now losing that drone into a spine car. Looks like Spanishiwa is going to be counterattacking right now. However, there is two queens here, and if he just blocks them on the ramp, he will be just fine. Those are fairly early two queens, so he will force this game a little bit longer. There's no way that just a couple of circlings can kill that. Looking at the production tab, we do see Spanishiwa in true Spanishiwa fashion, going to be getting additional drones. Just now getting that queen out, I believe it will be his first queen. Yes, and it, I, I think once Odin, uh, once these larvae pop off, he'll probably bring his queens back just because his spine car will be completed. So he should be just fine here and is just now going to go ahead and start getting out the, or is he going to get metabolic boost? He does have gas on the way. And we do have an Evo chamber from Spanishiwa pretty early here. And he's just now getting his queen. That's one important thing to note is that Odin got his queens much earlier. So he was able to use inject larvas a lot more. I don't think there's a way to track the amount of larva someone has used in a game but uh, Odin would definitely have more access to that larva, which is why he was able to get Zerglings pretty early as well. 18 to 18 drones, which is very crucial. I do like this second queen from Odin. I, I think that that's something he can use to not only heal his roaches, should it come down to it. You can also use it to heal the other queens to hold your ramp much longer. And you can put roaches behind it to kind of hold off any Zerglings or anything like that. Really good play, I would say, from him. He is spawning out six Zerglings right now. He does have two more on the way, as well as two drones. What do we got going on? We have some Zerglings running by, somehow breaking the defenses there, even with those queens. And Smishiwa is going to be scouting around. However, I just don't think he's going to be able to cause a lot of damage here. Yes, he is forced to turn around his Zerglings to commit here, and Odin will clean that up quite easily. So neither player having severe losses one other thing to note, though, is that Spanishiwa did lose some mining time before. And did he lose any drones? Yes, he has lost two drones. So that is very important in ZBZ. That's 100 minerals lost that his opponent has not lost. And that just straight up means that you're behind. Looks like this queen is following the other one, just being that pesky, annoying queen, which is super annoying when you move as slow as a queen. If you have someone, like, nagging on you all the time, you just can't get away. We do have a lot of roaches on the way right now from Spanishiwa. He does have, it looks like six. One more is going to be on the way and that makes a grand total of seven. I'm just busting out these these math, you know, addition things. I, I, I think math is magic because I just don't understand it. It's it's magical to me. Looks like Odin is going for more of a defensive posture here, which is pretty, pretty cool because the spine crawlers do 30 damage versus armored rather than just the 25. And he knows that Spanishiwa was, I'm assuming he knows that Spanishiwa was making a bunch of roaches. And yes, he can see them moving down the ramp right here. As you can see, he backs up. He wants to be very careful here. Spanishiwa has to be careful as well, though. This Zergling is trying to be a hero instantly gets hacked down. But one thing that's very dangerous is a run by. If these Zerglings were positioned up here, then once the roaches get down here, they'll be held off by these spine crawlers. But then the Zerglings would do a run around. So Spishua trying to poke up here, realizes that's not going to happen. And the Zerglings, there we go. There goes the counterattack right now. They're mad dash. These are the wide receivers of the Zerg football team. Got to be running all the way into the main base. Does he have the ramp blocked? The answer is yes. Shoots his own queen with that one roach. And I thought the, the two queens were being annoying, but it's even more annoying when your own units are attacking you. So it does look like the roaches over here trying to run by to a very low level of success. A lot of the roaches have... How many units did he just lose right there? Looks like he's lost a lot of resources and units. These roaches exploding. 
The death animation for roaches, always fun to watch if you are not the Zerg player losing them. And so Spanishwa is going to hang on here. However, he does have, have a lot of Zerglings headed his way. 48 supply to 42. Got to remember that roaches do take up a grand amount of supply. Spanishwa does have a drone advantage, which is usual for his games. But can he save this hatchery? He does have Zerglings micro out. Here comes a run by into the main base. No, he doesn't get his run on the roaches. Keeping in mind that roaches do not take that much damage from Zerglings at all. I feel like they're taking one damage. And that is why you do not attack roaches with zerglings. As like these roaches have like five kills, seven kills. Here come more zerglings. This is going to be a waste, though. I don't think he's going to kill a single roach here. And look at that species even microing around. Now, what I think would have been more effective is if he ran into the main base with those zerglings. If he was able to slip them in there, could have been able to kill off a lot of drones. However, uh, Odin, I was going to say, hasn't been spinning his gas because all he's made is zerglings. You know why, man? because he is making Mutalus. Now you can see how Spanishua is going to be reacting with a lot of Spore Crawlers. That's why the scouting of Spanishua's style, very important. And so there will be Spore Crawlers here to prevent the Mutalus from doing too much damage. But now this forces Spanishua to get either a Hydralisk in or a Spire of his own. You can see right here the Mutalist just throwing their little Glaive Worms down here, doing literally like one damage per shot. But this is going to give Odin a lot of map control. It will allow him to kill off these Overlord Supply Block Spanishua a little bit. And you can see right now Spanishua throwing down the lair because he needs to get out Hydra. So Odin, this, this entire map is his little play palace for now. He just needs to make sure not to micro into the Spore Colors to lose them. But, I mean, he can find sweet spots to attack. Might be able to take out a Roach Warren, something like that. Maybe attack the Gas if he can get the positioning right. And that is just straight up frustrating. It will be up to Spanishua to uh, attack. You can see uh, Spanishua had three Gas on the way at the same time as well. Not going to be able to get any drones here, which is really unfortunate. Odin wants to delay that drone advantage. 42 drones to 20. Showing you that Spanishua says, okay, lots of static defenses and queens, and that will allow me to hold it off just fine for now. Although there is three queens on the field for Spanishua, which is enough to prevent these mutilists from completely killing him. However, it is allowing Odin to get map presence. Odin is moving out with some spine crawlers here. What is he going to do with this? Looks like Spishwa's Light doesn't know either. Does have his own spine crawlers on the way. And we do have this Overlord Spewing Creep. Is he going to burrow these right here and try and set up some sort of Zerg Terran style contain where instead of siege tanks, you do have spine crawlers, which is what we're seeing right now. 52 supply to 71. He is going to try and burrow these. Don't know if the Mutalists are going to be able to kill off all these roaches, but they the time is running out for Spishwa to kill off these spine crawlers. There is four of them right here. The roaches are almost all dead. We have seen Transfuse being used, though. One queen going down. This extremely vital for Odin to do a lot of damage here. He wants to kill drones off these drones completely undefended except for one of the Spore Callers. However, the Beatles just can't do enough damage here to these units and the Queen's now completely out of energy. There is enough for one heal remaining. Is there going to be enough reinforcements? The Spine Cards have been poking away this entire time, barely in range of that hatchery and they do additional damage to that hatchery. So that is definitely not a good position to be in as the hatchery will most likely go down, poking away a couple of drones as well. Both those drones exploding at the same time. The Mutal is trying to do as much damage as possible. Our blue player needs to make sure to keep spending all of his resources to do as much damage to this army as possible. Spanishua trying to break the contained with mass roach, but the hatchery has gone down. The broodlings causing a lot of damage there. And during that, our Zerg player just been cranking out a couple more Mutalists. We do have a nice room though for Spanishua and there is an overlord right here to spot it. So if these roaches get inside the main base, I don't know if Odin will have enough Mutas on the field to deal with it. And now his spine cars will begin taking damage as they are now off of that creep. No, they unburrow and are going to move out. But what a brilliant way to break that. The Nidus Worm is on the way. Is this envisioned? No, it is not, as the Overlord is going to be allowing the Nidus Worm to be just out of range, as the Nidus Worms do not need to be on creep. Here comes Roaches unloading inside the main base. Odin is going to face palm. However, he can easily transfer his drones to his natural to save them. That's exactly what he's going to do. And the Queen's joining in in the fight, and that means there's going to be more anti-air. And guess what? Spanishiwa says, what you do to me, I will do in a much bigger way, as he does have Spine Crawlers and Spore Crawlers here to attack this main base and Spanishua trying to do as much damage as he can. He did kill the Spire so there'll be no more Mutalists but a lot of Zerglings are going to be spawning as well. He needs to kill these Queens. That is it. The Queens do not have enough energy to heal. One Queen is going to go down. Second Queen quickly diminishes. Drones now pulled off the line to try to engage this. However, the static defenses are finishing inside of his base. The Mutalists want to kill off these Queens first though but they're taking so much damage from the Spore Crawlers. All the Mutalists go down except for one and now the Drones not able to do as much damage there. Roaches may be in range of the Spire it's hard to tell in the positioning if they will be able to. Yes, the Spire, or not Spire, but Lair, excuse me, will be able to go down. The Spine Car trying to burrow, 
but it is a little too late. And now Spanishiwa is killing the uh, main base with Spycar. He's going to be killing that lair. Odin says, haha, nice, which I think is absolutely true. And hyper nice. Good, well played. What a manner player from Odin. Um, Odin, I think, thought he had it, but this is why you can never uh, sit back when you have your opponent contained because they can do things like that. So phenomenal play by Spanishwa. I also got to hand it to Odin. I really like the idea of using those spine crawlers to break that natural, very creative play. And with these close spawn locations, it's something that it works very effectively just because you can get those drones and spine crawlers there quickly. So yeah, guys, if you would like to check out my new site, it would be awesome. It is just nerdyshore.com. It is mainly focusing on forums, but you're also getting article writers for esports news as well as tracking all the upcoming tournaments and things like that. So always a work in progress, but if nothing else, if you guys can just check it out and leave feedback, we do have a thread on the forums for leaving feedback. I'm really curious what you guys think. I am trying very hard to make an awesome website for gamers and my fan base to kind of hang out and have fun. I do like this double, double Evo Chamber here. He had the plus two attack uh, done as well as the one armor. So his roaches were beefy. 2-1 going against those just, just those Zerglings. And the one thing I think Odin, the biggest mistake was just losing those Zerglings. I think it was what, right here? Or wherever it was, maybe over here. Trying to get the surround on those roaches. I, I, I really think that that's what ended up costing him because he, he didn't have a beefy ground army like he wanted to while Spanishua was able to get those upgrades like crazy. And then Nidus Worm, a bunch of drones into his main player's base. Not something you will see every day, folks. Only when you are watching a Spanishua game. And, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time. Hello, everyone. This is HD Eskieski here, and I am back with some more StarCraft II action. This time, it is going to be more games showcasing Tasia spawning up in the top left side. It is going to be his Korean Zerg opponent. Yet another TVZ out of him, and Next Tasia is going to be up in the top right side. But guess what? His name is no longer Next Tasia. It is Liquid Tasia. For those of you who did not see the most recent games on my channel, he is now officially a member of Team Liquid. And what's more is that if you're not a fan of this guy, well, I think he is going to make a lot of the doubters uh, basically look like fools because recently he just played in Code S for the GSL and has advanced to the round of 16. And guess what, guys? In that group that he was playing, he beat two previous GSL champions in one night. So if that isn't good enough for winning a GSL overall, then I don't know what is. He is going to be joining Liquid Hero in the round of 16 as well. I don't know who to cheer for between Tasia and Liquid Hero, as I absolutely love Liquid Hero. You guys know he's one of my favorite Protoss out there. And I was reading through a lot of the comments, and apparently I wasn't casting TBZ as much as people would like. So I figured, hey, why not cast one more TBZ, especially with the micro that we saw out of Liquid Tasia in that last game. If you guys did not see that, he was so far behind. But with some crazy marine micro, he was able to hang on. I honestly, if I was in his situation, probably would have left the game quite a while ago. So I'm not quite sure what to expect in this game. But uh, you, you remember me mentioning before, Tasia doesn't have too much experience in the GSL as far as doing exceptionally well. But now all of a sudden, he's in the round of 16. Now getting to the round of 8 would be absolutely huge for him. And really the round of 4 is where you can just feel so badass because you're just one step away from making it to the finals round of four would be an extremely good pickup for a liquid very good for Tasia as well as there is a lot of money on the line regardless of if you get first place or fourth place still uh, quite a bit of money floating around in StarCraft 2 if you guys haven't looked at the websites where you can check how much players have made there are players out there pulling in six figures quite easily quite a few actually I think are a hundred thousand plus which is just amazing and does look like Tasia going to be scouting out here. The timing is going to be spot on. He's going to see everything that's going on. And once again, going to be going for the Reaper Expand. This is so interesting to me because I, I'm curious to see how well a Zergling early timing would work out. But then again, getting out one Reaper can clean up those Zerglings with ease. So maybe this is some uh, StarCraft II metagaming we got going on here with Tasia going for the Reapers almost every single time and is going to be expanding on the back of this. Now the Reaper on this map can be super effective because it's such a short route to the Zerg player's main base. I would highly recommend this build versus Zerg, especially if you are in these spawn locations. 
But we'll see how well this Reaper does. Two Zerglings will be on the way. One drone dies almost immediately and has to be careful here with the Reaper. He wants to keep it alive as long as he possibly can. You have to remember that he also needs to continue macroing on the back of this. And you're going to leave the Zerglings right here so that the Reaper cannot jump up there. will instead force him to run down and around, which will just buy the Zerg player a little bit more time to go ahead and make up those Zergling numbers if he needs them. Which right now, we do not see Zergling speed on the way from our Zerg player, but he does have enough drones and gas that he could begin that right away if he decides to, and I think that that would be a smart choice given that there are Reapers on the map. And getting out that Zergling speed will indeed help deal with that. And there we go, Zergling speed is on the way. Is he gonna pull off the drones? Has left one drone on gas, and the rest have gone to mining minerals. This poor queen will get blasted away eventually by these Reapers. Um, unless the Zerglings can set up a perfect attack here, but I don't know if they focus down the Zerglings, they will be able to one-shot them, considering that he does have those two Reapers out. And this can be so frustrating for Zerg. Um, this is why we saw Terran players go for Reapers quite a while ago, and then they kind of nerfed the Reaper timing as far as, you know, being able to proxy those Reapers and things like that by making it so you need a supply depot before barracks. A lot of Terran players were upset about that, but then that means that they transitioned away from doing Reaper play. But it does look like Tasia wanting to bring it back, wanting to try and punish Zergs who macro too hard. And how many workers did he kill? He did manage to kill two workers right there, a total of three workers overall. He is behind in supply, but that's to kind of be expected. Zerg do have to make out a lot of queens, which uh, take up some pretty quick supply. Plus, Tasia did decide to expand here. So that means that, you know, most of the supply he's using is SCVs, which only take up that one supply. And he is going to be completing a wall in here with his engineering bay. What does his opponents have going on here? Well, his expansion is quite heavily saturated right there. And his main base pretty saturated as well. So is he going to take a third base? Is he going to throw down multiple geysers? Well, he does have the two geysers on the way. The Reapers need to be careful there. Good micro by Tasia to keep them alive while killing off yet another Zergling. And can he manage to do it? He does manage to get this round on one of them. The other Reaper on the high ground will most likely stay up there, at least for now, because he needs to be careful flying that away. I guess if he wants to jump down and then retreat, he would be able to pull that one off. But uh, the Zerglings in the center of the map are going to give our Zerg player the confidence that he needs to go ahead and macro up here. So he's making big waves of drones. He's also working on getting out his lair tech. Now sometime within the one next one to two minutes, I'm assuming our Zerg player is going to expand because he didn't get out a Spire ridiculously early or anything like that, like you would see off of two base Muta. And there goes down the macro hatch, which is kind of the bare minimum that he does need to do now. And is he going to throw down the Spire? That is what I'm curious to see once this lair is done. He does have Banelings on the way, which Banelings do complement Mutalisks quite well as the Marines are trying to micro away from everything. A lot of times they will get blown up by those Banelings, and indeed the Spire is going to go down. Currently two base Muta, which is something that I have seen a lot of Koreans do. They really like this style. It does rely on micro quite a bit. Speaking of micro, we have some Creep Tumor micro going on. Creep spread out towards the center of the map by our Zerg player. And one thing about this map is you always want to try and go all three routes if possible. And what I mean by that, we can go right through the middle, the top, and the bottom. The reason that's important is because this is the only thing in the way of getting a complete surround on your opponent in the center of the map if you time everything out perfectly. So uh, that is definitely a good play here by our Zerg player. We do have no upgrades for Tasia. He does have the plus one attack on the way, but he is going to move out with a lot of Marines. Is he going to expand on this? It does not look like it. It looks like he is just going to go for it, and that might prove to be quite difficult. Um, for the Zerg player to hold off. Have you ever realized that the M's on here look like the Monster Energy Drink logo on their shields? I guess they are sponsored by Monster. It is the uh, the little symbol that you can pick there. It totally looks like Monster Energy. does cancel, I believe, the Creep Tumors so that he can rebuild them back here. And this is most likely when the scan is going to go down. A Zerg player is usually not going to try and crush this. But uh, also a Terran player usually doesn't send out this much, although he is splitting up his Marines quite well. Oh my goodness, these Creep Tumors are about to get completely annihilated. Here comes the scan. Is the Zerg going to be able to hold this off? And there's the scan. Look at that. Never have I seen so many Creep Tumors die immediately. It does look like that's going to make the Zerg player really, really angry. And the Banelings will get focused down right away. I don't think a single Baneling is going to hit. A couple of Marines do get taken out, but the amount of Creep Tumors he killed off and the unit's loss is almost identical. That that was absolutely worth it. Now he's got to drop and abuse this high ground location, taking out the Overlord that's in range. 
and these Marines. The plus one attack is done. And remember, they can load up inside those medevacs, and they will, I believe. One or two Marines does go down, though. So Teja is extending himself outwards quite a bit. And the Mutalists are here to shoot down the medevacs. He does need to unload them right now. Tries to make it to the high ground to do as much damage as he possibly can. And he will do just a little bit of damage to those Mutas. But uh, overall, Teja overstayed his welcome. I don't think he was expecting the uh, Mutalists to be out at that timing. But uh, indeed, they were able to clean that up. So even though the Zerg player lost the battle in the center, he is overall going to be winning on the Eunice loss, killing off that Reaper as well. Plus, he is going to force Tasia to throw down some missile turrets, which he does not have in position just yet. So he is going to be a little bit vulnerable here. Needs to be careful with the Mutas. And Tasia, you got to remember, he does have four reactors here. So if these go undefended, there's even one right there, five reactors. So he can make a lot of Marines, but that also means that he is very vulnerable to Mutalisks in his base while he is out of position because he can focus down the reactors and then immediately cut his production in half which is not a good situation to be in. The Mutalist not going to be able to kill off this command center, I don't think. Although he is kind of flying it at a weird angle. But that does mean our Zerg player knows that Tage is looking for a third base. He is securing his own third base right here. And you can see that a lot of drones are going to be at this location. 74 drones to 63 workers. You want to try and get around 80 workers as, I would say, any race. 80 is going to be a pretty solid number in most situations, and that is exactly what both these players are attempting to do. Tasia is making a lot of SCVs, though, continuing that production two at a time. Could very well make three at a time, and he is. The plus one, plus one is done, which means plus two, plus two is going to be followed up right away here. Our Zerg player needs to make as many uses as he can. He's going to decide to go for it. I don't know if this is the right choice, but he is indeed going to way, way overextend in the center. Thankfully for him, he did not lose those banelings. That's going to be the important factor in this upcoming battle. And we do need to see more upgrades for these units. We do have the plus one attack for not only the ground melee, but also for air units. And a very interesting creep spread up here. I guess he went up this route and then had nowhere else to go. And where did he place that? He's going to work his way back down there. And needs to be careful with the mutas, though. Does end up losing one. And he is going to be flying into the main base right here. And is he going to be able to do that much damage? Well, there is the one turret there. The SCVs can't really get a good surround to repair it as the positioning was not the best. The Marines will be able to hold this off for now, though. It's really this army in the middle of the map that's making me a little bit nervous for Tasia because if our Zerg player gets a huge swell of Zerglings, then it could be all over. We do have the plus one armor on the way for Mutas. Going to be killing off a couple of the SCVs, and they are grouped up quite heavily here. So some nice harassment by our Zerg player. He's killed so many SCVs here. Tasia losing 19 workers, now 20. But it looks like he is going to go for it in the center of the map. Our Zerg player trying to multitask as best he can. And can he get out any different tech units here by the time this attack happens? I don't know. It does look like a couple overlords may go down. And the Mutalists are now attacking the main base, killing off lots and lots of SCVs. Tasia really needs to pull it together if he wants to keep his economy going. Oh, the Mutalists do decide to stay and attack those 2-2 Marines. I guess currently right now they're 2-1. Soon to be 2-2, though. And there we go. The Mutalists once again do flock away. Now, at this stage of the game, a Zerg player has to think, do I switch tech or go for it? It looks like he is going to go for it, running all the way through the center. 178 supply to 150. Can't take advantage to do it. He's microing further and further back, trying to split up his Marines as best he possibly can. And the Baneling's not able to get in the best hits, but uh, these Marines having a terrifying time here trying to hold off this attack. It does look like the expansion is going to fall, but this is a lot of Marines. Can he micro them around once again, trying to split them up? Not able to avoid those Banelings, though, but a seemingly endless stream of Marines are coming down here because of those massive amounts of reactors. It is 97 supply to 140, though, for our Zerg player. What is that queen doing there? She gets completely obliterated, and the unit count, 36 SCBs to a lot of workers for our Zerg player. Look at this, 50 workers killed by our Zerg player. Absolutely outstanding. Tasia in a complete world of hurt. I don't know how he's going to come back from this one. He does have an upgrade advantage, though, with the 2-2. Our Zerg player scrambling to try and get enough units out to defend against this. I think he does have it, though. He does have 1-1 one, one attack and armor as well. So that means those Banelings are going to be doing additional damage versus the Marines. Tasia, I don't know, don't count him out yet, but he did take severe losses there. I think most players would have lost the game by now, but we'll see exactly how this goes. He cannot afford to lose the SMBs. You can see him trying to save them immediately. Still ends up losing one, though, and uh, could go for some uh, supply depots here, or the engineering bay would be a nice pickup. 
If he can kill it off with that plus three, that would be huge. He knows it, he wants it. Can he actually kill it off though? The Marines are gonna go down. We do see a big push in the center of the map. I'm really curious on this engineering base, so I'm gonna keep it selected, but here comes the push forward, and the engineering bay does go down, so no plus three for Tasia, even though that was dangerously close to completing for a Zerg player, and he does have about a 60 supply lead, but can he hang on to it? It looks like so far the answer is yes. The Muse in the main base, though, taking a lot of damage. He needs to back him out as the Marines do show up. The armory has been destroyed. That means he will have to rebuild that in order to get those upgrades. We do see a drop up here. But it does evacuate on out of there. The Beatles gonna try and kill it off. The medevac barely dropping in the correct position here. So our Zerg player, man, he is given Tasia a run for his money. But Tasia's positioning is outstanding with the siege tanks and the Marines. This is his last ditch effort as the expansion over here has been completely taken out as well. Every single SCV getting annihilated. 58 workers have been killed off, now 60. And the drones, no, you don't want to engage here. These Marines will be able to kill off all of these drones. Although I guess they have done too many drugs. Remember guys, don't do drugs as it does make you vulnerable to drone attacks. Actually seeing those Marines get killed by the drones was absolutely huge. At the same time, he is trying to bust down the ramp. Can Tasia hold here? He does have quite a few Marines, but this is so many mutilists. I don't even think his micro can save him at this point. Completely stuck on these three bases, but that's not going to stop him from producing eight Marines at a time. Well, our Zerg player, man is able to re-macro on the back of this. Yes, he did lose some workers, but considering he has killed 61, then Tasia going to be in such great shape here. And, uh, or no, not Tasia, excuse me, our Zerg player in great shape. The Siege Tanks do have plus one. The Armory died before the plus two was done, but uh, Siege Tanks going to still be very effective with splash damage versus those Lings. Just gotta be careful because Siege Tanks not in Siege mode are just going to do absolutely nothing versus the cost efficiency of the Zergling. But right now we do see a lot of Mutalists now on the field for our Zerg player. No surprise though, he also found a weakness in Tasia right now in that most of his army is down here. So if he can attack a different location, he should be in okay shape. But the plus two, plus three nearly done. Of course that plus three attack is going to have to be restarted. We do have the plus two attack for Siege Tanks on the way. Our Zerg is at two attack, one armor, which at this time in the game, you would really expect to be seeing more, but he is doing a good job of taking these bases, could potentially go for a fifth base as well here. One thing he does have to watch out for though is just the fact that the Marines can be so cost effective. If he doesn't watch his Mutalist, he's gonna be in a lot of trouble. Does find a medevac here to clean up, and that is indeed going to get cleaned out, and the Marines do stem forward. Tasia chasing these Mutalists all over the field. So even though he is losing a medevac here and there, he has managed to set up in the center of the map. I feel like a Zerg player could just go for it right now and kill off this entire army. He may not realize just how vulnerable Tasia is right now in the center of the map. He's kind of a sitting duck here. And unless he attacks before the siege tanks go, though, it's not going to be that cost effective for a Zerg player. But he is maxed out now with the 200 supply. And Tasia leapfrogging forward. This is probably the worst time for him to go. That is so many mutalists. Oh my god. And it does look like here we go. Where the mutas at? Need to be careful of those Thors. As, yeah, he decides not to engage right there. A very tense moment for both players. But you got to remember that every second that goes by, Tasia is slowly getting back in this game. And what I mean by that is since our Zerg player is maxed out, he can't make any more stuff. Which means that Tasia can still make stuff which makes the lead of the Zerg player substantially less, although he is working on lowering that supply over and over again. Could even kill off this command center. I don't think there's a reason to. Killing off the armory would be nice. That plus two attack would help in this push a great deal, especially for the Thors and the tanks as well, of course. But here we go. Can he do it? He needs to get some good Banelings hits here. The positioning of Tasia is phenomenal, but it's, uh, I don't even know if this Thor is going to survive. Somehow Tasia is hanging on. Our Zerg player now at about a 40 supply lead. And the Mutalist, did he lose a lot of these during that? I can't imagine how he would have. Tasia may be able to do the impossible here, but for now the Zerg player is still rolling in some Banelings. Has taken out those Siege Tanks. And what is happening here is Tasia actually pushing out into the center of the map. His third base way oversaturated, but he really doesn't have anywhere else to mine. How is the income looking for both of these players? Outstandingly good for our Zerg. Uh-oh, these drones need to get out of there and look at how well both these players are macroing keeping their resources under a hundred under 50 a lot of the time but Tasia is going to be moving out here and busting up the ramp where are the Zerg units this Baneling no does not get a massive hit and I don't know what's happening here but pure mutalist versus pure marine 
means that the Marines will indeed win. We need to see some Baneling landmines is what we need. But right now the Zerg player is just streaming these units in one by one, not able to regroup here. And the Marines are now on the ramp, so there's not much room to micro. But the Siege Tank is in a beautiful position. Still a big supply lead for our Zerg, but those Banelings not doing what they need to. And uh-oh, it's the situation we've seen Idra in before, where it's just pure Muta versus Marines with the two attack, three armor. Is Tasia actually going to win this? This is ridiculous. I thought for sure this Zerg player had this game completely on lock and key but evidently not as he is trying to rebuild as best he can. We are 25 minutes into this game. I think this shows you the importance of upgrade in this matchup and really in every matchup. And some long distance mining going on and there's the command center right there having to land away from the creep. Does our Zerg player have any tech that is not currently destroyed? Does have the Infestors and he was able to get out four Infestors before that dies. Does need to remake a spawning pool though. And even though Tasia is mining on a singular base, which is long distance mines. Um, but since our Zerg player has no tech, he is gonna be in a lot of trouble. He's trying to hold on as long as he can, but the Infestors I do not believe have pathogen glands. Um, yes, they do. He can actually fungal here. Can he get the good fungal though? He really needs a fungal on these Marines and he's gonna go for it. Does get one fungal and the second fungal right there to that big group of Marines. But the Mutalists are taking so much damage. He needs to back out and let the fungal do their thing. And indeed he's not gonna, oh, there's so few Marines left, three Marines, but they all had their own personal medevac army to heal them. That one Marine trying to hang on as long as he possibly can. And this game is going to continue as the Mutalists, if they kill off these medevacs, that's gonna really hurt Tasia because he cannot afford to reproduce these at the rate that he would like. And he's still long distance mining right here with this command center, but he has so many SCVs, he doesn't even need to lift it off. Oh my goodness, look at the units tab here. 26 Marines to 14 Mutas, not a single Zergling on the field. 26 are on the way though. And still uh, really kill it, preventing that plus three attack from finishing has really helped out the Zerg player here. Another infestation pit is on the way and he would love to get out some more investors here. I don't think he has any investors remaining, but this could be the last push, the last attack for Tasia as he does not have a whole lot of money left. Here comes the drones down to try to engage this. It looks like the drones will be absorbing some of the damage. The siege tanks though will be killing off the Marines here if he's not careful. No, it does go down. Tasia trying to evacuate with what few units he has remaining and a few units indeed. Although he does still have 29 Marines overall, this is still anybody's game. Tasia has indeed lifted this off. He's gonna be flying down here as well. Look at this, has relocated his base three different times and has landed now down in the bottom right side. Needs to transfer over a bunch of those workers. He has a nice little group of them are going to begin mining, but uh, I don't know. Our Zerg player has got to get some Baneling hits off. I don't think he even has a Baneling nest though. And this is not looking good for our Zerg player. He does have quite a few Mutas, but they're just not what he needs here. He could, uh, no, I guess he can't attack from the high ground because the medevacs will spot the Mutas. Um, I don't know, man, Tasia's scanning. He's got to like what he sees, and soon it's going to be a bunch of dead drones. And considering we never saw any more Infestors and no more Banelings, there's no way to deal with these Marines in a cost-effective way. It looks like he's going to go for it with the drones. The Muta's taking so much damage, Jack. He folks firing them down there, popping left and right, which means that the drones are just going to be in the meat grinder. And can Tasia actually do this? What is going on with this game? I do not understand StarCraft 2 anymore and has left the game. Indeed, this game, oh my god. I cannot believe that. And this is why Tasia currently defeating two former GSL champions. La I believe it was like, what, last night, a couple of days ago. And now is in the round of 16 of the GSL. Wow. Absolutely outstanding play by Tasia. I cannot believe that he managed to win this game. I thought for sure, 100%, that he lost. And he did indeed not lose. I am speechless. This is one of my favorite StarCraft 2 games that I've cast in a long, long time. Definitely share this one with your friends. Oh my god, what a good TVZ. So, I, I kind of think it goes without saying. Hope you guys enjoy it. And of course, I'll see you guys next time. Oh my god, that game was so good. Oh, it was so good. I don't even know if anyone's still watching, but where was it that those Mutalisks, I don't, I don't even remember where it was because this game was so long, 30 minutes long, but uh, the Mutas, man, were pretty good by our Zerg player, and I'm kind of curious on the upgrades right at the end. 
I'm in like normal talking mode right now. I'm not even, not even shout casting bra. He does have two attack, one armor, but the two, three right there. Upgrades are so important. So, so very important. Anyways, bye bye. Hello, everyone. This is HGS Yaski here back with some more StarCraft 2 Heartless Swarm 1v1 action. You guys know what time it is. Uh, well, it's 1v1 action time. Whatever, you guys. You guys are too smart for me. Anyway, spawning down the bottom right side, it is going to be E.G. Suppy and his opponent up on the top left side, having played like 95% of the games in Grandmaster League by himself. It is going to be the Notorious Barcode. Now, uh, a lot of you may be wondering, if you're new to StarCraft, what the hell is this guy's name and why does he play all three races? Well, this is a little something that players do uh, on StarCraft in that they will make a Smurf account, quote-unquote. I, I guess we'll call it a Smurf account. And uh, they basically make their name that so they blend in with all the other ones. So if they're practicing for a tournament, if they're working on a build order, if they just want to ladder in uh, peace or, or if they're playing an opponent and they don't want them to know their play style going into it. Like if you're Idra and you are matched against someone and they recognize the name, they're going to have a good indication of your play style. Same thing with like, I think the Muslim is a great example. I mean, he tends to play a very macro oriented style. So if you're going up against him, you kind of may have an advantage for knowing what his strengths and weaknesses are. So I think in a game like StarCraft, uh, it's one of those things where I'm kind of torn on this, and I'm kind of curious as to what your guys' thoughts are. Uh, yeah, you know, number one, as a spectator, it can be kind of annoying uh, to watch a game and not really know who's playing. It could be barcode versus barcode, for all we know. It could be a silver level player versus... Uh, the bronze, I don't know. It basically, anyone can make this name. Uh, but on the flip side, I always try and think of it from the player's perspective. You know, your your livelihood is in this game, so you want to do everything you can to get an advantage. And uh, I don't think there's a lot of other games that do this. Um, so I'm trying to think of, like, if, if, a, if a player would ever do this in a first-person shooter, in a MOBA-style game, in, uh, in a fighting-type game, or anything like that. Um, the thing is, though, is that... In my opinion, those games are a lot more Twitch-based, a lot more reaction-based, whereas StarCraft, there is so much relying on the build order, on, on doing things that your opponent uh, can't really... Let's see, I'm trying to think, because there's so much in the play style and all that, so I, I kind of understand where the players are coming from when they make barcode accounts, whereas, say, if you're playing Counter-Strike and you see a pro player and you're like, oh my god, it's my favorite pro player. Well, you already know what he's got to do. He's got to shoot you in the head from across the map and you're going to die every time. Whereas in StarCraft, it, there's a lot more to it than just having fast reactions. Your build order is so very important and really it kind of carries the game. So uh, either way, what are your guys' thoughts on the barcode accounts, guys? I want to know. I want to know. I don't care if you're in Bronze League or Grandmaster League. I want to hear. I don't even care if you don't own the game. I want to hear it. Give me your thoughts right now. But uh, either way, Barcode, speaking of the devil, is going to be going for a uh, Command Center first series. He's got his bunker down at the entrance of his base. No big surprise there. Uh, at the same time, Suppy right now is going to be working on two queens. Now, basically what we're going to be seeing here after these two queens spawn is, is he going to go for another base? He's going to have about 300 mils. Oh, he just spent a bunch more. Or is he going to go for two more queens? Looks like number one. Uh, he's got a third queen. And there we go. Fourth queen's on the way. Th that's kind of the, the best option right now is either going to be going for a third base or going for the double queens. And you may be looking at this and be like, why would you want two queens over a base? Well, keep in mind that creep spread is ridiculously important, especially in a large map like, uh, like Frost here. As if you do not have good creep spread, you're not going to have much map presence, roaches, hydras. Uh, really, the majority of your army is not going to be mobile enough unless you're just going pure zergling mutilisk, which is not... Not recommended. Uh, you at least have to mix in some banelings. Sometimes you want to mix in ultras and things like that. Either way, the creep spread's important on a large map like this. Honestly, on a smaller map, I would say it's not as important um, as it is on a map like this, where there's so many different ways that you have to start spreading that creep. And remember that creep is map hacks. Obviously, it's, it's balanced map hacks, but if you have the entire map covered, just like any other unit or building, you're going to be able to see exactly what's going on. So, uh, Double Queen there, I think, is a good choice if you have the APM for it. If you're more of a safe player, just go for the early third. But uh, it does look like Suppy's going to be falling up the third. After those Double Queens, here comes the Creep Tumors right here. And uh, I want to know, is his Creep Spread going to be a thing of beauty? Or is it going to be uh, mediocre? We'll, we'll find out. I know Suppy is one of the best players out there right now uh, as far as foreign Zergs are concerned. But we'll see. We shall see. Starport on the way. Viking. In production, a couple of Hellions going to be chilling out over here, and uh, Barcode could be moving out with this. He could also go for a Command Center, 
if he wants to. Looks like the Overlord right here is going to be seeing everything that's going on, though. I think he's even going to be seeing the Starport here. And uh, he's got to know that, well, is the Viking going to spawn, though? That's the real question here. We'll see if he spots this or not. Because, you know, if you don't see the actual Viking itself spawn... Oh, my God, the Overlord might actually spot it. The Marines over here giving up completely... Two shots away from dying, and he did see the Viking, I think, for a split second, if he was paying attention. If not, it doesn't really matter, because he still scoured the entire base. The two Hellions down here, though, are going to be roasting away the hatchery. Now, I don't know if roasting away is the correct term. It's more just, like, slightly annoying it, because Hellions just do not do that much damage to buildings. Queens are going to be headed this way, but really the Hellions would love to delay the creep tumors if possible, and they are going to be seeing that creep tumor right there. The Queen chilling out there, though, so I think Barcode knows kind of what's going on here. The two Queens are going to kind of bully this lane, uh basically this lane of entrance to the natural and there's not a whole lot else that these Hellions can do because again the, the Queens are starting to pay off they're starting to pay dividends the creep spread is already over here so if the Hellions try and sneak into the natural then uh, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. If they try and go down to that third base, they're going to be in a lot of trouble as well. So, uh, great play here by Seppi so far. Uh, I do like this Viking, though. He's on the hunt for Overlords. Not sure if he's going to be finding too many or not. Looks like he might be able to spot these two. Does get the one here, and that's going to be several kills for that Viking, especially if he spots the right side. Keep in mind that Vikings do additional armor versus, uh, or additional damage versus armored units. They don't, they don't give you armor. They do additional damage to armor. But, uh, either way, oh, he finds two more Overlords right now. So this is actually uh, not good for Sup here. Really, if the Vikings kill a lot of air units, that is very, very good for Terran. Whereas compared to kind of like a, a Phoenix or something, where you see Protoss go Phoenix, uh, they need to kill air units. Really, this Viking doesn't need to kill that much because he's going to be much more useful for a, a Terran player. Now, he just needs to make sure to keep it alive. The more scouting he can do, the better. Looks like there's a Christmas tree down here with some fancy little presents and even lights right there. Hellion's going to be continuing to harass right now. Medivac going to be moving out with two Widow Mines here. And again, this is a note to Terran and Protoss players. This is the kind of stuff you have to do to be... Oh! Okay, well, he killed that creep tumor with his own uh, with his own roach there. Uh, really, Suppy showing us that he's not messing around. He is not gonna put it past killing his own uh, his own units to to prove a to prove a point. But so either way, there is gonna be a drop down here at the natural. Widow mines will be activated. Should get a couple of hits on the drones. I don't even know if transferring away is gonna be that ideal right now. We'll see if the splash damage is that bad. It does look like a uh, four kills there. And widow mine there. Oh my god. Uh, where is that Widow Mine? I, don't, I, uh, I couldn't see exactly how many kills it had, but that was a lot. does kill off a lot of those Zerglings. I, was it worth it? We're about to find out. Yes, it was. Even after losing the Medivac and the Viking, he was able to do enough damage there. How many workers were killed overall? Ten. Ten workers killed so far. So uh, I got to say, Barco looking to be in pretty good shape. And now he's going to be going for the counterattack at the third base. Ah, the Creep Tumor is actually delaying that push. He wants to be going straight for the drones if possible. Sure, he's delaying the Creep Spread, but guess what? That means the Roaches are going to have time to get over here. Now they're going to get a big surround, and the Roach is going to be able to clean these up or at least scare them away. I mean, there's only three left. That is a devastating loss there. He could have gotten in that drone line for a couple of seconds. If nothing else, though, he is delaying the Creep Spread at one angle, which, again, Creep Spread is vitally important, especially as a Terran player. You try and find ways around it, but eventually you're just going to have to start pushing that Creep back. That is all there is to it. I do like the... Uh the Hellion's kind of chilling right here. That is that is a no man's land. If you were Zerglings, you'd not want to be running around that way. But it does look like two SCVs are going to be going in here. I assume this is intentional to start trying to scout around. Uh, honestly, you know, scouting with SCVs are a very cheap way to see what's going on. He was able to spot those Banelings if he was paying attention. And this SCV is actually going to make it back home. I don't know if he meant to have this many SCVs. This might be a slight mistake, as there was three across the map. But either way, was able to get some scouting in. And uh, it does look like a bunker on the way. Pretty good angle here. So if the uh, units exactly like this start to run around the corner, then they can just get intercepted by that bunker as they run down that ramp. I do like this as well. Going to be throwing down supply depots to wall this off. Apparently, does that really only take two supply depots? Yes, it does. If you place them correctly, you can wall it off with two supply depots. Suppy, is he killing another creep tumor? He's not messing around, man. He will kill off all y'all's creep tumors. I'm not sure what the point of that is. I feel like the first one was a mistake. That one seemed very, very deliberate. But uh, maybe maybe he's just got the uh, the shaky fingers right now as uh, he's trying to deal with all of this pressure. Resources lost, though, has evened up in a big way. And uh, considering our Terran player is just now getting his third base, that actually that actually bodes well for him because he's got to be mining off the same amount of bases as Suppy. Suppy has started a fourth base, but this is by no means ahead. This is by no means a comfortable spot for Suppy to be in. Viking right now continuing to hunt these overlords here, getting more and more map vision in the Terran's favor, which is always a struggle. Super, super important as, uh, oh, oh, looks like the uh, Viking there is going to be spotting these mutas and not able to do all that much. 
other than by a little bit of time there. But uh, either way, not a lot of map vision for Suffy. If we go to Suff, uh, Suffy's map vision here, you can see that there's really not all that much here. Sure, you can see this possible fourth base right there. But at the same time, he's got to deal with this push coming out. Now, at the same, same time, though, it looks like Barcode, even though he has a supply advantage, he's going to have to worry about a massive counterattack, which is exactly what's gearing up over here. All right, it's not massive, okay? But there could be massive damage dealt if those Vainleys go unchecked. So I'm kind of surprised to see Barcode move out with uh, so many of these units. We'll see exactly how this pans out. He does have a good fanning on his units here and uh, is going to be able to reduce the amount of incoming damage. You need to make sure, though, to ungroup this big ball back here. And really, at this point, as Terran, it's all about keeping your army split up. Uh, you know, you would think in the military you want to stay as close together to have each other's back, but no, when there are banelings everywhere, you want to split up and fan out. I, I, I don't know. I think the term fan out is the best way to, to describe it. And here's that counterattack I was talking about. The supply depot was lowered. Even if it wasn't, though, he would have taken lots of damage here because he had no units back at home before defense. He is going to end up losing this natural or at least a lot of the workers there. Oh, my God. The stem may have been a little bit too late. He's got to try and split as best as possible he can. The bailing hits, though, a little bit out of control. But guess what? Marine and Rod are pretty good. Two attack, one armor. Going up against just the two armor on those roaches. That means they are not having the DPS output that they would like at all. Big scans coming up to see where that army is at. It's less to see uh, where the creep tubers are at and more to make sure he doesn't have a huge amount of banelings crashing down on him. But so far, he's going to be able to do lots of damage to these roaches as Suppy needs to get something going on. It does look like the Mutilus may be the answer. They've even up the supply, but these last few units are just being so cost effective as uh, they finish off a lot of these drones here. The Mutilus is going to be able to kill off everything. Medivacs here can boost away, but for how long? And Well, apparently not hardly at all, as they do get taken out right there. Widowmine here in position, trying to detonate that on the Mutas. Not going to get that lucky. Keep in mind, though, that Mutalists do begin regenerating HP while out of combat much quicker than any other unit uh, for the Zerg here. You can see 60 HP, and it just goes up basically every second. But for now, it does look like Barcode has at least stabilized after those initial re uh, resources lost on those workers. You can see 20 workers killed to 16, so, you know, he even the tables, uh, well, I was going to say a little bit, but that's a lot. Only seven resources difference right there. Showing us that this is basically a virtually tied ball game. And uh, the thing is, though, that, I mean, just look at look at where Suppy is economically. Sure, he's got four bases, but can you really consider that a fourth base when he's only mining with a handful of drones? Uh, I would say that, again, this game is basically tied. Given the uh, given the circumstances, I would say we essentially have a tied game. But either way, Widow Mine's gonna be chilling out over here, going for Bio Mine. You know, it is a pretty good choice. Um, if you're wondering why the Marauders are in there, ooh, Baneling Landmines. Gotta love good old Baneling Landmines, man. Look at these two. They're, they're, these guys just want to be friends, man. They're sitting here. They're like, hey, Larry. Hey, Larry, how's it going over there? Oh, you know, you know, Henry. It's just being a Baneling. You know, if they come over here, we gotta detonate. We got to die. Oh, hang on. I hear that Sarah Sarah over there might be detonating. Does she decide to? No, not today, Larry. Not today. But either way, it is going to be a big push forward. Got to keep an eye on those Baneling landmines. But at the same time, what are the upgrades at? 2-2 two, two is done. Mutalist only has a plus one attack. Lings do have now 2-2, two, two, which makes the uh, Banelings do even more damage as well. Big Baneling hit right there. Subby trying to control to the best of his ability, but you got to remember, if he loses this fourth base, he loses any economic edge that he may have. And, uh, I mean, these units, hey, Larry. Hey, Larry, you think we should detonate? Nah, nah, we cool, but it does look like the main is going to be rolling in here. Big detonations going off on both sides, to be completely honest here. Looks like Subby, though, is going to get the upper hand uh, as far as supply is concerned and is going to be able to clean up these Marines as well. But uh, overall resources lost is still basically tied. So as long as a Terran player is able to mine off of three bases efficiently, that's usually going to be pretty good. No big detonations there. And remember, Widow Mines, sure, they can kill off uh, Mutalisks, but I wouldn't rely on it. I wouldn't go, hey, I'm going to counter these Mutas by going Widow Mines, especially against a player like Suppy. He's going to have to rely more on just the raw output DPS of these Marines, and that's exactly what he's going to be doing for now. Notice how he has cut back on those Marauders. That's what I was trying to say before, is the Marauders are really good at, at absorbing Baneling hits. But at some point, you need all anti-air to deal with mutas. Mass, mass muta, a flock of mutas is terrifying. If they were crows, it would definitely be a murder of uh, mutalisks here. 24 on the field right now. Does need to get those upgrades rolling, though. Sure, he's got the plus one attack. I honestly might think throwing out a second spire. You don't see it very often, but if he's going to be sticking to mutalisks for this long, he needs to get upgrades one way or another. Does look like he just finished that plus two. He does have the 3-3 on the way, as well as the uh, cracklinging ling upgrade, the adrenal glands, making them attack 
much more quickly. And guess what? It is time for chitinous plating, baby. You guys know what that means. It is ultralist time. And uh, at the same time, considering that barcode was forced to go for mass marines here, a tech switch into ultras might be... Uh, the exact, uh, basically, muscle that he needs in his army. The one that's turned over here trying to hold on. But how are you supposed to hold on versus uh, how many missiles are we up to now? Uh, 22 meters. A couple of them are going to get taken out. That poor missile turret did not stand a chance. Actually, having a missile turret up here might not be the worst idea. Uh, he did lose the supply depots over there at some point. But uh, either way, supply advantage going to Suppy. That's to be expected for Zerg, though. Um, what is not going to be great for Terran is the fact that Suppy is going to be up two bases now. Which, uh, that is exactly where Zerg wants to be. At the same time, though, Barcode with the Planetary here. And you can see, he is just fine on gas. When you're going Mass Marine Widow Mine, you do not need that much gas. And uh, he's not even forced to mine gas at this location. So the problem for Suppy is, is that considering, and this is something you may not even know, considering that Barcode has too much gas is actually really, really, really good for Terran. Because now he can safely start mining here. Of course, as I say safely, this base is not OSHA approved. As uh, those Mutalists are opposing an imminent threat there, definitely have to install the uh, government recommended five missile turrets or something crazy there well he's going to go up to two right now he's trying to skimp on the cost can't say that I blame him because he isn't maxed out just yet suppy with them collectors edition uh ultralisk always looking so sexy uh, for the record this does not make the ultras any better they just look a little bit fancier they glow they they have they have glowy Kaiser Blades there. They just want to give big old hugs. But at the same time, a huge attack going to be taking place over here. And it looks like as long as he can split up, he's got the Widow Mines to back him up. And we'll be able to get big detonations. There we go. Taking out some Banelings and damaging those Mutas. Unfortunately, the uh, the Ultralists are just going to be too strong. As Suppy does push forward right now, he's looking to be in great shape. Although the Ultra's getting a little bit out-kited, as is to be expected. Besides, not even a micro those Mutas. That Ultra literally got split in half here. Suppy is uh, going to be in a full-on retreat with his mutas for now. I don't think he can save this base. That queen sure as hell tried, though. And it does look like one hatchery is going to go down. Now, i got to say that multitasking is going to be a necessity right now for Barco. That's actually exactly what he's doing here, as he is going to be dropping down at uh, technically the fifth base right now, but he killed off the sixth already. But uh, either way, got to go ahead and drop this base. He does get the hatchery. Mike at the Infester. Decides to go ahead and uh, cut his losses there and just get out. And I wasn't even really losses. I don't think he lost anything. He just wants to make sure not to get too greedy. But I got to say, man, Barcode finding himself in a pretty good spot in this game. He's got nice splits. Uh, overall, his APM is enough to keep up with Suppy, at least in the uh, in the splitting front, which is kind of the most important part. I would say splitting and drops is most important versus Zerg. It's one of those things where it's like, well, how are you supposed to drop versus that many Mutalists? Oh, that's unfortunate. That is uh, Cloudy with a chance of death. And uh, the, unfortunately, the cloud is mutalisks. But uh, either way, just got to say, Suppy trying to hang on, trying to make sure he doesn't lose too many bases. He did end up losing those uh, those two. But, oh, God, this Marine, he has a death wish, man. He's like, I'm going to kill all you, Lara. And really, the creep is just going to kill them much quickly, uh, uh, much, much quicklier. Is the, is the word I'm going to use here. I guess he should have installed all five missile turrets. Now he's going to be paying the price here as this base is once again susceptible to attack. Widowmine there, nice shot. And uh, you may be saying, well, he only killed one Mutalist without Widowmine. It wasn't that good of a shot. I guess they, since they don't kill Mutalist in one shot anyway, um, actually killing them as opposed to just doing lots of splash damage is going to be kind of the way to go. But uh, either way, it does look like... Uh, actually, he doesn't have the the armor upgrades on those so I guess he's gonna be losing them in one shot just has to be absolutely careful there and uh, it looks like the Marines gonna be pushing this back here and still no armor upgrades on these Mutalists. Keep in mind that they do spawn with zero and I, I guess just the 125 is gonna be enough and plus 35 versus shields probably not gonna be that useful in this game but uh, either way, Marauder's going to be able to kill off this base right now. I got to say, he's pulling Suppy every which way. Why is this whole army down there? It is not in position to be able to deal with any sort of drop or harassment on the right side. Suppy's army is still looking quite terrifying. Sure, he's behind in supply, but that's just a couple of fungals away from being able to get back in this game. Lyot going to be hanging out over here. You got you to be careful, buddy. I don't know if this is the side of town that you want to be in, especially with so many Banelings detonating every which way. We do have uh, Corruptors on the way. I got to say, I really like the way that Suppy is playing this out. I mean, look at the units tab. 43 Zerglings, 12 Mutalists, 19 Banelings, 5 Ultras, 9 Infestors. He has additional Queens as well, which are following the army around. And on top of that, he's now working on Corruptors. Very easily could switch back into Broodlords. How often do you actually see a Zerg player get this diverse of a unit composition? Very, very rarely. 
Only thing we need to see, man, is some Hydras and some Swarm Hosts. But for now, it does. Oh, that stem. That was unnecessary. Unfortunately for him, that's going to eat up a lot of the energy on those medevacs. Sure, he used it to get away. But uh, if he would have known that Stuffy was not going to engage there, he would have loved not to stem if he can help it. Uh, that is one thing in these situations you got to be careful with is don't get stem happy. Sure, you need to stem when the big engagement happens. Oh, dear. Oh, wow. Actually, that could have been way worse. He did split up a lot of them, and some of the Zerglings will survive. Not for long. They will get taken out. Some of them are going to go ahead and go for the counterattack over here. Really, at this point, this is kind of like two castles that are built awkwardly close. Just throwing, like, or shooting bows and arrows at each other. There's not a whole lot of damage that's going to be dealt to the, the bases directly with these counterattacks. But uh, you just got to kind of figure it out. You know, freeing up supply for more Broodlords. Probably a pretty good choice. Um, the fact that Suppy has so many different units here. I mean, how do you micro this? How do you micro the Banelings uh, to detonate well? How do you micro the Mutalists to get the nice splits or the uh, flank attacks and intercepting the Metavax? How do you get the Infestors to throw the Fungals? And how do you prevent the Ultralists from bumping into each other? And how do you protect the Broodlords? And just thinking about it is taking too much APM, let alone actually proving that this unit composition is going to be an ideal one. We'll see if that 300 APM is going to be enough to do just that, though, as Suppy is going to be moving forward. This is where the creep spread starts to pick up just a little bit, because these queens, uh, even though there's only two of them, they're doing amazing on energy, and uh, they can basically throw down almost 10 creep tumors apiece. Uh, just doing basic math there, even though it's not accurate. So that just shows you, though, once the creep spread gets a little bit too close, you better watch out. You better not shout. Uh, actually, you probably do want to shout, because you're going to have to deal with that creep or you are going to be crying yourself to sleep. But uh, either way, it does look like Barcode going to be moving forward now. His 3-3 being done for quite some time, going for yet another major base right now. The planetary over here unable to shoot up. The, the technology just isn't there yet. The Marines right now, big stems, but really using all that just to kill drones and spines which at this point, drones are not the most important unit on the map, although really low worker counts here for both players, so they are going to start mattering pretty soon. Big drop inside the main base only kills off a Vespian Geyser that has no Vespian gas, and remember that this is not Brood War. Uh, depleted Geysers do absolutely nothing for you. The Milos over here might actually be able to kill us off. Sure, there's some Vikings on the way. Not going to be nearly enough to kill those, though. And remember that Vikings do not really hard counter Mutalists. That plus damage to armored doesn't affect the uh, the Mutalists. They're like, well, we don't wear any armor. So what's the point of your armor penetrating missiles? Doesn't really do that much extra damage. But at the same time, though, there's going to be an attack down here. Might actually be able to get this base as well. If Suppy is not careful, that plus three attack on the Marauders making them do lots of damage to armored units. And guess what? Hatcheries count as armored. It does look like it will go down. Some of the units actually going to escape out of there. This base is going to get taken out as well. Barcode going to be attacking every which way. Wants to kill off this spawning pool desperately if possible, but not every single unit is actually attacking right now, and they need to be for sure. Looks like these Corruptors may get taken out, though. The Corruptors are invaluable here in dealing with those drops as well as dealing with, uh, with, with the Ravens and turning them into Broodlords to later deal with the Marines. It does look like that army is going to be able to clean up the, uh, the Mutalists here. Suppy getting a little bit sloppy right now as he's unable to win any of these engagements. Finally cleans that up on the left side, but there's just so much going on. Barcode all over the place as uh, he has given Suppy a run for his money. That's for sure. Sure, the Broodlords show up, but the damage has already been dealt. I mean, these are basically free units, but uh, I guess since he did end up losing that planetary, he doesn't have a whole lot of income. So, yeah, he has to do this damage, and it's going to be tough for him to recoup those losses. I will just say, though, that he does have a supply advantage. He has map control, which is just shocking, and uh, has managed to establish the base over here. I mean, this base is relatively new. Still about 1,400 resources on each of these mineral patches. That includes the mules that are mining right now. But uh, he definitely needs to upgrade that to a planetary just to play it a little bit safe. And uh, these dudes over here, sure, they're going to kill off a couple of drones. They do have to watch out for the infestors. One fungal growth with a wave of broodlings from those broodlords. You are all of a sudden not having very much fun. I do like the two missile turrets over here, but I feel like Suppy, uh, you know, he could very easily counterattack that base over there. And having it not be a planetary is absolutely huge. More Vikings are on the way. Keep in mind, the Vikings will do the additional damage to the Corruptors and the broodlords. Widowmines over here, got to be careful. They do burrow and then unburrow to try and deal with the eggs. That's exactly why you do not want. The splash of secret missiles coming out, and that was anticlimactic. Thought that was going to be doing a lot more damage. What is going to be doing more damage though is this huge drop in the main base. Going for the infestation pit. Could get the ultralist cavern as well. Not that Suppy really has any money to spend right now and no income to speak of. Literally, I think his income is at zero. So this is kind of chilling out right now. But Suppy got to try and go with everything he's got. The fungals here have got to be good. They've got to land the Marines here, though, awkwardly. Kind of, uh, I guess that was somehow split up very, very well. But we could be having a base race on our hands. The Hive Tech 
is going to be going down. That means no more replacing of the Broodlords or the Ultralis or anything because he's not able to build those buildings. All he's going to be able to do is build a hatchery, and that's not going to be doing a whole lot for him. At the same time, though, Suppy has somehow broken the main gate, and sure, these units are doing lots of damage, but you got to deal with the uh, Zerg army at some point. I will say, though, that Suppy is way behind in supply. There's still that mining base over on the right side. The Vikings doing everything they possibly can. I think just Mass Marine is going to be what he needs right now just to try and pick off these Ultras from afar. The Vikings trying to get the air supremacy as well. How much anti-air is in the game? Uh, only two Corruptors. Are we going to be seeing any more Vikings? There are three Vikings on the way. That should be more than enough to deal with those two Corruptors, but uh, it's going to be tough because the Queens are there to defend them as well. And actually, guess what? Some of these Vikings never going to spawn. There's only going to be the one it looks like. And uh, there are no Vikings on the field as of yet. One just now spawning. But Suppy doing everything he can to try and turn this base race into something that he can make uh, into a victory. He's, he has slowly caught up in supply. Resources lost don't even matter at this point because it's all down to the army supply. 58 to 71. That is an army supply advantage for Terran. And guess what? He's going to be killing off all income right now. And with the three Vikings on the way, if he can group these units together, which is exactly what he's going to be doing, he might be able to clean this out. SCVs are mixed in. Keep in mind, there is still that mining base in the top right side. Not that it's going to be doing a whole lot for him. But no, the Vikings unable to spawn. They get taken out too quickly. Three Vikings on the field. Can he kill these Corruptors? It is of the utmost importance that he does. Cannot afford to get fungled by uh, by that uh, Infester there and with those Vikings kind of grouped up. And down goes one Viking. I told you, man, these Corruptors are invaluable, and they are the ones keeping the Broodlords alive. If they died, so do the bro Broodlords. But at the same time, SCV is trying to kill out Broodlings. Not going to be the best situation to, uh, to be in. SCV is moving out to try and throw down barracks, to try and get that production back on track. I don't think that Barcode expected to lose that battle. He was never able to get out those Vikings, never able to deal with the Broodlords. How many kills these bro lords got? 10 kills. 9, 11, 15, 14, uh, 10, and 10. Wow, so many kills on the Broodlords. Talk about cost efficiency. But uh, for right now, Shuri's killing off more stuff here and there, but this is all stuff that doesn't matter that much. If he can't deal with the Broodlords, he's got to get out of the kitchen because uh, he, well, he's only got two barracks now, and they're not even done yet. God, rebuilding this infrastructure is just like being stuck in L.A. traffic. You are going nowhere at a slow pace. It's not even going nowhere fast. You are literally going nowhere. Stop. You're, you're just not going anywhere. But it does look like the hatchery is going to get taken out here. What is the structures tab looking like? Oh, my God. Oh my god, it's only two extractors. The Marine is working on them down here. And, uh, wait, where'd that sport crawler go? Wait, does it not count as a structure when it's unbrewed? Am I, am I looking at this wrong? Apparently it's not. It doesn't count as anything. It just disappears. Is that a bug? I feel like that's a bug. Uh, it doesn't show up in the structures tab. Uh, but either way, it does look like the extractor got to get taken out here. These Marines have definitely got to be focusing on killing off that extractor right now. This is the last building in the game, essentially, because the other one's getting attacked by the Marines. So at this point, Barcode, all he has to do is kill off that last building. Now, what I want to know, though, is does it show you the, uh, the Spore Crawler? Does it give you the vision of where that building is if it is the last building? I would assume. Yes, it does. Okay, so it does show it in the Fog of War. He's got to try and swing around. But, oh, my God, this game is actually ridiculous. Sure, the Marines got to kill off this last one, but he's got to figure out how do I kill that Spore Crawler. He's got to make as many use as possible. A uh, Cloak Banshee would be amazing. Uh, that is nowhere in the near future, though. And the Spore Crawler is a little bit behind. Here's the big stem. Here we go. It's now or never. Is that Spore Crawler going to get taken out? So close. So close. And it does go down. Suffy was defeated by the counterattack right there. Suppy so dangerously close to being able to take this game in one of the most hilarious games I think I've ever seen. I actually I actually did fall out of my seat. I didn't want to admit it, but whatever. 53 supply to 51. Let's check out those army supplies. 53 to 46. Overall workers, what is that at? Five SCVs to zero drones. Seven Broodlords on the map. Uh, we do have the two Corruptors here, but really Suppy got a little bit greedy. He needed to move a lot closer with his army. What he actually really needed to do was right-click that army on the Spore Crawler and have the Spore Crawler be the one that was moving towards the expansion. He left it undefended, which means no chance for the Fungals, no chance for the Ultra, but seriously, a chance for one of the best games I think I've ever seen. This one's going to get the epic tag. This one, uh, you know, as I was watching it, I was like, you know, this is pretty good. 
pretty good. Very back and forth. Very even game. Oh my god, he only has a spore crawler, and it doesn't even count as a structure in the structures tab. Which, uh, I am going to report that to Blizzard. It seems like that doesn't quite seem right, because it's a building. It's just walking. It's not like when you lift off a command center, it doesn't count as a structure anymore. But, uh, either way, I hope you guys enjoy it, and I'll see you guys next time! Hello everyone, this is HDS here, back with some more StarCraft 2 Hard the Swarm action. This is going to be live casted. I don't know if you know who these players are, but this is MMA, this is Ryung, this is, uh, I believe, Heart, this is Crank, and this is Mia. Oh god, it's going to be me and an FFA versus some of the best players out there. MMA GSL champion, Crank, a uh, very well good player at uh, tournaments like MLG, and Ryung, of course. Oh, uh, getting to the round of four. I am so freaking nervous. I have never played a game like this in my life. Never have I played a game like this in my life. Let me see if I can bribe them. If you let me live, I will give you large following. Many fans will support, support you. Just saying, just saying. You will get many Twitter followers. May we'll, we'll see, we'll see if this works. Oh god, I need to set up a pylon. Okay, we're fine. We are absolutely fine. We're just going to go with this. Put that there. We are not even going to scout. We are going to we're going to macro mode. We are going to beast mode this all the way. Should I cast what I'm doing through chat? I have like 130 words per minute and 0 APM. All right. We got this, baby. We have so got this. All right, you're coming over here. We, are, we got our try-hard hats on, and I don't care how bad I play this game, I'm going to upload it no matter what. No matter what. Although, I do need to turn up the sound. Oh, I can't, though, because you guys are listening. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. This is not good for me. This is not good. All right, we got to throw down the gas right away. All right, there we go. And I see before before we were in this game, they were asking me where am I spawning. So let's see. I'm gonna keep my buildings close to my nexus so that they don't siege mode me. Because remember, they can actually if there's someone right here, they can literally siege mode your base, your natural from their main base. And there's three Terrans in this game. I would just like to say, which is not which is not ideal for me. So I all right. My strategy right now is to not type to them. And to hope that, oh god, how are you supposed to, there we go, we'll put it there. Not type to them, hope they slow themselves down. Let's go ahead and throw down second gas. And we definitely need a Zealot ASAP. And come on Zealot, I need you now. I need you. Okay, there's that. And enough for another probe. Come on, Chrono Boost there. Alright, so Zealot that's about to spawn, he's going to be number one. God, I don't even want to expand on this map just because it's so tough to defend those. I probably, probably should actually uh, scout pretty soon. So we're going to do that as soon as the Zealot is out. We're going to go for that. And we're also going to go, oh god, the lag. Got to get that right there. And Zealot should be out soon. There you go, hold position. And I am going to get the Stalker as well. Because they can easily sneak into my base. Alright, so we got to go up here, see if there's anyone there. If there's no one there, that's really good for me. That's really, really good for me. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and cr I don't normally chrono boost out. Um, I don't normally chrono boost out warp gate research in FFAs, but I feel like versus what I'm going against, it is good to just try and get units out as quickly as possible to buy myself as much time. Oh god, we need that. See, right now I'm currently playing with no sound, which is not which is not ideal. Oh, there is someone up there. Okay, it's a Protoss. Not nice. We be friends. Only Protoss in this game. All right, so we'll see. We'll see if my wooing him is going to be enough. I feel like it's not going to be, but that's fine. All right, let's kind boost that out. And maybe I should go for a robo first. I feel like that's going to be the safe bet. Unless Crank goes for a lot of Phoenix. That could be that could prove to be very frustrating. So maybe while I wait for, uh, let's get a sentry just in case. I my timing on it's not perfect, but whatever. Whatever, we're just gonna go with it. We do have a little bit of lag. They're telling us where people are, but I I don't even know how to use those time clocks or anything. So 
Oh, another pylon, really? Okay, we'll cancel that. Actually, you know what? Let's cancel this guy. Which I know is silly, but I need to make sure to have an observer. And... Okay, we definitely need to turn up this volume, at least in my ears. Alright, so we got the observer on the way. Got warp gates on the way. And what I'm going to do is pretty risky, but I'm going to do it anyway. Going to go for that because I need the observer. And we just got to try this. I don't know if it's going to work. Expanding so difficult in this uh, on this map. All right, so there's that. Maybe even go for an immortal here. All right, we need to we need to spot this out. We have got to see what he's going. Wait, what is that? Okay, there's a forge. Okay, what does he got? Oh god, dark shrine. All right, we gotta fall back. All right, we cannot let him. We cannot let him pull this off. Please, no DTs to me. Alright, we got that. I should probably actually build a forge right now. And... Maybe go for some Colossus tech. Colossus always a nice, good, robust unit. Oh god, this Nexus is almost done. Oh, uh, please don't be me lagging. Alright, it's not. Alright, let's get my mothership core going. Alright, so far not not too bad. I should probably build another observer. May put this guy back here just for safety. We're even we're even gonna unhotkey that guy. Because I need you know, let's do this. You guys go in there. You go in there as well. Alright, so far so good. Let's get Colossus Tech. Alright, did I get another observer? Okay, cool. So I can safely do that. Get some more observers. Or some more probes, rather. Come on, Colossus. Oh god, where is that? Is that in my base? I so hope that is not in my base. Oh, I hear something. Alright, I at least killed that off. Very nice. Get out of here, probe. Alright, I should probably drop a cannon back here just to be safe. You are going to patrol between those points. Alright, you getting gas now. Oh, what is that? Careful, crank. What, did I not make pylons? I kind of want to go for a Stargate now. Actually, you know what? No. We're going to go for that. And you are going to attempt to sneak out here. Yeah, yeah. I got the pylons on the way. Come on, pylons, where are you at? Oh my god, did I get maxed out again already? That's no good. Are we going to attempt to do this? I don't know if it's going to work. Oh shoot, that is definitely not going to work. That is not going to work at all.
No, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Why would you do that to me? Okay, I definitely need to get Blink. Which should be... Okay, that's on the way. Go ahead and get that. Unfortunately, securing expansion is going to be tough. So does he have the Watchtowers? Is that what it's, that's all about? Oh, God. Oh, God, let's do this. Let's do this. Oh god! Oh god, it's so good! Oh noes! Oh noes! MM's still good! Oh god! Oh no! Need backup! ASAP! Alright, looks like he's actually gonna be nice for now, maybe. Alright, let's get that going. Let's get some zealot legs going. Alright, I told you man, expanding is so tough. Alright, he at least leave my guys alive down here. Yep, we're good there. I definitely need to send a probe out somewhere to try and find some sort of base. Oh god, it's drones! What are these drones? Oh, there's auto turrets there. Alright, let's see... Oh god, that's a lot of Vikings. That's actually so not good for me. Alright, so you guys are gonna go there. Alright, no more Colossus, that's for sure. Oh, back up. Let's go ahead and use my Colossus over here. See if we can do this. Alright, kill that off. Oh my god, what killed that Colossus? Did I just kill my own Colossus? Alright, let's do this. Alright, this is not ideal, but if I can get Storm out, maybe I'll stand a chance. Just maybe. Actually, wait, is there no one up here? Oh, there is. Oh, there is. Alright, so let's get a couple more of these. Alright, 
Alright, let's get some more stalkers. So many scans from these guys. Oh god, that's not good. That's not good. Alright, should I even rebuild that? That's the real question. Yeah, I guess so. Oh god, this is gonna be tough. We are the light. Just gotta try and buy as much time as I can. Oh, you're so done, probes. Alright, we gotta put these guys down here first. Oh god, get down here. Alright, fair enough. Let's get you guys back into gas. Alright, so I just need some observers. Oh, really? Oh, I needed the space so badly. Oh god, the Infested Terrans, get out of there, buddy. Alright, take those out. We should probably get the uh, speed upgrade. All right, get this base established again. All right, you guys are gonna start mining there. Oh, 
Oh my god, this is not going to go well. Alright, can I actually get these out though? That's the real question. I feel like the answer is definitely not. Alright, so we're gonna come over here. Oh god. Oh, this is not good. This is not good at all. Oh god, so many battle cruisers. Uh, I feel like I'm definitely caught in the middle here. That does not look good at all. Oh, snap. Oh, God, I don't have enough money to even build a Nexus. No. Oh, I, f I feel like this is looking really, really bad. Oh wait, I have a chance. I have a chance to get back in this. All right, we'll see how, we'll sell my probes fair. Oh wait, no, that's actually a terrible idea. I made a huge mistake! Uh, let's see, did I lose all my observers? feel like I've lost pretty much everything. Let's check that out. Let's just see what we got. God, there is, there is just a lot of stuff in this game. Okay, I think I have to get an observer. I think that's the only way. Alright, let's see. Let's scope it out. See what we got. We are one. You require Oh, well there goes one stalker. Oh, they're still activating, not good. Oh god, they still activate. Alright, we'll give this a go. We 
We got all of our Zelts over here with the 3 3. I don't have nearly enough money. But for now, let's make something happen. This is this is not going to be good. I think everyone's still in the game, right? Yeah, they are. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna escort these guys. So my plan is to be completely forgotten about. And then hopefully get enough minerals for 400. Oh, is it going to be enough? Nope, not quite. Got to make another trip. Very well. cool. Let's follow this guy. Hmm, definitely not looking good. I don't even know how to defeat that many battle cruisers at this stage of the game as Protoss. That is just pretty bananas. All right, we're going to leave one probe here. You guys are going to follow that guy. I actually may follow this one. And hey, we got two geysers down here, so so that's going to be a thing. That's going to be just fine. Actually, no, let's come down here now. We have to protect the Nexus at all costs. Come on, please be enough. Please be enough. Yes! All right, so now we just sit back, relax, and enjoy the loss. If only I didn't lose that first army. See, I didn't realize he had uh, actual units backing those medevacs up, so. Plus, also, he is a very good player. I will give him that. I almost feel like I should just go all in at this point and have all these guys down here. And, yep, you come down here as well. No! All right, we're, we're pulling out all the stops. All right, hopefully, hopefully this is uh, gonna work. All right, so let's just build a dark shrine. Okay, I think that was a widow mine over there. Yep, it was. Alright, I have four. Oh god. Oh god. Time to go. Time to go. All right, so where's my observer at? Did it die? No, but it's still here. We are, I am the heart. You guys, for now, just got to hang out back here. Base is under attack. All right, so that base allowed me to make a net gain. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We got to cancel this. Cancel that. Oh, God. We are totally mined out. All right, that's all mined out. That's all mined out. You I am the voice of the eclipse. Base is under attack. All right, I got a lot of guys over here. Let's see what we got. Oh my god, how are these things still alive? Oh, he's not. He's Oh, no, 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 no. All right, any expansions down here? Oh, well, that's mined out. That's mined out. Are there... 
I feel like there's a severe lack of bases at the moment. Oh god, creep. Okay, we gotta be careful. I am never one to give up. Oh, Widow Mines. Not quite sure what those are doing. Just hanging out. Alright, let's see if we can find... Oh god, this is so much creep. This is so much creep. And mind out. Watch out for the turrets. And that's mined out. That one's mined out. Oh god, there's no bases, are there? Alright, well we obviously can't kill that, so... Oh no, he intercepted me! Come on, probes, you can do it! You can do it! Alright, well they were nice enough to let me live there, and I will say, I actually did a lot better than I thought I would, and also, I, I did make one mistake of engaging in the center there, which kind of put me way behind, but uh, let's, take, let's take a look at the graphs really quick, you can see I'm right here, I was in the middle of the pack, I was actually at the peak right there, of course I eventually dropped off, but I did relatively